Part 1. The Gets 1. The old man's head was covered in mantises. At first, Luke thought it was a wig or some weird toupee, but he was at the southern tip of Guam, a few miles from the Pacific, and the man was wearing tattered clothes and what looked like strips of old radial tires lashed to his feet. Why bother with a toupee? The driver saw the old man, too. He hissed between his teeth, an uneasy, Sk! He said something under his breath, a curse, maybe a prayer. Luke didn't speak the local dialect. I'll do it, Luke told the driver. You wait here. He elbowed the jeep's door open. Sweet Jesus, the heat. It hit him like a fist when he stepped onto the runway at Agana Airport. It hit him again now. The tropical air, laden with the nectar of heliotropes, caused beads of sweat to pop along his brow. The old man stood facing the wall of a one-story workshop. The ground was strewn with hubcaps and crankcases snarled in rusted wiring. Wrist-thick vines snaked out of the greenery to twine around the industrial junk. With nobody around to hack it back, the jungle would reclaim this spot in a matter of months. The old man was walking into the wall. His sandals made a gentle whoosh-whoosh as they brushed the yellowing adobe. The spotting was pronounced on his bare arms and his throat. The scabs were dime-sized, bigger than what Luke was used to seeing. Some of them had cracked open and were leaking grayish pus. Luke had no clue what had drawn the mantises. Maybe they'd dropped from the creeping ivy snarled across the shop's roof, or maybe something on the man's scalp or leeching out of it had attracted them. They were the largest insects Luke had ever seen. Each mantis was the length of his thumb and muscular-looking. They had swollen, cantilevered abdomens that curved above their sharp, considering faces. A baker's dozen or so carpeted the man's skull. Luke got the sense of them turning to stare at him all at once. Luke retreated to the bush. His feet sank into the muck. He didn't like the way it sucked at his boots, greedy, a lipless brown mouth. He found a stick and went back. The insects squirmed quarrelsomely on the man's head, which was covered with wispy white hairs as downy as those on a baby's skull. Their exoskeletons made a brittle chitter. What the hell were they doing? Luke watched their choreographed manner. The stink of burned diesel mixed with the heliotropes to create a sticky vapor that coated his throat. Distantly, he heard the driver repeat what he'd said before, that breathless curse or prayer, and Luke was worried he'd set the jeep in gear and take off, leaving him with the old man and the mantises, the heat and the crawling jungle. What in God's name were those bugs doing? One mantis pinned another in a violent vice grip, then widened its jaws and bit down, cleaving the other's head in half. Their abdomens were wed, what was clearly the female continued to eat the male's head while his antenna whipped around frantically. Using the stick, Luke brushed the mantises off the man's skull. A decapitated male skittered wildly across Luke's fingers. He shook it into the mud with the rest of them. The urge arose to step on them, squash them all to paste. Instead, Luke set his hands on the old man's shoulders to turn him around. His expression was familiar the big blank. His eyes gone milky, the edges of his eyelids pebbled with nodules of acne that gave his skin the look of an orange rind. His mouth wide open, his tongue coated in white film. He may not have drunk water in days. He'd forgotten to, probably. That's how it went with the gets. You forgot the little things first, then the not-so-little things, then the big ones. Next, the critical ones. In time, your heart forgot how to beat, your lungs how to breathe. You die knowing nothing at all. As soon as Luke pointed him in a new direction, the old man started to walk. He'd go on until he fell down or stepped off a cliff or stumbled into a leopard's den, if they had those around here. And Luke couldn't do a damn thing about that. He climbed back into the jeep, 
The driver eased past the old man as he tottered down the road, that clingy mud sucking up past his ankles already. Luke watched as they pulled away, the old man's body becoming indistinct through the stinging fumes. Two. A vista of heat-stooped palms gave way to the town of Vinarahan. The buildings were Pueblo rustic and had a worn but functional look with whitewashed tin roofs. A fan of red grit rose in the jeep's wake. It appeared to hover in the intense heat, refusing to settle. The jeep's vents blasted humid air. The creased skin at the back of Luke's neck was grimy with sweat and dirt. The Pacific rolled out to the south. The water deepened to an icy blue. Two old women sat on a buckled porch, smoking cheroot cigars. None of the villagers looked worried. None of the shops had been looted. That had occurred in other places, but for the most part, humanity had simply carried on. If this was the apocalypse, it was to be an orderly and complacent one. The village children watched the jeep rumble past. One of them, a girl of about eight, smiled at Luke. A cluster of dark specks dappled her elbows, like the bruises on a banana as it turns over ripe. The spots. They would get bigger, cover her body, turn crusty, then pustulant. Then she'd begin to forget. Minor stuff at first, where she'd left her dolly or how to tell the time of day. Then she wouldn't know how to tie her shoelaces. She might spend hours bent over her feet, trying to lace however she'd been taught, the bunny ears method, loop, swoop, and pull. She'd laugh at first, I'm being such a silly Billy. But she soon would become frustrated, as children do, and start to cry. Next, she'd forget her brother's name and the smell of her father's pipe tobacco, and soon enough, her own face in the mirror. She'd forget what hot or cold should feel like, and then even the concepts of heat and cold. That would have to be the worst part, Luke figured, forgetting those elemental assurances everyone is born with. She'd look at the nut tree in her yard and forget the sensation of its leaves brushing her skin. Soon she'd forget what leaves were to begin with and how vital they are to that tree, the same way our veins are vital to our bodies. She'll have forgotten about veins by that point, too. She'd forget how wonderful those nuts taste. After that, She'd forget why eating mattered much at all. The tree would make no sense to her. Nothing would, actually. Three. The yacht was moored 500 yards off the Anarahan Wharf. Its original owner was a Vegas casino magnate. Its home dock was in Okinawa, Japan, but Uncle Sam had recently conscripted it in the service of science. Its owner didn't argue its seizure, Luke had been told, due to the fact that he'd forgotten he'd ever bought a yacht. The Getz had a way of loosening prior rights of ownership. Luke grabbed his duffel and nodded goodbye to the driver. The sun-bleached planks squealed under his boots. Fiddleback crabs skittered around the pilings, raising puffs of sand. An eel, a black, sinuous ribbon, darted out, plucking up a crab before vanishing beneath the wharf. Animals were unaffected for whatever reason. No spotting, no gets. All except honeybees, which had been the first and only. A few skiffs were moored at the end of the wharf, their rusted bottoms spread with mildewed nets. A haze of flies boiled up at Luke's approach. One landed on his forearm. A horsefly, its compound eyes reflecting the sunlight like disco balls. Luke slapped it. The horsefly buzzed, trapped between his palm and the flesh of his arm, a sensation so off-putting that Luke lifted his hand. The fly escaped with cool indifference. The yacht wasn't too far off. Luke could swim it. Wanted to, in fact. It was goddamn hot, he was dirty, and a weird hum had settled into his bones. Shielding his eyes from the sun, he squinted toward the vessel. He could barely make out a figure on it. He dropped his duffel into a Zodiac boat. He yanked the engine's ripcord and steered away from the village's squat buildings, away from the girl with those terrible specks. The water was a chilly blue, 
It reminded Luke of Barbicide, the disinfectant solution the old barbers in Iowa City used to soak their combs in. That stuff will kill you dead if you drink it, one of the barbers told Luke when he was a boy, as if suspecting Luke had harbored that very desire. His gaze trailed north over the crested hills. He spied a church. It must have been centuries old, perhaps the very first thing the area settlers had built. It was burned. The spire must have gone up first, the roof beams reduced to cinders until what remained of the steeple had come crashing through the narthex. Nothing else had been torched in the entire village. Only the church. Four. The yacht was anchored at the edge of a half-moon bay. A man stood on deck, tall and thin, with articulate limbs that reminded Luke, however unfairly, of the mantises on that old man's skull. Dr. Nelson, the man extended his hand. I'm Leo Bathgate. So glad you made it safely. Luke inspected Bathgate's outstretched arm. Luke's eyes strayed toward people's hands and arms habitually, a reflex action. Research showed that the gets wasn't spread through physical contact, the transmission of bodily fluids, or as an airborne pathogen, but it had taken a while to discover this, and sadly, several tragedies had occurred before it was fully understood. Men had been shot in cold blood as they had struggled to recall some hard-to-remember fact. The phrase, it's on the tip of my tongue, had become the basis for justifiable homicide for a while there. The yacht was luxurious, everything gleaming. Luke felt as though he were floating on a pile of cold currency. Bathgate read his face. I've never set foot on anything like it either. A bottle of champagne sat in a bucket. Bathgate shrugged. I found it on board, figured it'd just go to waste, he said. Krug Brute, 1988. Pricey suds. Bathgate poured the bubbly into crystal flutes and handed one to him. Luke tipped the glass to his lips, the champagne sending a tickle up his sinuses. Bathgate said, How was your trip? Endless, Luke wanted to tell him. Roughly 8,000 miles separated Chicago, where he caught the first flight, and Agana, the capital city of Guam. Those 8,000 miles had unfurled like a strange waking nightmare. On his way out of Iowa City, Luke had stopped at an Exxon off the interstate. The highway wasn't snarled with stalled or abandoned cars the way it always is in stories about the apocalypse. Because this wasn't exactly the apocalypse, Luke had to constantly remind himself. It was just something awful that was happening. For that reason, or maybe just out of old habit, the important things went along as they had. Ideas of ownership prevailed. The dead were still being buried, not always in cemeteries, but the bodies certainly went into the ground. Rituals were still being observed, and that was good. The gas station had been empty. The pumps were shut off. The door to the convenience store was open. The aisles were shadowy in the late afternoon. Muggy seeing as the A.C. wasn't working. Ants trooped up the glass of a cooler case. Luke could have done anything, unwrapped a Twinkie and wolfed it down, stripped the plastic off a penthouse and flipped out the gatefold. There was something very freeing about that, but scary, too. He'd pulled back onto the interstate. The gas gauge needle had nudged past E when he found a Senex station, which was bustling. People were gassing up, paying for chips and sodas, blissfully unaware or pretending to be. It had been good to see the lights on, good to pay for things. That feeling of normalcy returned. The world was still spinning as it always had, right? That troublesome kind of stuff happened a lot now. You couldn't find gas or a new tire if you got a flat. You could set off for a destination and never reach it. A thousand new roadblocks popped up, not always physical or jurisdictional ones either, just the system breaking down in little ways. O'Hare Airport had been surreal. Most of his terminals, kiosks, and shops were closed, the shelves picked over, restaurants offering a reduced menu. Luke had passed through security without incident. He carried a notarized document that eased his passage. The plane was a twin-prop puddle jumper. It was so full that two U.S. Marines had to sit in the aisle. 
that would have made life tough on the flight attendants had there been any. The plane touched down in Denver. After he disembarked, Luke stood before the airport's windows watching the flights taxi in. He could make out a man at the edge of the landing strip, propped against a chain-link fence, motionless with his arms outspread. A plane roared down the runway. As it rose, it flew directly above the man. His clothes fluttered with the terrific force of the jet's engines. His body jerked, his head snapping back and forth. Did the pilots have to look at the man every time they took off? Somebody should do something about it. The woman standing beside Luke was fifty-ish, with salt and pepper hair and a faint British accent. She tapped the huge window with her knuckles, a fussy rap, 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 as if in expectation someone, a butler, would appear to deal with her complaint. They should bloody well do something about that poor sod, wouldn't you think? She seemed the sort of woman who was used to getting things done, but things didn't always get done nowadays. People just got on with things the way they were. Luke's connecting flight landed at San Francisco International, where he was met by a pair of unsmiling soldiers. They led him to a private airstrip where a C-23 Sherpa cargo plane waited. Luke was its sole passenger. Resting against the bulkhead, he let the hum of the engines fill his skull. He fell into a black, sucking vacuum of sleep, dreamless, joyless. When he awoke, his plane was circling a Ghana. Long, Luke said, finally answering Bathgate's question. A long goddamn trip. Bathgate gave a sympathetic nod. You must be exhausted. Luke's watch was still set to Iowa time. His body clock was reading 5 a.m. as Guam's mid-afternoon sun beat down on his skull. The champagne mainline straight into his veins, making him swoon. Your berth is down below, Bathgate said. Why don't you get settled? As Luke made his way to the sleeping quarters, Bathgate called out, Dr. Nelson. Luke turned to see Bathgate wringing his ball cap in his hard-knuckled hands. Your brother, he said falteringly, they say he might have the answer to all this, whatever he's doing down there in the deep. You think that's possible? I don't really know, Leo. I guess we're going to see. Yeah, but... I'm hopeful. We all are. Right. Batgate offered an uncertain smile. Hopeful. Absolutely hopeful. Wasn't that why Luke had been brought here at great expense, after all? To talk to his brother? To rekindle the tiniest shred of hope? Luke's brother, who was eight miles deep in the Pacific Ocean. Luke's bizarre and brilliant brother whom nobody had heard from in days. Five. Luke dreamed of his mother. It was a familiar dream that came in times of stress. In it, his mother entered his bedroom. Luke was seven or eight years old. His mother was enormous, as she'd been at that point in his life. Over four hundred pounds. She slipped into bed with him threw back his Star Wars bed covers and slid under them with chilling dexterity. Her body was warm and soft as bread dough, perfumed with the excretions that leaked from her skin. Her breath feathered the hairs inside his ear canal. She began to whisper. Luke could never quite make out what she said. Her voice hit a sub-audible pitch that crawled directly into his brain. Luke awoke, his breath coming in leaden rasps. The dream drained from his brain, pan thick as syrup. He checked his watch. He'd slept less than two hours. God damn. His mother. All these years later, she was still there, haunting the corridors of his mind like a hungry ghost. He closed his eyes, and she bloomed in his mind's eye again. Bethany Ronix. She had forsaken her husband's family name, preferring her maiden one. Battleaxe Beth. She was a huge presence in every way. Her room-filling personality, her booming laugh, and, in time, 
her vast physical bulk. She'd always been a large woman, broad shoulders, wide hips, over six feet tall. A lady skyscraper, as Luke had heard her spoken of around town. She held an imposing beauty, or she had before her bad years, and the two hundred pounds they'd packed onto her frame. She walked with a regal bearing, her chest thrust out as if in the expectation that a visiting dignitary would affix a medal to it. She worked at the Second Chance Ranch, a home for mentally troubled male youths. No Chance Ranch, as she referred to it in her poisonous moods. She had been hired as the duty nurse, but soon transferred to Orderly, the first female in the state hired for that position. She preferred the hands-on aspect, better than doling out pills and sanitizing bedpans. It stinks, Luke overheard her say once in conversation with Edie Emmons, one of her few friends. The piss of those mad boys, there's a chemical they produce, a compound specific to crazies. Oh my, said Edie sycophantically. Sounds terrible. It is terrible. The stink of insanity, Edie, sharp as malt vinegar. It's bad enough when they sweat it out, but their piss? The worst. At first, the other orderlies, all male, predominantly black, grumbled. They had a bar bouncer's mentality. Yes, Beth had a no-bullshit disposition and could handle the nut jobs well enough with words. But what happened when words failed? Beth was a big woman, but still a woman. Did she have the brawn to subdue a foaming mad boy who cared little for his own body or that of others? But Beth was a hellion. She was the first to jump on any dog pile, grabbing a boy's wrist or neck and cranking with all her might. The orderlies came around to having her in their ranks. They nicknamed her Battle Axe Beth. Many years later, working as a veterinarian, Luke had run into one of his mother's old charges. Kurt Honey, whom Luke knew slimly, having gone to the same middle school, had spent time at the ranch for the aggravated assault of his eleventh-grade math teacher, whom he'd stabbed with a compass. Honey was a hired hand at a dairy farm where Luke had been summoned to tend to a sick Guernsey. She's your ma, ain't she? Honey had asked. Luke looked up from the cow's inflamed udder. Who? Battleaxe Beth? Luke had no idea Honey knew she was his mother, but he assumed Honey would speak ill of her. Luke wouldn't stop him. The days when he would have defended her were long gone. She was a viper. Honey gave a spooked laugh. Smart, you know, but in ways that don't really profit a person, except in special situations. Luke went back to the udder, hoping that would be the end of it. She scared the bejesus out of this one guy, Brewster Galt. Old Brew was none too smart. That's half the reason he ended up at the ranch. This one time, he caught hell for stealing an apple from the cafeteria. Small things were big things at the ranch. Even a missing apple couldn't go unpunished. Now Brew had this condition, okay? His one eye was all bugged out of its socket. He told me it was too much pressure pushing the eyeball out. Your ma, she noticed that sort of thing. Luke had winced, his face turned away. Yes, his mother had always noticed things of that nature. After Brew got caught stealing the apple, your ma asked for a minute alone with him. Brew came away white as milk. A big kid, tough kid, but I ain't never seen a boy so shit scared. I found Brew one afternoon by the picnic table a few days later. By and by, he gets around to telling me what your ma said. Brew said your ma told him he had two sets of eyes, one set behind the set in his face. That's why his one eye was pushed out so bad, see? It was the other set trying to get out. Your ma said those other eyes were blood red and looked like a cat's. Then she says maybe she'll give that other set of eyes a little push sneak into the bunks at night when Brew's fast asleep and slit his eyes up with a razor blade. Then that would give those new peepers a chance to push out and see the world, the devil's own eyes staring out of Brew's face. Wouldn't that be real nice, she told him. Kurt Honey just shook his head. 
Brew was 14. He didn't have a damn clue what kind of black thing he'd run across. Black thing. Luke's own mother. Black. Thing. That woman was half devil. Three quarters, I go so far to say. I'm sorry she said that, was Luke's only reply. Honey snorted. Christ, I'm sorry for you. You had to share four walls with that monster, didn't you? Luke's hands relaxed on the bed's coverlet. The nightmare sweat had dried on his chest, but his thoughts continued to circle restlessly around his mother. He hadn't thought about her, really clearly dwelled upon her, in years. Yet he couldn't wrench her out of his mind tonight. A few years into her stint at the ranch, Beth had been attacked by a resident, Chester Higgs. She'd been supervising the yard work assignments. After the incident, a few residents said they'd seen custodian Ronix talking to Higgs as he'd hoed the weeds, sidling up close and whispering to him. Chester Higgs had been sent to the ranch on seven counts of animal cruelty. He'd snuck into a neighbor's sheep pen and slit the yearlings' bellies with the sickle knife, known colloquially as a witch blade. When asked why he'd done so, Higgs said the lambs had been keeping secrets. That day, and without warning, Higgs struck at Beth with the hoe. He brought it down on her leg, shattering her kneecap. Then, as she'd screamed and grabbed for her raya baton, Higgs set about beating her mercilessly. A vicious and well-aimed swipe broke her left hip in three places. By the time the custodians arrived to haul Higgs off, Beth lay prostrate, bloodied and broken. According to eyewitness reports, Beth, bleeding through her stark white uniform, her face puffed and dangerously shiny, had screamed, Lord love a duck! Screaming this inane phrase over and over, Lord love a duck! Lord love a duck! Chester Higgs was taken to another facility, at 18, transferred to a state penitentiary. He'd never confessed to what set him off. Beth, meanwhile, was laid up for some time in the hospital. Her hip had to be fused. Her kneecap didn't heal properly. She was placed on long-term disability and would never work at the ranch again. From the day she returned from the hospital until the end of her life, Luke's mother rarely left the house. She'd sit alone in the TV room, an odious shape in the shadows. When Luke got home from school, she would summon him to her side. Lucas, come sit with your mommy. Luke's feelings for her changed gradually. Before the incident, he'd loved his mother open-heartedly in spite of the worrisome signs, the spankings that left welts, the way her gaze could sit upon his skull like a tarantula ready to sink in its fangs. But during the bad years, she became truly cruel. In time, Luke realized that cruelty was an implicit facet of her nature. She'd simply taken a while to express it. Six. Luke finally fell back asleep and awoke hours later as the yacht slit the night sea. The feeling was not unlike being in a luxury sedan speeding across a freshly laid strip of asphalt. Luke sensed the velocity in his marrow, but the fine calibration of the machine prevented him from truly experiencing it. He sat up in bed. If he'd had another dream, he couldn't remember it. He hadn't dreamed regularly since he was a child, sleeping in the same room as his brother Clayton, their beds separated two feet apart. Clayton had measured that distance, bedpost to bedpost. He measured a lot of things, space being vital to him. Clayton had suffered night terrors pretty regularly as a child. He'd thrash, shriek, even make these dog-like yelps. Usually their mother would shoulder through the door to shake Clay awake so violently that his head snapped back and forth. You're fine, she'd say, slapping Clayton's cheeks hard enough to pink in the skin. You're perfectly fine, for heaven's sake. Some nights when Clayton started to thrash, Luke would slide under the covers with him. Clay's skin was clammy and too hot. It made Luke think horribly of slipping into bed with someone who'd been boiled alive. 
Sometimes he'd wrap his arm around Clayton's chest and whisper softly to him. Shh, Clay, it's okay, just a nightmare. You're okay, you're home safe in bed. Luke rose from the bed and padded into the bathroom. The carpet of the yacht's interior was incredibly soft. It felt like walking on cotton batting. He twisted the bathroom spigot, but no water came out. Luke's throat was gluey with thirst. He made his way topside. His watch read 3.09 p.m. He could reset it, but time wouldn't matter soon. Where he was going, everything was pitch black all the time. The ocean stretched out. A low-lying moon was halved by the horizon. They were steering straight at it, giving Luke the impression of heading toward a huge tunnel carved out of the night. You're awake. Leo Bathgate stood on an upper deck, shirtless, his hip bones jutting above his shorts like jug handles. You sleep okay? Out like a light before my head hit the pillow. Good to hear it. Hungry? At the mention of food, Luke's stomach snarled. Starving, actually. We got grub on board, but temper your expectations, Doc. Bathgate led him to a kitchen as well appointed as any restaurants. The food was stashed in cardboard boxes, Japanese snacks, cans of wasabi peas, bags of shrimp chips, choco baby bars, pocky, plus bottles of Fanta and Picari sweat. Luke said, Is that squid jerky? Wild, huh? said Bathgate. This tub was brought down from the land of the rising sun, right? We're loaded for bear with Japanese delights. Anything you'd recommend? Bathgate said, The shrimp chips aren't half bad, kind of like Cheetos, except, you know, fishy. Luke tore open a pack of squid jerky. Pretty good, he said, chewing thoughtfully. Bathgate said, I found this, too. He held up a bottle of Japanese whiskey. I had warm beer the other night, he continued, but there's something about drinking hard liquor alone on a boat. But now you're here, want me to crack it open? Luke bit into another rawhide squid, chased it with a handful of wasabi peas, and snorted as the burn hit his nostrils. You only live once, Leo. Leo poured a stiff belt of whiskey into two glasses and cocked his head at Luke. Want a splash of coke? Some would say it's sacrilege sugaring up good hooch, but hell, I'm a low-class man with animal tastes. Oh, I doubt a low-class man would have a yachting license, would he? Luke told Leo with a grin. Leo tipped a wink. No, but a low-class man would have a trawling license. A trawler and a yacht are pretty much the same thing, just one's a hell of a lot nicer than the other. Like upgrading to a Ferrari when you're used to driving a Kia. Now you, however, a doctor. My brother's the brainiac, Luke said. I'm just a veterinarian. Just? I'd say that's a damn noble living. Sure. And I love what I do, said Luke. Just, you know, had to get there on my own. My folks couldn't afford to send me or my brother to school. Now for Clay, there were scholarships and grants and bursaries. Me, shoveling shit out of dog cages at the ASBCA midnight to 8 a.m. shift to pay for school. Luke smiled. So believe me, I'm no top-shelf liquor drinker. Leo tipped Coke into Luke's glass. They gave their drinks a quick stir around with their index fingers, thumbing their noses at propriety, and clinked glasses. Cheers, Doc. Cheers to you, Leo. Smoky, with a burned aftertaste. Whiskey had never been his tipple. Guilt crashed over Luke. Here he was drinking another man's property, a dead man's property in all likelihood, and he had no appreciation for it. Seven. Leo ushered Luke to the helm. The instrument panel was lit in ghostly greens and blues. A monitor charted the present depth of the sea, 2,300 feet. I've been on the ocean since I was a kid, said Leo. My pops owned a lobster boat. I was out on it as soon as I could walk. By seven, I was holding the wheel while he dragged the pots. He had me stand on an old telephone book. He laughed at the memory, his gaze returning to the water. I love the sea, and I understand it, 
much as you can understand something like this, but I haven't spent time under it, you know? In my line of work, if you find yourself there, well, you've screwed the pooch. The points of isolated stars reflected off the water. Luke and Clay used to stare at the stars from their bedroom skylight. The light we're looking at right now, Clay had told Luke, took billions of years to reach our eyes. Light travels at 299,792,458 meters per second, and still it takes a billion years to get here. That's how big the universe is. It's 99.9999999% darkness. And did you know that the stars we're looking at right now could be dead already? Burned up, nothing but a black hole? We're just seeing their ghosts. Ghosts that traveled a quintillion miles just to say, Boo! If they're ghosts, Luke had asked, then how come we're not scared of them? Clay just looked at him as if he'd fallen off the turnip truck, which, apart from an expression of mute dispassion, was the most frequent look he used on Luke in those days. On the main instrument panel, the ocean floor dropped beneath the yacht. 2,309 feet, 2,316, 2,325, a brief rise to 2,319, followed by a dip to 2,389. A different world existed down there, an inverse of the one human beings existed on. After a hundred feet, it was permanent midnight. Didn't mean to put your feet to the flames earlier, Leo said, asking about your brother and all. It didn't really matter to Luke. He hadn't spoken to his brother in years. Clayton had never cared about maintaining their connection anyway. A day, a week, a year, a decade. Time was immaterial to him, and people were even more forgettable. Hope, Leo said. That's the hardest part, maintaining hope after what happens, happens, because it already happened to my wife. Leo's eyes met Luke's. Luke caught that wretched need to tell him what had happened, and Luke would let him. That was part of the pact in this new version of the world. Listen to people's stories, tell your own. It was the only way to cope sometimes. I met her in middle school, Leo said. Mona Leftowski, the skinniest, gangliest, most remarkable girl. We lived on the same block, and I made every excuse to spend time with her. That didn't mean I was stuck doing girly things. Mona had a slingshot. We'd peg cans down at the town dump. One time I suggested pegging one of the dump critters, the big rats, maybe a raven, and she slugged me so hard that my shoulder was purple the next day. God, she was so mad. She said that ugly creatures got a right to exist same as you or me. Leo chuckled, the skin at the edges of his eyes crinkling. He gave Luke a knowing shrug that said, You've heard this story before, haven't you? Luke had. Just about everyone left had heard it or lived it or both. I proposed to her on her 19th birthday, down on one knee in Doyer's Burger Barn of all places. When she said yes, my heart just about floated out of my chest and bobbed in the rafters like a balloon on a string. I took over my father's business. Mona taught at the local elementary school. We had great years together, 21 of them in a row. The last two were... Harder, sure. But hell, that's life, right? Leo refilled his glass and drained half at a go, his Adam's apple jogging. Happened first was Mona forgot our anniversary. It wasn't such a big deal except she had a mind for dates. But what the heck, Mona forgets our anniversary, no big deal. He finished his drink and poured another belt. He didn't drink it. He just cupped the glass in his hands as if to draw warmth from it. It happened so gradually you could have convinced yourself it wasn't anything to worry about. You could say, well, hell, Mona is past fifty. A little memory loss is par for the course. But it got worse. She forgot to flick the turn signal when she was driving. No big whoop. Our town was small, traffic's light. 
But then she forgot that a red light means stop, and she blew right through an intersection. A Toyota got T-boned by a Lincoln. She was okay, thank God, but after that we decided it was best that I hold on to the car keys. Leo beheld Luke miserably over the rim of the glass. Mona brought it up after the accident. Was it Alzheimer's? Early onset? That made the most sense. Heck, at first that's what all the wonks thought it was, too. A hyper-aggressive strain of Alzheimer's. But as we figured out, the gets is something else entirely. She started writing notes to herself. When it was getting bad, I mean, when she was breaking out in those god-awful scabs. She'd fill notebooks with dates and times and little fragments of info. She had a stack of them all filled with her neat school teacher's handwriting. Luke set a hand on his shoulder. Listen, you don't have to. Leo waved Luke's suggestion off with impatience. What, am I dropping your mood, Doc? Luke thought, the story I could tell you, my friend, would sour your mood worse so don't you worry about it one bit. Go on, Leo. I watched it, Leo continued. God, I watched her forget. Then one day, she's staring at me across the kitchen table, and her mouth falls open and out comes a half-chewed dinner roll. She hadn't spoken for days at that point. I don't even know how much of her was left anymore. We sat that way for a few hours. Mona slumped there, mouth open. I tried to close it for her, but it just fall right open again. That night, I carried her upstairs and undressed her. I took off her... Doc, she was wearing diapers. Those were hard to lay your hands on by then. Pharmacies all sold out. It busted me up to pull those god-awful things on and off my wife. But if you love someone, you love them in all of their states, don't you? Sickness and health. I put her nightgown on, and I put her in bed and lay down beside her. I was crying, yeah, but I tried to be real soft about it. I don't imagine it troubled her. Sometime that night, she... stopped, I guess. It happened quickly, which was a relief. She forgot how to live, uh... Damn it all, I don't know how this disease finishes us. It didn't seem real. It didn't seem real. Luke understood that. He'd felt the exact same way the day his son had gone missing. I'm so sorry, Leo. Leo sawed his palm across his nose. It's all percentages, Doc. Life is percentages. When Mona came down with it, hardly anyone had gotten the gets. Less than 1% of the population. But that's the thing about percentages. No matter how small, they've got to affect someone, right? After Mona passed, I sold the house, packed up, and caught on as a commercial boat captain. When the gets started spreading, a few guys at my company started ferrying supplies to the Hesperus. Luke said, is that what I am, then? Supplies? Leo smiled. The work keeps my head straight. I like to think I'm doing a bit of good here. When your brother went down, I'm not a religious man, but I prayed he'd find answers. Not for me. The one that could have helped is gone from my life. But I harbor the hope all the same. The Marine Band radio squawked. What's your ETA, Bathgate? Someone asked. Leo consulted his monitors and then keyed the mic. This is Bathgate. Thirteen hours, twenty-two minutes. Over. Bump it up. A prolonged silence. Something has surfaced from the triest. It's... Is Dr. Nelson with you now? He's right beside me. Over. What surfaced is... You'd better get here as soon as you can manage. A knot something as hard and sticky as clay, twisted in Luke's stomach. I'll go full bore, then. Bathgate out. Leo adjusted his controls. The turbines churned. The yacht surged. 
Home again, home again, Leo sang. Jiggity jig. Eight. The Hesperus hovered against the horizon, holding its position against the rising sun. God of the evening star, Venus. That's what Hesperus meant in Greek, Luke had been told. But it was frequently mistranslated in Latin as phosphorus, namely Lucifer. Of all the names in creation, why risk that invocation? There wasn't anything especially demonic about the Hesperus. The research station looked a lot like an offshore oil rig. It sat atop the Mariana Trench, the deepest point in any ocean. The trench went down six miles, the same distance to reach the top of Mount Everest. And Luke's brother was two miles below that, in the heart of a narrower fissure called Challenger Deep. The Hesperus floated on huge nitrogen-filled bladders. Each one can shoulder ten tons, Leo had told Luke earlier. The Hesperus floats on thousands of those things. Its sheer enormity was staggering. Though squat, most of its structures were only a single story, the station sprawled across the water like a raucous frontier town, 10,000 metric tons of low-slung architecture, salt-whitened scaffolding, and waterproof storage canisters. Dozens of ships were moored around it like moons ringing a planet. Leo said, Impressive, huh? That's what happens when a bunch of first-world countries toss their moolah in a big pot. It is amazing, Luke said. Not half as amazing as what's happening down below. A shiver catwalked up Luke's spine. They were now floating above the Trieste, above Clayton, and Luke would be down with his brother soon enough. Something has surfaced. Get here as soon as you can manage. Leo nosed the yacht alongside the Hesperus and docked neat as a pin. By the time Luke had gathered his belongings and returned topside, stationed soldiers in camouflage fatigues had swung a gangplank into position. Who the hell wears camouflage on the ocean? Luke wondered. Should we go? He asked Leo. Not me, Doc. All this? Leo nodded at the soldiers. He's above my pay grade. How long had Luke known Leo? No more than a few hours seemed much longer. He wanted Leo to come with him, pay grades be damned, but he could only shake his hand. Pleasure meeting you. Thanks for the lift and the squid. Any time, Doc. I'm glad you're here. Like I said, I'm hopeful. Luke headed down the gangplank and slid into the back seat of a golf cart. An adenoidal soldier drove them down a walkway strung with windowless structures, People passed in and out of doors, some in fatigues and others in lab coats. The Hesperus reminded Luke of a mash unit, the stumpy outbuildings, the hum of generators, the calls going out over a loudspeaker system. L-team to SQR, code orange. L-team to SQR, code orange. The cart snaked down narrow paths strung between the buildings, jogging left and right. Sparks fanned from a darkened doorway. The soldier drove through the glittering fall, the embers falling painlessly on Luke's exposed arms. They had the dry sulfurous smell of Fourth of July sparklers. The cart shot through a tight corridor between two domed structures tipped with inverted satellite dishes that resembled a pair of perfect conical breasts, veered left, and followed the edge of the Hesperus for a hundred yards. The sea shone like a bronze mirror in the sun. Luke was amazed. They must have driven the length of a city block. He couldn't have found his way back to Leo's yacht without a map. The cart stopped in front of a black-sided building. As Luke was collecting his bags, a guy in a lab coat popped his head out of the door. Short and squat, with a bottom-heavy bowling ball build, his sunburned face was either cheery, his eyes how they twinkle, Luke thought, his dimples how merry, or faux cheery, as his eyes shone with cold scrutiny. Dr. Nelson, yes, he said. Of course, you have Clayton's eyes and nose. I've been waiting on your arrival. Come in, quickly. Nine. 
Luke followed the man down a hallway that dog-legged into a small, dark room. A bank of monitors dominated one wall. Strips of medical tape were affixed beneath each monitor, all labeled in black sharpie. Lab 1, Lab 2, Mess, Nelson's Chambers, Toy's Chambers, Westlake's Chambers, Water Closet, Kennel-slash-Storage, O2 Purification, Containment, Quarantine. Most of the monitors were either black or fuzzed with static. The few still in operation offered stationary black-and-white shots, similar to a surveillance video. One, Toys Chambers, offered a fisheye view of modest sleeping quarters, a cot that hinged down from a curved wall, one wafer-thin mattress, a latticework of steel grating that functioned as a walkway. The power could be failing, the man, who had yet to identify himself, told Luke. We don't know. Our communication link isn't working. How long? How long what? The man turned and stuck out his hand. Dr. Conrad Feltz, by the way. You're my brother's partner? Feltz made a sour face. Have you talked to your brother lately? Not in some time, no. Weeks? Months? A strained smile from Luke. A titch longer than that. It had been over eight years since they had spoken, but why burden Feltz with their dour brotherly history? Feltz's chin jutted. Partner, huh? I don't know if Clayton's ever had a partner. More subordinates, subservients. Not that I'm complaining. Sure sounds like you're complaining, Luke thought but didn't say. Clayton doesn't exactly play nicely with others, Feltz went on. I'm sure you were jabbed by the pointy end of that particular stick being the younger brother. Not so much as you'd think, unless you count being ignored as abusive. Feltz's eyebrow cocked, as if to say, You don't consider that abuse? Clayton does what he does, he said, and because he's supremely talented, his ways are tolerated. It's the way it is with savants, or geniuses, if you prefer. That line is so thin sometimes. We were competitors at first, Feltz went on, though I'm certain Clayton never saw it that way. Your brother competes against DNA helixes, against scientific absolutes, against the universe. The notion of competing with another person is, I'm convinced, totally foreign to him. Felz's lower lip protruded sullenly, a foamy dab of spit collecting in its vermilion zone. Your brother and I met at MIT, Felz said. He didn't have to apply, of course. His reputation allowed him to waltz on in. I soon discovered that Clayton wasn't so much driven as pathological. The man doesn't sleep. It was true that as Clayton hit adolescence, sleep had become non-essential. He'd been up at all hours, squirreled down in his basement lab at twelve years old. He'd stopped going to school by then. He'd been granted an exemption when it became clear that his knowledge outstripped that of his teachers, the equivalent of forcing a piano prodigy to take lessons from a dotty church organist. What your brother was doing even before he arrived at MIT was astounding, Fells said. Were you on hand to see what he did with that mouse? Of course Luke remembered the mouse. Ernie. The mouse's name was Ernie. Clay named all of his mice a grisly fixation considering their fates. Clayton had heard about this anesthesiologist, a Dr. Charles Vacanti, who'd grafted a human ear onto a mouse's back. The ear was cartilage grown by seeding cow cartilage cells into a biodegradable ear-shaped mold, which was then implanted under the mouse's skin. Clayton made it his mission to outdo Vacanti. How he'd managed to do it baffled Luke to this day. As a veterinarian, Luke understood the vagaries of flesh and trauma and disease, but Clayton occupied a different stratum of intellect. He could see doors set in the ordinary fabric of things that were invisible to everyone else, and if he lacked a key to those doors, he goddamn well made one. Luke had helped Clayton shave the test mice. Clayton was a teenager by then, Luke a few years younger. He was rarely allowed into Clayton's lab, which was set up in their father's old workshop. Clayton kept it scrupulously clean, as even a speck of dust could ruin his projects. 
When he was deep into an objective, as he called them, Clayton could go days without food or sleep. But Clayton allowed Luke to prep the mice. Luke used the old wall clippers his father used on his wiry neck hairs. For the Vacanti objective, there were thirteen mice, all named. Doug and Pepper and Dot and Beanie and Clyde and Percival, etc. They squealed and pissed and shit perfect little chocolate sprinkle-shaped turds as Luke worked the clippers over their squirming bodies. Okay, you can go now. Clay said brusquely after Luke had finished, not even a thank you. That was the last Luke had seen of his brother for days. At night, the squeaks of those mice traveled through the vents. One morning, Luke found one of them in the garbage can atop the old coffee grounds and eggshells. A weird lump projected from the mouse's back. It looked like a horn or a shark's fin. Luke plucked it from the trash and dug a hole in the garden and buried it. A few weeks later, Luke was downstairs tossing his soccer uniform into the dryer when the door to Clayton's lab opened. Come see, Clayton said. The mouse, which Clayton had named Doug, trundled awkwardly around the plastic bin. Luke was stunned. Is that a... Uh... Nose? Clayton smiled. Yes, it is. A nose, a human-sized nose, spread across Doug's entire back, from his tail to the tip of his spine. The nostrils fanned around Doug's rump. The mouse staggered around like a donkey lugging an overloaded saddlebag. How did you... It's not so hard. Clayton said, you wouldn't understand. It was typical for Clayton to be dismissive of his own accomplishments, and he was right. Luke wouldn't have understood. Incredibly, the nose twitched. The nostrils dilated. Is it breathing? Clayton said, no. Doug's muscles have grown through the new tissue. When its body twitches, so does his nose. What, what are you going to do with him? Clayton shrugged as if he hadn't thought about it. He'd accomplished his goal, outdoing Dr. Vacanti. Now Doug existed. But what did the world want with a mouse with a nose on its back? Squeals came from under the lab bench. Luke noticed another tub. What's in there? he asked. Oh, that's just Ernie. Luke reached down and pulled the tub out. Clayton made no move to stop him. For a long moment, Luke's eyes couldn't register what they were seeing. Oh, no. Oh. The single mouse, could it really be called that anymore, in the tub, was hairless, its body as pink as the skin under a scab. Ernie's legs, it had... No legs. Three nubs projected from the bloat of its body. It was as if its legs had melted into scarified bulbs of flesh. One of its ears was normal, but the other tapered into a whip of flesh. Its misplaced tail, the one that should have rightly been growing at the back of its body. Clay. Oh, God, what? A pink, misshapen sack hung off Ernie's head. It was as sheer as a bat's wing, tiny capillaries braided over its surface. Under this greasy stretching of skin, Luke could see the torpid movements of Ernie's guts, its stomach quivering, its intestines shuddering. The foreign structure was vaguely peaked, and there were two shallow divots on one side. The nose didn't hold its integrity. Clayton explained clinically. The cellular walls broke down, its insides migrating into the new structure, and other structural collapse you wouldn't understand. Ernie pulled itself in a lopsided circle using a smooth hook of skin that projected from its sternum. It dragged itself to a pile of food pellets and dipped its tube-like mouth to eat. The squeals became slurps, which switched back to squeals when it couldn't get the pellets into its toothless mouth. 
I've been crushing the pellets up, Clayton said, so Ernie can eat. Why? Why is it still alive? I don't know, Clayton said honestly. Organisms are tough. They do not want to expire. But don't worry, I was able to harvest tissue from Ernie and used it on Doug, and Doug worked. Luke noticed the plugs of flesh that Clay had carved from the deformed mouse's flanks, seedlings from which Doug could grow. That was how Clayton saw things, as workable premises, or simply one of many faltering steps toward that workable premise. And Ernie belonged on Clayton's blooper reel. Luke cupped Ernie in his hands. The mouse thing mewed and shuddered. I'm taking it, Luke said. Clayton shrugged. I don't need it anymore. Luke filled a bucket with water from the hose and drowned Ernie on the porch. It seemed the quickest, most painless way. He buried Ernie in the garden. While he was digging the hole, still backhanding tears from his eyes, he'd seen Clay staring at him from the basement window, his face set in a bemused and slightly scornful expression. Yes, of course, Luke told Fells after a long pause. I remember what Clayton did with that mouse. Clayton's miracle mouse had set off a furor in the scientific community and soon the media. Clayton was feted in some circles, demonized in others. Over the next year, the press coined a number of monikers from Kid Frankenstein to Cute Clay on account of his striking good looks. He remains the only scientist to grace the pages of Tiger Beat and Bop magazines, which dispatched photographers to snap him coming and going from his house to Jonas Salk, for his moodiness with reporters. Clayton was approached by the heads of several major medical institutions. They pursued him with the ardor of a blue-chip athletic recruit, offering full run of their facilities. He also entertained overtures from Big Pharma and more than a few genetic research firms. He turned them all down. When asked why, he said, I'd miss my mother's meatballs too much. This was a lie and Luke knew it. Clayton hated his mom's meatballs. Fells directed Luke's attention to the bank of monitors. Luke's gaze was drawn to the one marked O2 purification. White objects resembling oil filters were screwed into the room's walls. Luke figured the oxygen inside the undersea station must pass through those cylinders, which siphoned off the carbon monoxide to make it breathable again. The monitor's image adjusted a fragmentary darkening in the lower left hemisphere. It was so brief, so inconsequential, that Luke wondered if he'd seen anything at all. Could it be a technical malfunction? The signal had to travel up through eight miles of water, after all. So who's down there? Other than your brother, Fells said, there are two others, both Americans. I'm sorry, Jesus, there's one. There were three at first, but... But, Fells held up a hand. We'll get to that. Right now, there's only your brother and Dr. Hugo Toy, the molecular biologist. That's it? Two people? Fells nodded. Their vital sign monitors indicate they're both alive and functional. Sorry, I don't know a better word. So them plus the test subjects. Two Labrador retrievers, various reptile species, guinea pigs, and, of course, the bees. Luke nodded. Okay, so here's the billion-dollar question. Why are they down there at all? Fels's face held the look of a boy with a secret so monumental that holding it in caused him physical pain. What we've discovered appears to exist beyond all explication. Ten. Fells opened a door, which led into a small lab dominated by a steel bench. A hum filled the air. It held an uneven cadence, the odd chirp or hiccup, the way a computer sounds when it's processing huge amounts of data. Fells walked to an upright black box. It had the dimensions of a hotel fridge with a keypad on its front. It still amazes me that access could be so simple, he said. 
Five years ago, we'd have had to pass through an armed checkpoint, a titanium door, a retinal scan, a blood serum scan, and a body cavity search just to fill out the requisition forms to look at what I'm about to show you. The Hesperus exists because of this, but we don't know what this is. So in that way, it's like leaving the Hope Diamond in a bus station locker, as long as nobody really understands its value, it's perfectly safe where it is. Fells entered a passcode. The lock on the black box disengaged. He cracked the lid. A stream of supercooled air escaped. Luke leaned forward, dimly aware of the throbbing tension in his chest. I really don't think security matters much anyway, Fells said more to himself than to Luke. I'm not sure anyone could move it, even if they wanted to. Why? Luke asked. Because, Fells said softly, it's exactly where it wants to be. The cooler contained a single sealed petri dish. Fells reached for it with great reverence, fear, or some combination of both. You need to keep it that cold? Luke asked. Fells gave a tepid smile. We don't know. It seems unwise to place it in an environment conductive to growth. I mean, we don't want it growing. Not yet. He set the Petri dish on the lab bench. The lid was fogged. The condensation evaporated, the glass clearing by degrees. Isn't it magnificent? said Fells. Eleven. Magnificent was one word for it, but mundane also came to mind. A gelatinous blob the size of a robin's egg. It looked like a glob of partially set jello, not one of the colorful flavors either. A drab, nothing color, the color you'd get if you scraped a billion thumbprints off a million window panes and collected them into a ball. What is it? It's resistant to categorization, said Fells. Every standard test, DNA cataloging, cellular identity, chemical pattern bonding, all inconclusive. No matches to any known flora, fauna, DNA structures, or chemical compounds. It's, well, like I said, uncategorizable. Is there a name for it? Formally? Scientifically? Nothing, yet, Fells said. It's known internally as Specimen 1G. We've had a few other specimens in hand, but they vanished. Vanished. Luke hated that particular word. What do you mean? He said. They died, or... Fels shook his head. No, they just disappeared and evanesced, vaporized, gone away. Informally, your brother and I have a name for it. Ambrosia, after the Greek word for nectar of the gods, Initially, it was lying on a bed of agar gel, the standard petri dish base. Microbial growth does not destroy the gel structure, as microorganisms are unable to digest agar. But this specimen did something to the agar. It, well, harmonized it, I guess you could say. You mean ate it? No, no, it added the agar to itself transmuted the agar to make more of itself. The sample used to be much smaller. There's nothing left of the agar, and its mass has been added to the ambrosia. It would be the equivalent of, oh, I don't know, say instead of eating a loaf of bread, you somehow added the loaf to your body, changed its cell structure to mimic your own, retained its shape and size, and ended up with a new appendage exactly resembling that loaf. Fells pointed. Luke followed his finger, which he noticed was trembling. If you look carefully, you can see it started to do the same to the dish. Luke noted a slight depression in the petri dish, as if it had been eaten away by acid. He imagined the ambrosia eating through the glass, then the cooler and the floor, until it plopped into one of the nitrogen-filled bladders, assimilating the gas, somehow making itself bigger spreading across the bottom of the Hesperus like a tenacious weed. Is it some kind of parasite, or something from the fossil age? It's something much more than that, said Fells. If it's primitive, 
I suppose it would be in the way sharks are. They were perfectly built from the start, so they never needed to evolve. But sharks are common. They are of this world. This thing is infinitely more complex. What do you mean? It's alien? Fells didn't answer. Luke realized that the specimen wasn't quite as lusterless as it had seemed at first. It sparkled. The shimmer reminded Luke of marbles, marbles in a mesh sack, each one glossed by the sun, the marbles he'd played with as a child. Luke leaned in to get a better look. Veins of light streaked through the ambrosia's interior, coin-bright shafts of light like zaps of lightning, but more colorful, reds and violets and emeralds and incandescent whites. So transfixing, Luke could watch it all day and night. Fells squeezed Luke's elbow. Hey, you shouldn't look at it for too long. It's got a strange way about it. Dull anger hived in Luke's stomach. He wanted to look some more, but Fells, the killjoy bastard, was intent on stopping him. I'm okay, Luke said. I'm fine, damn it. Luke snapped back to himself. He smiled sheepishly at Fells. I'm sorry. Fells returned the dish to the cooler. It'll pass. It's one of the effects the ambrosia possesses. So where the hell did it come from? Luke asked, half-knowing already. Fells pointed downward. The deep? How did you... Four years ago, a Pollock ship, the Olympiad, was bottom-trawling twenty miles north of here, Fells said. Their winch broke, so to avoid damaging the net, the captain charted a course for the Mariana Trench. It's so deep that the ship could circle safely until the winch was fixed. When the net was dragged up, it was full of bycatch, that is, marine life they hadn't set out to capture. They found a lanternfish, a species that commonly dwells several miles beneath the surface. It was still alive, which was the first shock. Lanternfish live in darkness under tremendous pressure. If they swim toward the surface, the lessened pressure pulls their body apart. Not only that but the sunlight attacks their flesh like acid. The only way to study lanternfish or anything that dwells at those depths is to do so in their habitat, which is why so little is known about them. The lanternfish they found was intact? Not just that, Dr. Nelson. It was alive. It may have been thrown over the side if not for the intervention of Dr. Eva Parks, a marine biologist who was on board to study Pollock migratory patterns. She spied the fish and recognized its inconceivability. She was scrupulous. She pegged the ship's longitude and latitude, fixing its position. Otherwise, your brother and I wouldn't have known where to begin our search. Dr. Parks took a few measurements, length, girth, weight, before the fish started to show signs of mortality. She began to hastily count the annuli on its scales. Perhaps you know of these? They're, what, age rings? Luke said. The same as when you cut down a tree, count the number of rings, you get its age? Fells nodded. Exactly so. But Parks couldn't count the rings. There were simply too many of them. They were lapped over and over, ring upon ring, over ring, making an accurate enumeration impossible. What do you mean? I mean, Dr. Nelson, Fells said. The fish was functionally ageless so old that the common method of analysis was useless. How long do lanternfish live? Twenty or thirty years, likely. This one could have been several hundred years old, a thousand years old, or even older, as in immeasurably old. How is that possible? Fells showed Luke his open palms as if to say it shouldn't be possible. During Dr. Park's examination, the fish expired. As she related it, it didn't just die, it decomposed. Almost instantaneously, it surrendered its cellular integrity. It rotted in real time. Imagine the trauma it would have sustained while rising to the surface, the attacks by pressure and sunlight. Now imagine it all happening at once. Dr. Parks took a video of the aftermath, a black pool of gunk and shortly after that came another shock. Fells gestured to the cooler. Dr. Pox discovered a tiny particle of ambrosia beside the carcass. 
no bigger than a few stuck-together grains of sand. It's a miracle she was able to distinguish it from the rotted matter. She put it in a petri dish, as scientists do. So you're saying that the ambrosia kept the lanternfish alive for a minor eternity? That the ambrosia kept the same fish alive, protecting it somehow as it rose through the oceanic zones? That the ambrosia didn't allow that fish to die until it deserted its body, either voluntarily or through some other organic process? Fells showed Luke his palms again. Many signs point to yes. So this stuff is floating around down there, attaching itself to aquatic life? Fells shook his head. The lantern fish was an anomaly. We found no further presence of ambrosia at that depth. Our speculation is that the fish hunted near a thermal vent. A tiny shred of ambrosia could have floated up from below and moored to the fish. The only place we found any concentration of ambrosia, or what we believe to be ambrosia, is much deeper. The deepest part of the Mariana Trench, in fact. Right in the area of Challenger Deep. Which is where the Trieste is? Fells nodded. We sent down observation cameras first, when the idea of constructing a station at that depth was still in its infancy. We had to know if the effort was worthwhile. The camera lenses kept shattering under pressure, but the footage was promising. Globules of matter drifting over the trench floor, strange movements, the sort commonly associated with sentient life, which goes against all prior understandings of those depths. For decades, nobody thought anything could exist down there. The monolithic pressure, a total absence of nourishing light. How could anything survive? And that was enough to kickstart all of this, Luke said a few blobs fluttering around at the bottom of the ocean? Desperate times, Dr. Nelson. Luke lapsed into silence. You seem underwhelmed, said Feltz. Or is it dubious? I felt the same way at first. Nothing should live down there. What good could it do us anyway? But then I saw for myself. Your brother showed me. How did Clayton get involved with all this? Fells said, When you discover something like ambrosia, the equivalent of an intricate organic riddle, who would you summon if not the world's foremost riddle solver? He waved Luke toward the back of the room. Come here. Let me show you something else. Twelve. Fels's laptop sat on the lab bench. Hang on, it's here somewhere. He scrolled the mouse across the files, littering the computer's desktop. You followed your brother's work, I take it. Surely you know about his cancer, mouse. How could Luke not? It was his brother's best-known contribution to science, far more impressive than Doug, his nose mouse. Clayton hadn't discovered a cure for cancer, far from it. But he had found a way to give cancer to a mouse, and he gave it with pinpoint precision. He could isolate the location, the organ, or tissue, and control the complexity of its spread, malignant or benign, dormant or devouring. Clayton's very special mice were born with cancer. They were engineered to be sick, specifically and perfectly from a scientific point of view. A researcher could order 50 mice with stage 2 lung cancer, or 100 mice with advanced liver cancer, or 10 with benign stomach tumors. Clayton's mice were a boon to science. They were born carrying the pathogen that would kill them, and they were never truly healthy, not for one moment of their lives. Animal rights activists were none too thrilled, to put it mildly, but that didn't stop researchers everywhere from hoisting Clayton on their collective shoulders. Your brother heard about Dr. Parks and the foreign matter she'd isolated, said Fells. Shortly thereafter, the sample was delivered to our lab for study. And Dr. Parks had no problem with that? Dr. Parks was given an opportunity to stay with the project. She opted not to take that opportunity. Clayton muscled her out. 
Fells looked up sharply. Nothing like that, I assure you. Luke saw no use in pursuing the issue. So when the sample arrived, your brother absented himself for several days. He'd emerge from the lab weary but excited. As the days ground on, confusion wore through that excitement. I don't know, he told me. I really can't tell you anything about this substance. It's like nothing we've seen before on this earth. Fells located the MOV file he'd been searching for. Cancer Mouse Ambrosia, Test 1B. For this test, Clayton created a special mouse, Fells said. It didn't have one cancer. It had virtually all of them. It was sick in every way it was possible to be sick. Liver, pancreatic, spinal, skin, bowel. It was on death's door by the time the first experiment took place. Why 1B? Luke asked. What happened to 1A? The ambrosia didn't interact with the first test subject. It refused to, I suppose is the only explanation. As such, the subject expired. Now watch, Dr. Nelson. I think you'll find it quite extraordinary. Fells clicked the play arrow on the file. A tight shot, a mouse in a lab tray. It squeaked in obvious pain and tottered a few inches across the tray before toppling over, breathing heavily. A hand entered the frame, Clayton's hand, his fingers gripping a pair of tweezers. Clayton's other hand appeared, and in it, a petri dish. He tweezed out a speck of ambrosia and laid it beside the mouse. The mouse lay still. Luke was aware of the passage of time only in the tension that built up in his arms and fingers and the sheen of sweat slicking his forehead. The mouse dragged itself to the ambrosia. Its squeaks sounded different, almost pleading, though that was surely only Luke's interpretation. It drew nearer to the speck until... Whoa, what the hell happened there? Luke said. Fells moved to the cursor, backtracking the file. He played it again. Luke concentrated this time. He knew it was coming. And still... I can't make it out. Yes, none of us can, Fells said. I've replayed that section hundreds of times. We gave it to an audiovisual wizard, had her blow up the image and slow it down. It clarifies nothing. It simply happens too fast. It looks like... Like the ambrosia goes into the mouse. Yes, penetrates its skin. But the ambrosia is gelatinous. How could it solidify itself to pierce flesh and not leave a wound? We inspected the mouse afterward. No hole, no blood, no scar. We thought since the entry point is near the mouse's mouth, perhaps it entered there. We slowed the footage down, looked at it frame by frame. One frame the ambrosia's there, the next it's gone. And it's inside the mouse. It simply must be, said Fells. The video resumed. The mouse lay still a few seconds, then hopped up and began racing around the tray faster and faster until it flung itself out onto the bench. Someone said, Damn! as the mouse skittered across the table with gleeful abandon. Clayton entered the frame, chasing it. Another man dashed behind him. Next came Clayton's voice. I've got it. The video ended. Fells said, Likely you already know what I'm going to tell you. You've realized that the Hesperus, the Triest, and the trillion-odd dollars funding this project wouldn't have materialized were it not for what happened to that mouse. Luke said, It was cured. The cancer was eradicated. There was not one discoverable cancerous cell in its body. It was riddled with the stuff, and then all gone. What about the ambrosia? Luke said. Was it isolated inside the mouse? Fells shook his head. The mouse was totally unchanged, other than the eradication of its cancer. Its amino profile and bone density and factors X, Y, and Z, all unchanged, except for changes that would naturally occur with the cancer gone. But it's just a mouse, Luke said, and it's cancer. How can we know this stuff will address the gets in humans? Dr. Nelson, 
We would have searched for this stuff, as you call it, if all it did was cure cancer in mice. It's a remarkable discovery any way you slice it. If your brother could have infected a mouse with the gets, well, we would know to a certainty. But the disease doesn't interact with animals, as you well know. We did, however, perform tests on cancerous human cells, lab tests only, but the results were promising. And that was enough to spur all this? My God, man, what else were we waiting for? If not now, when? So, Luke said, what you've found is some kind of... Universal healer? Fells shook his head wonderingly, a stunned smile on his face. It would seem so. Imagine a drug that cures everything and anything, whitewashes all the sickness in your body, fixing you completely. It seems crazy, but... But this isn't a drug. This is an organism. How do you know the effects aren't temporary? Or that the stuff isn't doing something to make it run around like that to subtly injure the mouse? Like what? I mean controlling it in some way, Luke thought, but didn't say, remembering the weird prickle he'd gotten when he'd stared at the ambrosia. Fells said, Are you a religious man, Dr. Nelson? Your brother isn't. Men like us rarely are. But you? Luke shook his head. My mom used to say she prayed at the Church of State in Maine, which was the intersection where the local bank sat. Fells nodded and said, I only ask because of something your brother said. It was the one time when he sounded truly helpless, casting his lot with the fates, you could say. He'd been researching the gets before this business with ambrosia. He couldn't crack it for the life of him, totally stymied. Then he encountered the ambrosia and couldn't make heads or tails of it either. One night, after another fruitless session with the ambrosia, he said, What if the devil unleashed a perfectly unexplainable plague on humanity? If so, isn't it equally possible that God created the perfect, if inexplicable, cure? Fels shrugged. Clayton believes in keys and locks. For every lock, there exists a key. You just have to find those keys. Find them and trust in the will of a higher power. Locks and keys. Exactly, Dr. Nelson. Locks and keys. And this particular key, you think it's eight miles down? Fells closed the laptop. That's the hope. Perhaps there is an abundance of it. Perhaps, and this is an admittedly out there hypothesis, what we've found so far are shreds of a far larger organism, a mother organism, if you will. A quaver passed down Luke's spine, a mother organism, huge and amorphous and ageless, lying in darkness at the bottom of the sea. Jesus. Why wouldn't Dr. Parks want to be a part of this? Phil started. I beg pardon? Dr. Eva Parks. She discovered it. Why wouldn't she want to be a part of perhaps the greatest discovery in human history? Of course, Luke knew it had to be Clayton. His bullying ways. He was thinking about their childhood sandbox how Clay had commandeered the toys for no other purpose than to deprive Luke of the satisfaction of playing with them. Dr. Nelson. Fells licked his lips, smearing that ever-present dab of spit across them. Dr. Parks committed suicide shortly after the sample arrived in our custody. She hanged herself in her apartment in Maine, in her closet with a length of nautical rope. Good God, why would she do such a thing? That I do not know. From all outward appearances, she was happy, a good career, engaged to another doctor she'd met at graduate school. Fells glanced at the cooler and licked his lips again. There is no sensible cause, but suicide is not a sensible act. A door banged open. Luke and Fells craned their necks toward the sound. 
The very man I'm looking for, a new voice said. Thirteen. The voice belonged to a woman in combat fatigues, tall and incredibly broad across the shoulders, that broadness tapering toward her waist, which was cinched in a thick belt. She wore no insignia of rank. Those things didn't mean as much now, the same way a policeman's badge carried less heft. Ever since the gets, people were measured by their abilities rather than by the pieces of tin pinned to their chests. Her hair was clipped short, and her jaw had a long angularity that gave her face a sharpness, an intensity that was of a piece with her piercing green eyes. She carried herself with a controlled bearing that seemed almost robotic, each movement calibrated to deliver maximum function with minimal exertion. A scar roped up the side of her neck and trailed behind her left ear, thick and ribbed and pink, the color of bubblegum. Dr. Nelson? Yes. She offered her hand. Alice Sykes, Lieutenant Commander, U.S. Navy, but feel free to call me Al. Paul Simon may come sniffing around for royalties, but I can deal with that hassle personally. Luke liked her immediately, yet he got a sense of forced jocularity off of her, too. Her smile was screwed on too tight. She turned to Fells. I take it you filled Dr. Nelson in on the magical goo in Deep Freeze? Dr. Fells stood up straight. Yes, we've covered just about everything. Fine, we gotta get this show on the road. Alice's expression darkened. Have you spoken to him about what surfaced? Fells said, No, I thought... That's okay. It's not an easy matter. Let's hop to it. A four-seat golf cart waited on the deck. Al sat up front, Fells and Luke behind. A hell of a thing, isn't it? Al said to Luke as they careened through the floating mini-city. Each building was painted a reflective black, the sun knifed off every angle painfully bright. Luke caught sight of the sea through a gap between the buildings. The horizon shimmered, the sky a searing blue against the plate-glass water. Everything looked new and modern, but so many of the structures seemed to be half-built or unused. It reminded Luke of those model communities on the outskirts of Las Vegas, built in anticipation of a boom that never came. The Hesperus had that same ghost town feel. It was a place built for great things that had not quite come to pass. Al craned her head around to see if Luke was taking it all in. Luke diverted his gaze. He'd been focused on the scar that went all the way up around the back of Al's neck, a pink band that petered out at her right earlobe. It looked as though someone had tried to slit her neck, starting at the back. If she noticed him looking, she was tactful enough not to mention it. Who paid for all this? Luke said. Everyone who earns a paycheck, Al said. You, me, the butcher, the baker. Not just American greenbacks, either. Japanese yen, British pounds, Chinese yuan, German Deutschmarks. That would be euros said Fells fussily. They replaced the Deutschmark in 2002. Thank you, Dr. Fells, for your scrupulous attention in regards to matters of international currency. You're welcome. Anyway, Alice went on, what you see here is the whole world holding hands. We got a lot of support from private enterprise, too. CEOs, CFOs, magnates, philanthropists. Everyone's smashing their piggy banks. Everybody's lost something to this by now, you know. And what's money worth if there's no future to spend it in? Why is it all Americans, then? I mean, down on the Trieste, Dr. Fells said the researchers are all from the U.S. I guess because America always rides point, Al said. They stopped beside a compact submarine, fifteen feet long with a porthole window at one end. It lay in a massive canvas hammock. It looked like a huge lozenge, a vitamin pill for Neptune. Challenger 5, Al told Luke. It's being prepped for your descent. Luke said, You've got to be kidding me. I have no idea how to operate this. Yeah, that would take some serious training. Thankfully, you'll be in the company of a skilled pilot. Al thumped her chest. Like I said, tight squeeze. She leaned over the seat, jammed her face close to Luke's own. Breathe on me. What? I said, breathe on me. 
Come on, don't be shy. Luke did as she asked, too startled to refuse. Al sniffed. Okay, good. Nothing worse than being cooped up for hours with a guy with bad breath. Luke exhaled, chuckling now. I've got Tic Tacs in my bag. She winked. Even better. If I have to journey eight miles beneath the water's surface, Luke thought, this Alice Sykes seems as fine a companion as any. Dr. Westlake came up in Challenger 4, Al said. It's still under quarantine. Luke said, Dr. Westlake? Dr. Fells hasn't mentioned him yet? Al darted a glance at Fells, a darkness settling into her eyes. He was the third member of the team, Dr. Cooper Westlake. He was, uh, remind me what was his job again, doctor? Computational biologist, Fells said as the cart got rolling again. I got to know Dr. Westlake pretty well, Al said. The forced jocularity was gone, in its place was somber concern. I liked him a hell of a lot. He seemed put together, but it's incredibly hard down there. Not just the physical pressure, there's the added pressure of what they're trying to achieve. Dr. Westlake surfaced nine and a half hours ago while you were in transit. Let me ask, has your brother ever mentioned him? Luke said, I've never met Dr. Westlake, never even heard his name. I believe that's the truth as you know it, said Al. The cart stopped before a building with a red cross on its exterior. Al rested her gaze gently upon Luke's. What's behind that door, she said, is Dr. Westlake. What surfaced of him? You don't have to look, but maybe you'll want to, seeing as you've agreed to go down. What's happened to him, said Luke. Alice showed him her palms, same as Fells had done, a helpless gesture. It's still our world down there, Dr. Nelson, she said, but that's like saying that the ice 10,000 feet beneath the Arctic ice pack is, too. Yeah, it is, but not like anything we know. Our government has spent $30 trillion on space exploration and less than 1% of that to explore the world underneath us right now. But it's just as unknown. You'll be entering another world, really and truly. It's Luke he told her, call me Luke, and I'll go. I'll see. Al's clipped nod made Luke think she'd wished he'd chosen otherwise. Fourteen. The air was meat locker cold on the other side of the door with the red cross. Luke's arms instantly broke out in goose flesh. The room was uncluttered, halogen lights, buzzed down on a bank of steel vaults. Luke had visited morgues as a veterinarian, most recently to perform an autopsy on a police dog that had died after ingesting a perforated balloon of heroin. Every vault is empty save one, Al said. We've been lucky lately with the gets. A few in quarantine, but none dead, and no new cases reported in a week. Must be the sea air, a gravedigger's smile. Sorry, poor taste. They walked with aching slowness toward the vaults. Dr. Westlake and the others had settled into their roles inside the Trieste. The station was holding up, electrical function, oxygen purification, waste disposal, all systems operational, which on the technical side of things was the main concern. Mentally, the crew seemed sound. Your brother was the point man. He gave the majority of the updates, so our perceptions up here were filtered through him. But we watched the other two on the monitors— they were eating, sleeping, engaged in productive labor. You'd see them talking and laughing with one another. There was the odd sign of strain, but that could be chalked up to their situation. Add to that the sensory deprivation. No sun, no fresh air. But our psychs are versed in signs of trauma fatigue. They assured us the trio was holding up well. Then, well, Westlake went off the grid. Al gripped the handle of the centermost vault and cracked it open a few inches. A chemical tang puffed out, sliming Luke's tongue and making him slightly nauseous. Westlake may have been getting squirrely, Al said. He'd been isolated inside his lab for quite some time. No updates, no contact. The video camera in his lab was busted. We couldn't see what he was doing. 
or what was being done to him. Done to him? Luke thought. We thought about going down. Maybe he'd cracked, right? But descents have been tricky the past few weeks. A lot of subsurface disturbances, the most serious being a current ring situated directly above the trench. Current ring? An underwater tornado, basically. An eddy sucking a billion odd tons of water into itself, creating a funnel. We sent a supply drone last week. The eddy caught it, spun it, and smashed it into the trench wall. And you expect me to go down into that? The rings cleared two days ago. The sea's gone sleepy again. Anyway, we didn't go down for two reasons. She held up a finger. One, because of the current ring. She held up a second finger. And two, because your brother, whose contact had become sporadic, assured us things were fine. Then today, in the early hours of morning, Challenger 4, which had been docked to the Trieste, began to rise. Westlake was inside. How he'd managed to get the sub working, he hadn't been trained in its operation, is unknown. A few things happened during Westlake's ascent, all of them bad. First, we lost contact with the Trieste altogether. The comlink went kerflui, or else someone shut it off. Second, we lost most of the monitors. We'd already lost a few, but this was a whole whack of them all at once. Could be a technical issue, a major circuit blowout, or else someone down there wanted them off. Someone or something, Luke thought irrationally. Something else happened as Westlake came up, happened to him. He could only have done it to himself. Elle's fingers were steady on the vault's handle, but a fragile muscle fluttered next to her eye. You go ahead and open it, Luke said. Without another word, she did so. Fifteen. At first, Luke couldn't tell what he was looking at. His eyes rejected it, as it didn't fit any prior conceptions of the human form. Dr. Westlake's naked body was a swollen mass of scar tissue. His body was all scars, a ballooned, inflated parody of the human form. It appeared as if Westlake had been wrapped in pink elastic bands. Some were thick as garter snakes, others thin as copper wires, some fibrous as canvas rigging, others frail as onion skin. They lapped over in gruesome profusion, each one nurtured to a sickening, sensuous bulbosity. It seemed as if at any moment they might burst open and thin ribbons of flesh would spool forth, covering the old scars in layers that further obscured the body trapped inside. Westlake's frame was bent, each limb wrenched at an unnatural angle. The bends. Nitrogen bubbles had built up in the blood snapping Westlake's bones as they expanded. Luke wanted to look away. Couldn't. Sweet Christ, his face. The scars were the worst there. Elsewhere they seemed to have been laid down haphazardly, but the ones on his face had a more considered appearance. They had been delivered with special care. His eyes were trapped inside swollen bulbs of flesh, if Luke were to touch them, he imagined they would feel like India rubber balls, each so huge that they projected from the wrecked tapestry of his face like plums. His lips had been sliced and had healed until the flesh knit together, upper lip wetted to bottom, fused into a thick band that curved upward in a grisly rictus. His nostrils had a feathered look, the flesh slit back in fragile petals that revealed candle-white sinus cavities. Shut it. Luke's voice was a frail whisper. Please. Al did so. Luke jackknifed at the waist, hands braced on his knees. How? I wish I had any idea, Al said softly. We found a scalpel in the sub. Its blade was gouged up, dull as a butter knife. We figure it had been used to cut through flesh tendon, cartilage. Eventually, it went dull on the bone. It's not possible, Al. I mean, that kind of trauma. How long does it take to surface? Eight or nine hours, usually. 
Westlake came faster, which is why he got the bends. He decompressed too fast. Truth is, we were fully expecting that it wouldn't be pretty, but no way we could have imagined this. He did this to himself? Who else? The submarine was empty. Totally empty? Luke wondered. What if Westlake had been carrying that goo? We didn't find any ambrosia, Al said before Luke could ask. We tore apart the sub and found not a trace of the stuff, just the scalpel, Westlake's body, and one more thing. What was that? Luke, Al said carefully, Fells showed you the mouse video, right? You see what that stuff can do? A godsend? I can see that, but I can see other things, too. She didn't need to finish. Luke had the same vision. Westlake rising up from Challenger Deep, hacking into himself, and every time he cut himself, he healed so fast that it was almost immediate. Luke pictured an endless zipper, Westlake's flesh opening only to close a few moments after the scalpel slid it, leaving very little blood and a ragged scar. Westlake could have sliced himself for hours, reducing himself in some exquisite way, laughing or shrieking or crying or who knows what mindlessly or mindfully, layering scar over scar until... What? How did he die? Had the ambrosia deserted him? Evanesced, as Fells said? Luke closed his eyes. The absolute worst of all was the expression frozen on Westlake's face. Luke was quite certain he died smiling. What else, Al? What was inside the submersible? She set a hand on Luke's shoulder. Luke didn't realize how badly he'd been shaking. It had nothing to do with how cold the room felt. 16. Dr. Fells wasn't there when they returned to the deck of the Hesperus. They got into the cart, both of them sitting on the rear seat. Go, Al told the driver. Luke couldn't inhale enough air to inflate his lungs. Couldn't unsee Dr. Westlake's horrible, twisted body. For the first time, doubt seeped into Luke's mind. Why did he have to go down anyway? He wasn't saying he wouldn't, but why him? He hadn't asked this most elementary question when the phone had woken him two days ago. He'd flown to Guam unquestioningly, as many people might when their government made the request. He paid his taxes and renewed his license and never caught more fish than his limit, too. He wanted to help, to do something good, just as Leo Bathgate did. Governments approved of citizens like Luke Nelson. Plus, there was no one on the other side of his bed to tell Luke not to go. And the room down the hall that his son had once slept in was empty, too. Why me? he said. Clayton's my brother, but we aren't close. I don't have any specific skills that might help you out down there. We'll make a motley pair then, won't we? said Al. What you're asking, I take it, is why don't we send down a crew of special forces badasses and put things right? We considered it, dismissed it. First, that current ring made it dangerous to get down until recently. Second, the two men still down there, your brother and Dr. Toy, wield the whip hand now. They're inside, we're outside. I'll give you a full debriefing later, but suffice it to say, the Triest is fragile. All it takes is one screwdriver. Pierce any wall just a fraction, and it's Pancake City. So what if we head down cocked and locked? Well, what do we stand to lose if things go sideways? Everything. Absolutely everything. That's a cheerful thought. Jesus. They passed down a row of low, black, flat-sided buildings connected by linked walkways. They made Luke feel like he was touring a medium-security prison. But why you? Al said. Good question. You're as green at deep dives as I am at neutering spaniels, right? The main reason, Luke, is that your brother asked for you. Get out of here. She pulled an iPhone from her pocket and thumb shuffled until she found what she was looking for. This came through fifty hours ago. You received a call in Iowa City shortly thereafter. Sound file, no video. 
It stands as our last contact with your brother. We were debating whether to act on it, but the Westlake situation forced our hand. She pressed play. Clayton's voice floated out of the speaker. Come home, Lucas. Come down, Lucas. We need you, Lucas. Come home. Clayton's flat, monotone cadence was rendered tinny by the recording. Clayton sounded as if he was asleep. His voice was syrupy and water-warped, like a 45 RPM record playing at a relaxed 33 RPM. That could be a problem with the transmission itself, which had to carry through eight miles of water. Clayton repeated himself again before the message cut out abruptly. We need you, Lucas. Come home. It took a while to figure out who Lucas was, said Al. Your brother doesn't speak about his family. We figured it could have been a research associate, a friend, a lover even. Our intel people dug around a bit and figured he must have been talking about you. But Clayton doesn't need me. He doesn't need anyone. He never has. Except for those nights when the sleep terrors descended on him, he thought. The nights when you'd climb into bed with him until he'd settled down. But that was years ago, when they were only boys. Yet Clayton had been saying, We need you. We. We. We who? Think of him as our pampered rock star whose writer calls for a big bowl of M&Ms, only the red ones, said Al. In this case, he's asking for his brother. We give him what he wants, making every effort to preserve your safety, of course. Why would he want me down there? Al cocked her head. You put people's minds and bodies under that kind of pressure. Things snap, right? We want to do everything possible to avoid that snap. So that's what I am, then? A bandage? Think of yourself more as a key. Luke couldn't imagine his brother needing a bandage anyway. He was armor-plated, titanium-coated. But that voice, it hadn't sounded entirely like Clayton. Granted, it had been years since they'd last spoken, but still, something was off about it. The difference wasn't in the words themselves or the pitch of his voice. It lurked somewhere behind the obvious, sly and scuttling like rats in the walls. Come home, Lucas. Come home, come home, come home. That's not my home down there, he said. Al said, it's nobody's home, trust me. Two rights, a left, and then they came to another dry dock. Three subs were cradled in hammocks. The numbers two, three, and one lay on their flanks. A workman was filling a seam in one of them with foam that pumped from a sophisticated caulking gun. That's the secret ingredient, Al told Luke. Some kind of super foam that expands or compresses depending on pressure. It can withstand 50 tons per square inch. The Trieste is held together with the stuff. Cost a billion plus to develop, but it's worth every dime. Luke followed Al across the tarmac. It was like being on the deck of an aircraft carrier. The sky was wide and trackless, the sun beating down from a cloudless sky. It was so hot that the patching tar had softened. It clung to the treads of their boots like blackjack chewing gum. Another sub was partially obscured by a pile of pallets. All Luke saw was its back end canted over the water. It sat in moody isolation, its stocky shape banded by yellow tape, the kind that ringed a crime scene. The MPs are still investigating, Al said. It seems worthless. She laughed without mirth, like investigating a haunting or something. The Challenger 4 rounded into view. Luke's lips curled in an instinctive expression of distaste. It looked no different than the sub he'd seen earlier, and yet it repelled his gaze. There was something profoundly awful about it. He sensed that Al felt the same way about it, and he imagined it unnerved her just as it did him, because rational minds objected to unreasoned fear. Perhaps it was because it had traveled so far below the sun's reach. The pressure had warped it, giving its shape a madman's hint of those depths. Or perhaps it was what happened within it 
In Luke's head, the sight of it melded with that of Westlake's tortured corpse. The vessel was hateful in some way he could not accurately distill. Al approached it, and Luke reluctantly followed. An awful coldness wept off the sub's metal. Had it carried up that icy chill from the Challenger Deep itself? Al wrenched the hatch wheel. The muscles trembled up her arms, as if a subconscious part of her rebelled at the act. The hatch was circular, slightly smaller than a manhole cover, a solid foot of steel. Al let it clunk against the hull. A smell wafted out. Luke had never inhaled its equal, raw, adrenal, and profoundly human. The stink of insanity, Edie, sharp as malt vinegar, as his mother once said. Luke bent to peer inside. Several deflated bladders dangled down inside the cabin. He could only suppose that they were the equivalent of nautical airbags. What he didn't see yet was blood, which was incredible considering what had occurred inside. Maybe the MPs had swabbed it out already? You're going to need to crane your neck, he heard Al say. Look higher. He crouched, neck twisted at an uncomfortable angle. Something was written on the far wall. Rust-colored scratches, messy, frantic. He dipped lower, aware of the blood beat in his ears. The scratches resolved themselves into... Letters? And that rusty discoloration? Blood. There it was. Dried blood. Letters. But he could make out only their underside. The bulbous lower swoop of a C the jagged horizontal slash of an E. Luke knelt until his knees hit the deck. It was the only way to contort his head enough to see what had been written inside. Five words, all written in a crazed, spiky scrawl, written in the blood that had momentarily gushed from Westlake's innumerable wounds. Five words in one string, seven in the other. The Agme are here. Come home, we need you, come home. Crystals of ice gathered up Luke's spine. The words were grotesque in the same way Westlake's body had been. The letters were swollen and lewd. The blood dried thickly on their outer curves like paint slopped heavily on a fence slat. More unsettlingly, those words recalled Clayton's voice calling out to Luke from the icy depths of the sea. We need you, Lucas. Come home. Part 2. Descent 1. The evening dark hung against a paling sky. Alice had left Luke to his own devices while she made the final preparations for their descent. It seemed absurd. Less than an hour from now, Luke would be inside a cramped sub, free-falling eight miles down through the Pacific. But then, was it absurd? The circumstances of his life made him the perfect candidate, if you looked closely. Luke was a divorced veterinarian. He spayed calicoes and repaired Budgie's split beaks. He still lived in the modest home he and his wife once shared with their son, not far from the university campus. On quiet Saturdays in September, he could hear the roar from Kinnick Stadium. His son, Zachary Henry Nelson, had vanished seven years ago. He had never been found. His bedroom was unchanged, the baseball motif wallpaper, dusty toys shoved underneath the bed, all waiting for him when he got back. Luke's life had stopped, fundamentally stopped, on a cool autumn evening seven years ago. As pitiful as it may be, he had no reason not to be here, accepting the task set before him. It gave his life a small but vital sense of purpose. He sat on the edge of the Hesperus, his feet dipped in the sea. The water held cascading shades, a pure aquamarine deepening to more enveloping blues. A school of orange and pearl fish made lively darts at an algae slick chain. The fish had curved, sickle shaped jaws. They looked predatory, like midget piranhas. Those fish would have scared Zack. There was a time in the boy's life when he'd been scared of everything. Luke recalled how, at five, Zack, like many five-year-olds, had become convinced that a monster lurked in his closet. 
Luke reacted by flinging Zack's closet door open and rattling the clothes hangers. See, Zacky? No monster. You're perfectly safe, I promise. Monsters aren't real. They're just figments of your imagination. Zack looked even more petrified. Figmen? Luke nearly burst out laughing. He pictured those bloated, misshapen, fruit-like creatures, the fig men, massing in his son's closet. Not fig men, Zack. Figments. Figments aren't real. Your mind is making them up, that's all. No fig men, no monsters. But that night, Zack crept into their room and curled up on the floor. What are you doing here, buddy? The fig men are in my closet. Zack whispered. Luke got up and marched his son back to his bedroom. There is no monster, Zack. No fig men. Didn't I show you that? That was in the daytime, Zack said with bone-deep worry. Monsters hide from grown-ups in the day. It's night now. But Luke was adamant. I'll leave the hall light burning, buddy. That's the best I can do. You've got to sleep in your own bed, okay? Zack pulled the covers up to his throat and nodded wretchedly. Back in bed, Abby said, You're not being fair, Luke. Zack's allowed to be scared. He's a kid. There shouldn't be a penalty in this house for being scared. Luke knew she was right. Your child doesn't owe you loyalty or obedience. You owe your child love and understanding. Owe it unconditionally. And if you love them strongly enough, eventually that love may be returned. Luke's own mother had never seen it that way. She thought Luke and Clay owed her love, regardless of how she treated them. Luke got out of bed and grabbed his toolbox. He returned to Zack's room and pointed at the closet. So this is where the fig men are lurking? Zack nodded forlornly. Luke cracked the toolbox and pulled out a stud finder. He ran it over the closet walls and made a few exploratory taps with his knuckles. There are traces of ectoplasm he said in the tone of a veteran contractor. That's monster slime in layman's terms. What do these suckers look like? Zack said, Old, all wrinkly, like they've lived a million years. The short hairs stood up on the back of Luke's neck. Something about the way his son said that one word, old, was chilling. Luke didn't feel like laughing this time. The figmen? These twisted, ancient, calculating little devils hunched in the dark closet, peering at his son through the slats with cruel avidity, had taken on a sinister shape in his mind. Luke gripped his chin, putting on a good show. The fig men. I've never heard of them specifically, but harmless monsters do infest closets and crawl spaces. They usually like sweet stuff. You haven't been keeping anything tasty in your closet, have you? That's where I put my Halloween candy. Well, that'll give you a figmen problem. Now, I'm sure they're not dangerous, just gross. But if you let a few hang around, they'll call their buddies, and before long, you've got an infestation on your hands. I don't want that, Daddy. I've got good news and bad news, said Luke. What do you want first? Zack said, good. Good news is I can get rid of the figmen. Luke rooted through his toolbox for a pouch of fine red powder. This is cardamom. It's made from the crushed shells of stag beetles. It's used in monster containment spells. Luke laid down a line of powder in the shape of a keyhole. Now this, he said, is the trap. The figmen will wander up this path, which gets narrower and narrower, until, bango, they get stuck. The circle closes, and the figmen will starve overnight. They'll turn black and hard as a rock. Now the bad news, Zack. You have to pull one hair out of your head, and that'll hurt a bit. Why? Figman bait. Zack plucked a strand of hair. Luke laid it in the middle of the trap. You know what'd help? Something sweet. Why don't you and Mom go downstairs and grab a few chocolate chips? While they were downstairs, Luke hustled into his bedroom and grabbed two small chunks of obsidian he'd picked up during a trip to Hawaii years ago. He set them in the middle of the ring and shut the closet. When Zack returned, Luke strung the chocolate chips along the edge of the closet door. The sweetness will draw those figmen out of hiding. Now, Zack, the trap is set, but if you open the closet, the spell will be broken, so you must not open it until tomorrow morning. Promise? I promise. Cross your heart and hope to die? 
Stick a needle in my eye, Zack said solemnly. Do you want to sleep in our bed tonight? Zack shook his head. I'm okay now. Back in the bedroom, Abby kissed him with an uncommon ardor. Luke enjoyed a deep, dreamless sleep, feeling very much like a minor superhero. The next morning, Zack flung the closet open. The trap worked, he cried. He raced into their bedroom, clutching the blackened, calcified fig men. It's a cocoon, Luke said, except these ones are hard, a prison. The fig men will never be able to escape. Put them on display as a warning to any other monster that might wander along. It's not every day that you can hold a monster in your palm. Zack set them on his nightstand. They were still there, in the room Luke had left untouched since the day his son had gone missing. A shadow fell over Luke's shoulder, snapping him back to reality. The mini piranhas scattered, zipping under the Hesperus in a silvery flashing of scales. You about ready? Al asked. Spider legs scuttled up the lining of Luke's stomach. Two. Challenger 5 was suspended from a miniature sky crane, its hatch hung open like a hungry mouth. Luke carried only a duffel bag with a change of clothes and a cable knit sweater, plus a toiletry kit with toothbrush, toothpaste, and a stick of deodorant. Where will I spit my toothpaste? he wondered. There couldn't be a drainage system, no conventional toilets either. One flush and the pressure would probably cave in the triest. I'll swallow my toothpaste, he thought and pee in a bottle. I'll get in first and take the cockpit. You'll sit a little lower, Al smiled. It's a good news, bad news scenario. Good news is you get the better view. Bad news is your head's going to be parallel with my behind. Luke grinned, despite the quivers that kept rippling through his belly. Al ducked through the hatch. Luke realized for the first time that the vessel was designed to dive vertically. They'd be arrowing straight down into the black. Luke ducked and stuck his head inside the sub. The sight reminded him of the cockpit of a commercial jetliner, only much more cramped. Hop in, Al said from inside, already flicking switches. You'll have to tuck your knees and be careful not to touch anything unless I ask you to. The webbing of Luke's seat sagged like a hammock. Luke sank into it so deeply that his chin nearly touched his knees. Instrumentation panels sat a few inches off each shoulder, their uncomfortable electrical warmth bathing his face. His body tightened instinctually, his muscles and posture contracting. It felt a little like being trapped at the bottom of a village well, except there wasn't even a view of the sky. Al sat a few feet above with her back to Luke. She craned her head down. Comfy, huh? Wish I could let you pop an Ambien and sleep through the descent, but that shit does a number on your blood. Added pressure, yeah? Luke had never considered how it might feel to be buried alive in a buzzing, blinking, high-tech coffin, but he had a good sense of it now. The hatch closed with the satisfying thunk, the sound of a luxury car door slamming shut. A gassy hiss was followed by a volley of pressurized tinks. Al said, It's a high-pressure vacuum, drawing out every bit of excess air. Then the seal will engage. A workman appeared in the porthole window. Luke couldn't hear anything outside now. The sub must be noise-proof. The man's hands clutched one of those high-tech caulking guns. A puffy crust of foam began to encircle the window. They're foaming the seals, said Al. The entire vessel will get a coating, except for the bank of high-intensity spotlights running down each side. You okay? Yeah, Luke said. Just, this is really happening. Try to relax. I'm kicking on the air recycler. Cool air pumped around Luke's feet from pinhole vents. It had the same chemical tang that puffed from the vault containing Westlake. Luke was worried that his lungs would lock up, refusing to inhale the foul stuff. The crane lifted the sub and pinioned it over the water. Buckle up, said Al. The crane operator's got a heavy hand. As soon as Luke's belt clicked, they dropped. His stomach leapt as it would on a roller coaster. They hammered the sea's surface. Water climbed the porthole. Luke's breath came in shallow gulps. Breathe, he chided himself. You're safe, totally safe. His final surface sight was of a new moon hovering in its eastern orbit, a waxen ball whose light plated the slack darkness of the sea. Then they slipped under 
and were gone. Three. Al flicked switches and twisted knobs. Her hand entered Luke's peripheral vision, toggling a joystick near his ear. This tub's got three motors, but they're strictly for stabilization and maneuvering, she said. We're carrying 3,000 pounds of lead weights. We just drop. When we want to surface, we'll start shedding those lead plates bit by bit. How fast are we falling? About 1,300 meters per hour. I'll increase that as the currents subside. Once we enter the Mariana Trench three miles down, there's no current at all. Then we'll go faster, the proverbial hot knife through butter. Some part of the vessel whined. Al made a minute adjustment, and the unpleasant noise stopped. Air bubbles scrolled around the window, delicate as those in a glass of champagne. The darkness was as absolute as the bottom of a mine shaft. Luke said, Christ, that's desolate. <laughs> that's the sea at night, Al said, laughing a little uneasily. Don't worry, it'll get even darker. You've never seen the kind of dark we're going to encounter. They were already beyond the point of the deepest free dive. Luke figured it wouldn't be long before they passed the point of the deepest scuba dive. After that, they'd reach the depth where oxygen toxicity set in. The nitrogen levels change, and the air in the scuba diver's tank turns poisonous. Finally, they'd enter the lung-splintering depths, where humans simply didn't belong. A fizzy pop shot through Luke's veins. He felt a subtle expansion between his joints. It wasn't painful, more like being tickled inside his bones. Al modified their trajectory. The submarine stabilized. Nitrogen buildup. You feel it? We'll hang out here for a minute, she said. We're in the midnight zone, by the way. Complete darkness. We'll stop again at 2,500 meters, the abysmal zone. The tickle subsided. The sea was a solid wall of black through the porthole. There was nothing out there. The bleakness crawled inside Luke's skull. Check it out, Al said. Light show coming off your starboard side in five, four, three, two. It started as tiny, vibrantly glowing specks. They accumulated slowly, drifting on the current. A hundred became a thousand, became a numberless quantity. A swarm of neon creatures a hundred feet wide, giving a sense of depth to the ocean in the same way the sweep of a flashlight will reveal a huge cave. Some were as small as grains of sand, others were the size of noceums. A precious few were the size of summer fireflies. They glowed warmest amber. Their bodies brightened and dimmed like embers in a fire. Phytoplankton, Al said. They're bioluminescent. You'll see more of this kind of thing the deeper we go, until we get too deep. Then you won't see a damn thing. The plankton flurried like flakes of snow, just like the night Luke met Abby. In that moment, Luke was back in Iowa City with his ex-wife, except she wasn't even his wife then. She was 22-year-old Abigail Jeffries of Chicago, Illinois. He met her at an intra-faculty mixer for seniors at the U of I. It happened that very night. Luke fell madly in love with Abby Jeffries, all parts of her, even the parts that remained unknown to him then. In time, he'd come to love her chipped canine tooth, her snaggletooth, as she called it, which she never bothered to get capped under the belief that a face without flaws was a face lacking character. He loved her habit of squeaking after she sneezed. He loved the way her skin sparkled after sex. He loved everything about her indiscriminately. That first night, they left the mixer and hit a bar. When everyone got kicked out at last call, they'd staggered happily down East Jefferson hand in hand. Snow had been falling, big, fat flakes swarming out of the sky like the plankton was doing right now. The glowing flakes scattered as a monolithic shape passed by the Challenger. Luke glimpsed a pitted wall of blue-gray flesh. For a heart-stopping instant, he saw an eye the size of a dinner plate, a ring of shocking white banding a black pupil. The Challenger rocked. The displacement of water felt roughly akin to a tractor trailer flying past his car on the highway. Sperm whale, Al said. It's the only creature that big that could exist down here. I've never spotted one this low. Al cut the motors. The descent continued. Luke's back was beginning to ache. Can I stand up? Go right ahead, 
Luke managed to stretch a bit, taking the pressure off his hips. He watched Al work. She piloted the Challenger with an easy authority. It reminded Luke of observing an experienced veterinarian perform a routine surgery. There was an air of practiced boredom to the way Al's hands moved over the controls. You don't seem too concerned about all this, Luke said. If you're talking about the dive, I'm okay, she said. I brought your brother and the others down. Supplies and food and scientific doodads after that, before the drones were operational. Hell, on my last descent, I brought a poster of Albert Einstein. I'm a glorified delivery girl. The thing is, and I'm sorry if this doesn't make you feel any better, at a certain depth, it doesn't matter. Where we're going, the pressure per square foot is the equivalent of 27 jumbo jets. If we spring a pinhole leak, the water will come through with enough force to cut through three feet of solid steel. It'd slice us apart like flying Ginsu knives. This sub will crumple. It'll happen in a fraction of a heartbeat. Imagine being crushed between panes of extra thick glass traveling toward impact at the speed of sound. She thwapped her hands. We're talking flesh pate. Say goodnight, Gracie. Comforting image, that. Al exhaled, jiggling a joystick a few deft strokes. Listen, Luke, dying that way, crushed in the blink of an eye, there are worse ways to go down here. We've only lost two men so far, but we've lost a bunch of drones, and... She bit down, her teeth making an audible click. You ever hear the term short, Doc? You mean of stature? No, there's another meaning. It's a military term. Short timer? It's when you're at the end of a long hitch, just before you hit furlough. In a combat zone, that's the most superstitious time, when the fates are going to take a swipe at you. People get hinky. I'm so short I could parachute off a dime, man. That's kind of how I feel. The more dives I make, the more I test this big black motherfucker, the Mariana, the more I'm sure it's going to... Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm rambling. We're fine, and we're going to be fine. I trust you. Luke said simply. A stiff bark of laughter from Al. Try to catch a nap if you can. Sleep might be tough to come by the deeper we go. The pressure can mess with your REM patterns. The sea swept against the Challenger's hull with a lush suctioning. Luke felt as though he were in an elevator plummeting to the bottom of the world. Closing his eyes, he envisioned red numerals flashing past. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, G, P1, P2, P3, B, SB, SSB. Sub-sub-basement. Did floors go any lower? The Ag May. Hmm? said Al. The Ag May are here. The words written inside the Challenger. They have any meaning to you? Al sounded curious. Is that how you read it? What, you saw it differently? Yeah. Man, she said, the something man. The ag man are here? Al shrugged. Nonsense words, Doc. The grammar doesn't even jibe. I don't presume they'd have meant much to Dr. Westlake by the time he wrote them. Four. Luke shut his eyes. He was hungry, but he didn't feel like eating. The sea seemed to reach through the submarine's walls, pressing uncomfortably on his stomach. His thoughts circled back to his mother. He was anxious, and during such times his mind would stalk the walled-off corners of his memory, relentlessly, chasing a handful of dire recollections, like a terrier down a rat hole. After she was put on disability from the Second Chance Ranch, Luke's mother began to eat. It became an obsession. Though she'd always been sturdy, she'd never been much of an eater, only enough to sustain her frame. She took no apparent joy in eating, and that never changed. Only the quantity changed. Porridge. She'd cook it in a huge steel pot, three, four pounds of edible sludge, and gorge herself in front of the television, eating it with the same sterling silver baby spoon she'd used to feed pabulum to her infant boys. After a while, the smell of cooking porridge was enough to make Luke feel ill. 
He'd come home and find his mother in the dark, eating congealed porridge with a wet mouth vacancy, her lips moving like a horse eating sugar cubes. At first, she simply got thick, a solidity over her arms and legs and bosom that gave her a matronly look. But she kept shoveling in that gray gruel, and soon thickness gave way to bloated girth. Her arms projected from the sleeves of her shapeless shifts like the booms on a sailboat, larded with folds of quaking flesh that resembled hunks of wet wool. Her thighs widened to the point that when she was sitting, her legs appeared to be welded together, a vast blanket of quivering skin. When she limped from her spot on the chair, her thighs rubbed together with a raw, whispery note. Her features receded into the shapeless bloat of her face. Her eyes stared out of that netted flesh like two raisins thumbed into proofing dough. We are all but flesh, she would say to Luke's father when he dared to mention that she might think about cutting a few carbs. And we will all go the way of the flesh. As her size increased, so did her cruelty, especially to her husband. It was a sport to her. She'd belittle the man in front of his boys and torture him far worse in private moments. One night, unable to sleep, Luke had crept downstairs for a glass of milk. On the way back to his room, he passed his parents' open door. He caught the rustling of sheets, the movements of bodies. Next, a breathless exhale. It sounded like the moan of a man who'd been stabbed and wanted to deal with the injury as quietly as possible. You dirty boy, his mother's voice. You dirty boy. It wasn't an endearment or a sly encouragement. No, this was more as if Luke's father really was a boy, a depraved and soft-headed one, who'd been found under the porch steps, smeared with his own excrement. Yet his father moaned in that soft, gut-stabbed way and whispered, Yes, yes, so fucking bad. She ruined Luke's father, decimated him, until he sickened her. Her bulk would have cooled the ardor of some other men, but it only intensified his father's servility. Like a whipped dog, he mooned around her petticoats, begging for scraps of affection, which only deepened his mother's loathing. All day she had nothing to do but sit in the dark, dreaming up ways to dominate the household. She'd squashed her husband already. Clayton was either down in his lab or, in later years, pursuing his projects at sponsoring labs. Beth's immediate project was Luke, who by then had discovered the vast well of malice that lurked inside his mother. Luke had once returned from his fifth grade classes to find her in the tub. She was in the bathroom Luke and Clay used, even though she had her own. She didn't sound a warning as Luke climbed the staircase and stared at him silently when he opened the door. Her body was ghostly and pale. Bubbles clung to the edges of the tub gray and scummy, darkened from the dirt off her body. Her belly was ribbed with fat, her breasts huge and sallow. Luke's eyes dipped. She said nothing, willing them to rise again. He slammed the door. Don't you ever knock? Her voice boomed from behind it. Despite this, Luke continued to bring her a glass of Ovaltine after school, sitting at her feet like a lapdog. She'd slurp it and gawp at the TV. It played soaps or infomercials, although Luke figured she'd be just as happy with a test pattern. Sometimes she would say the nicest things. Lucas, you're my angel. How would I live without you? But she could turn sadistic without warning. One time she'd stared at him dolorously and spoke in a dry monotone. I had such high hopes for you. Such high, high hopes. In time, Luke believed his mother only said the nice things so that the barbs would sting even more. Not long after the bathtub incident, he'd come home to find his comic book collection on the front lawn with a sign reading, Free. You're too old for comics, she'd told him, sunk down in her easy chair with a dollop of porridge on her chin. We must all let go of childish things. But... Her head swiveled, eyes peering out from pits of buttery flesh. But nothing, 
Let some younger boys in the neighborhood have your funny books. You've read the damn things now how many times already? Funny books. These weren't Archie's or Casper the Friendly Ghosts. These were daredevils and wolverines. They weren't funny. But they're mine. I'm collecting them. All they're collecting is dust. They're gone, Lucas. The matter is settled. He'd turned his back on her, tears scalding his cheeks. Those comics weren't just ink on paper. They represented freedom from the increasing hostility of his home life. He could dive into those pages and spend time with characters who were larger than life, fearless, and did right by others. He'd even created a superhero alter ego, joining the cast of Cape Crusaders and Crime Fighters in his favorite comics, The Human Shield. As Luke envisioned it, his alter ego had touched a glowing asteroid that bestowed a singular trait upon him. His flesh was impenetrable. Nothing could hurt him, not bullets, not blades, not even a heat-seeking missile. The human shield's role was to stand in front of children and single mothers while his superhero pals battled their arch-enemies. Any stray laser beams or pumpkin bombs would strike his body, which safely absorbed the blast. He wasn't one of the top-tier superheroes, but he was allowed to hang out at the Hall of Justice and X-Mansion, rubbing elbows with Aquaman and Marvel Girl. What Luke liked best about being the human shield was his ability to protect the innocent without fear, because his home life was by then characterized by a marrow deep, ever present dread. Looking back, Luke was sure that this was why his mother had chosen the comic books. They could have been his action figures or his bike, but he could have parted with those easily. The comics opened up a new world to him, a place where he was safe, and his mother wanted to rip that haven away from him. Luke hadn't dared retrieve the comics from the lawn. By that evening, the grass was picked clean. From that time forward, Luke made a point out of secrecy. If his mother was unaware of the things that gave him joy, she couldn't take them away. But she had other ways to maintain her dominance. One night, she'd climbed the staircase, each step whining under her bulk, and opened his bedroom door. Luke had been sleeping alone. Clayton was in the basement most nights. She crossed the room with thudding footfalls, threw back the covers, and slid into his bed. The springs squealed, and the mattress took a sickening downward lurch. Luke felt as if he were being sucked down into greedy quicksand. She nestled her body up with his, spooning him. There was nothing motherly in this embrace. He caught the acrid whiff of her armpits and the dense, peaty scent wafting from her mouth. She curled an arm around him. His pajama top had rucked up, and she spread her hand across his bare belly. Her flesh was sickeningly warm, a hot water bottle packed with boiled lard. Her index finger tapped his stomach in time with the beat of his heart. As its rate accelerated, so did her tapping. Her mouth was close to his neck, her breath moistening the downy hairs. He was certain she'd sink her teeth into him, holding tight as she ate him the way she ate her porridge, in tiny, tiny bites. Part of Luke realized she was trying to break him, as she'd already done to his father. Fear equaled control in the mind of Bethany Ronix. It was an effective tool, but only if you stood for it. She wasn't really clever. Luke had been coming to that realization for a while by then. Not smart just cunning. Animals were cunning. Animals also ate their own shit and chewed live electrical wires. The only way to deal with monsters, real or imagined, was to show no fear. You had to become the human shield. Luke opened his eyes and gripped her wrist. Her muscles tensed under their encasement of flab. Shifting his weight, he slung himself out from under her and landed on the floor with a graceless thump. He stood and retreated to the door. Where are you going? A mocking coo. This isn't your bedroom, Mom. You don't sleep here. This is my house, all mockery gone. I sleep where I goddamn like. Then I'll sleep somewhere else. Get back here. Luke hesitated then left. 
He got halfway down the hallway and collapsed. What had he done? He was only thirteen. He couldn't leave the house. He was trapped. What would his mother do to him now? What would she... Luke awoke with a start. The dim ticking of instruments, the rush of water against the hull. He was in the Challenger. The heat of the instruments pulled sweat out of his pores. Alice stared down at him with concern. You're okay, Doc. You were dreaming. Luke wiped at the drool on his chin, mortified. How long was I out? Couldn't have been more than a few minutes. You were grinding your teeth. Sounded like rocks in a blender. Mumbling, too. Alice was leaning over, her hand on his shoulder. He felt the warmth of her flesh and caught the scent of her body, the softest note of vanilla. It wasn't perfume. Al didn't seem the sort to wear it. Probably just a dab of hand cream. It was dry as a desert inside the sub, which was weird seeing as they were surrounded by water. She'd unzipped her overalls a little. The heat was intense, and Luke couldn't help his eyes from orienting on that slice of bare flesh trailing down the dampened hem of her tank top. He wrenched his eyes up to her face. She was watching him impassively, her head slightly cocked. Enjoying the view? Her expression seemed to say. There was no recrimination in it, just a vague sense of mirth. What did I say? Luke asked. When I was sleeping, I mean. Get behind me. She smiled as if to say it wasn't anything he ought to be embarrassed about. Get behind me where it's safe, or something like that. Five. The Challenger leveled off. They were presently over 20,000 feet under sea. Luke heard sly pops and crackles, the sound of Rice Krispies doused in milk. Relax, that's just the foam, Al said. It's compressing to bear the strain. The view was disorienting. Profound, terrible darkness. What could possibly live down here? Luke pictured the water rolling away for miles in every direction, empty and pitiless. This stratum was cleansed of nearly all the fundamental assets that foster life. Sunlight, warmth, air, food. So the only creatures that lived in it should be, by definition, less than whole. Their skin would be jelly-like. Luke imagined bodies draped in a thin stretching of greased latex, like condom skin. He almost laughed at the idea of schools of condom fish flitting through the deeps. Tink! Something struck the porthole's glass, then pelted away. Tink! Tink! Do you hear that? He whispered. Al's voice was tight. Viper fish, I'm thinking. The water exploded with frenzied movement. Tink! 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 Luke recoiled as quicksilver flashes smashed into the glass. Ting, 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 ting. It sounded as if they were being shelled with machine gun fire. Al, hey, is this normal? Yeah, it's pretty unnerving, she said. We'll be okay. Viper fish are the undersea version of wolverines. They'll attack anything, even if it's a hundred times their size. Just then, a viper fish got snagged before the glass. Its jaws... Huge, sickle-shaped, fearsomely toothy, were enmeshed in the foam. The creature was long and eelish, with fluted gills and oily black eyes socked in a polished steel face. It was the most predatory thing Luke had ever seen. They're mean as cat shit, Al said, and I'd say we've hit a swarm of them. Tink! t t, -t tink I've never seen so many of them. They're fixing to tear that foam to shreds. We got a boogie, Luke. Hold on. The challenger plummeted. Luke caught a flash of the massing school of viper fish. A glowing sheet of bodies staggered into the water, tens of thousands of whip-like fish darting furiously about. The sounds ceased as Al stabilized the vessel. Tink! Fucking things, said Al. We must be in a cone of them. There's no way they could drop that fast. Again, the challenger plunged. The pressure built in Luke's ears. That tickle returned to his bones, becoming quite painful now. Hold on, Al said. I'm feeling it too. Luke's gums tightened around his teeth until he was sure they'd shatter. 
the plates of his skull ground together. Al stabilized the sub again. She shot a look down at Luke. A rill of blood, as thin as a pencil line, was trickling out of her nose. You're bleeding, Luke said. She wiped it away. Yeah, you too. Luke wiped his nose. His fingers came away clean. Higher, Al said. Luke felt wetness leaking from his eye. He wiped away a single bloody tear. Am I bleeding from my eye? Al nodded. You'll be fine. Happens a lot down here. The blood comes out of you in funny, non-traditional places. Luke wiped the bloody tear on his overalls. That will take some getting used to. They waited for those dreadful tinks to resume. When they didn't, Luke's heartbeat settled into its normal rhythm. Al jimmied the controls and got the Challenger dropping again at a more leisurely rate. Water shushed against the hull, causing the foam to issue splintery popping sounds. Luke blinked and swiped a finger under his eye. A watery rill of blood tracked across his fingertip, warm and... Swack! Luke jolted in his seat. Something entirely different was stuck to the glass now. A band of albino tissue, shockingly thick. What the? Al said as the challenger juddered. Oh, are you shitting me? The band thinned out as it flexed across the glass. Eight inches across, with a vein running under its skin that was so black it could have been filled with ink. Studded all along it were discs. They reminded Luke of the plastic suction cups you'd use to stick sun catchers to your kitchen windows. It's a giant squid, Al said, although Luke somehow knew that already. I didn't think we'd encounter one this far down. The challenger rattled, an alarm shrilled. For the love of fuck, said Al, the words exiting her mouth with a brittle snip. She flicked a switch and the vessel went dark. Luke's lungs locked up as an icy ball of terror crystallized in his chest. It was as if the sea itself had slid inside the challenger, filling his eyes and throat and brain. The squid's tentacle slurped across the glass. A shape shot out, back, snapping violently. It was the squid's beak, which resembled that of an enormous parrot. Thack! Harder this time. Luke waited for the glass to crack and his life to end. The lights flicked on. I thought it might leave us alone if we went dark, Al said in a low voice. Let's try the opposite. She hit the spotlights. They didn't illuminate much, despite their incredible intensity. A pall of sickly light picked up a patina of deep sea sediment that swirled like dust in an enormous room. The squid immediately detached and vanished with one convulsive flex. Luke got a split-second sense of its size, stunningly long, torsional and many-limbed, whipping into the darkness like a bullet train speeding into a tunnel. Hold on, Al said, and again they dropped. They seemed to be falling even faster. The depth gauge near Luke's head spun wildly around and around like a cartoon clock. Al was busy with the readouts. Thankfully, it appeared that neither the squid nor viperfish had dealt the challenger a terminal blow. Shock sweat had broken out all over Luke's body. Tiny beads of moisture clung to the hull, too. The sub's sweating, he said. That's normal, Al said tersely. Condensation, our breath, cold as a witch's tit down here, minus thirty or so. Doesn't the water freeze? Never with salt water. Not this deep. Al shut the spotlights off, plunging the sea into darkness again. Wow, that was the weirdest thing, she said, exhaling heavily. You have to understand, this is like a desert down here. It's barren. Picture it this way, where a pin dropped into an Olympic-sized swimming pool almost completely devoid of life. So why and how we've run across all these critters... It's just weird, and that they'd attack us. The viperfish I get, but the squid? And back to back like that? No, just no. Not outside of a Jules Verne book, anyway. Luke's laughter held a glass snap edge. Right, and then we've had that current ring the last week or so. Every possible disturbance you could encounter, we've been facing it lately, Al said. If I didn't know any better, I'd almost think... She trailed off, not saying the words, but Luke was thinking the same thing. 
It's as if something is trying to stop us from reaching the treest. 6. They should have installed a radio in this thing, said Al, or a CD player or something. She blew a raspberry. They sunk a trillion bucks into this operation. A radio is going to bankrupt them? They spent hand over fist, she went on. Nobody had ever tried building anything like the Trius before. Space shuttle, sure, but in space you're dealing with an absence of pressure. You can put on a suit, step out, float around. Try to do that down here and... Flesh pate. Bingo. They had to bring the station down in sections. Lots of trial and error, lots of problems. Dropped them with heavy weights, collected them with robotic dive craft. Every section came down encased in a protective shell with the seam of foam sandwiched between. They got slotted together, riveted by pressure-resistant robo-divers, foamed, then the shell was cracked away. The station was designed in the principles of orb physics. The egg was the designer's blueprint. Push on the sides of an egg, right, and it'll break. But if you press on the top and bottom, it's nearly unbreakable. A miracle of nature, or so they tell me. Plus the material the station's made out of? It's metal, but not metal. Some kind of high-tech, ultra-state-of-the-art polymer core. It allows the tunnels to flex and bend and... bubble, I guess you could say. Instead of cracking under pressure, the material will expand the way rubber does. The water can warp it, but it won't burst through. Anyway, once the pieces of the station were all slotted together, someone had to go in and open it all up from the inside. There was this membrane linking each section that had to be cut and foamed simultaneously. If it sprung even one leak, the whole structure would flatten. Otto Railsback, that was the name of the guy. We scrap of a thing. A single man did the whole job. You want to talk about a real hero? I brought Otto down. He was the first man inside. I attached to the entry port, cracked the hatch, then he went inside. So what happened? asked Luke, now fascinated. Well... I remember the smell that came out at first, Al said. My family ran a ranch in Colorado. There was this cave system where I lived, Cave of the Winds. The main part was a tourist trap, drunk dudes wandering around with miners' helmets calling themselves spelunkers. But the whole thing sprawled twenty miles underground. You could enter it through a vent in the forest floor about a mile from my home. Just a dark cut into the rocks, right? I went down there one day, alone. I was thirteen, fourteen thought I was a badass. I had a flashlight and a sack lunch. Predictably, I got lost. Thought I knew where I was going. Didn't. It got so deep and twisty that if it weren't for gravity, I wouldn't have known up from down. My flashlight went on the fritz. I sat in the dark with the rocks dripping around me. She paused, wrapped in the memory. That darkness had weight, Doc. As a kid, it seemed hostile, like it wanted to keep me right where I was. And I was scared for practical reasons, too. I could have missed a step, slid down a shaft, and busted a leg. I'd have died down there. But I'd gotten into it, right? I had to get out. So I just listened. The dripping water helped. I figured it had to be trickling down, so I just had to follow it up. It was way past my curfew when I reached the cut. My dad skinned my ass raw. She sipped water from a silver pouch that reminded Luke of a Capri Sun drink. Anyway... The smell in that cave was the same as what came out of the Trieste, this overwhelming reek of darkness, a raw mineral smell. It had presence, an aliveness, like in Cave of the Winds. It freaked me out. No good reason, just that old childish worry. But Otto went right in. He sealed the compartments, made the Trieste truly safe for habitation. After that, others came down to set up the Jennies, the air purifiers, but Otto was the guy who got it all rolling. He was the only one who died in the Trius, too. Jesus, how? He just never came back out, said Al. I waited and waited, but when he didn't show up, they told me to resurface. I couldn't get inside anyway. But surface diagnostics indicated the station was safe to enter, meaning Otto had completed his task. When the electrical team came down, they found him curled up in the animal quarantine. Dead. Embolism. He just finished his job, then laid down in the dark and died. The only one who died, Luke thought, except for Westlake. It's all self-contained, Al said. Electricity, air, waste removal, food and water are brought down as needed. 
a perfect little microsystem that thumbs its nose at the laws of physics. Luke barely heard her. He was still dwelling on Otto Railsback, who'd crawled diligently through the tunnels with his foam gun until he reached his own end. 7. There is a specific depth you'll hit where the soul finds it impossible to harmonize with its surroundings. It's not the darkness. A man is acquainted with it by then, as acquainted as he can ever be. It's not the vast silence or the emptiness or the absence of any life forms he can draw warmth or certainty from. It's not the pressure. It's not even the fear of death that constantly nibbles at the edge of his mind. It's the sense of unreality this out-of-body feeling that you've stepped away from the path your species has always tread. Things become dreamlike, inessential. Your mind, seeking solace in the familiar, retreats to those things you understand, but those things become so much harder to grasp. Memories degrade. You remember parts of people, but you surrender their holes. Abby could crack an egg with one hand. It was a quirky skill Luke remembered wishing he had, he could still recall the sight of her doing it and the yearning that he could do it too, but the more essential parts of her were already failing him. The water wasn't the same down here. Water is what runs out of our kitchen taps or a playground drinking fountain. It fills bathtubs and pools and, yes, of course, the ocean, but at a certain depth, water becomes a barrier from all you remember, all you think you know. You're trapped within it a plaything of it. Focus erodes. Your thoughts mutate. The pressure. The pressure. The soul can't cope with that. It shouldn't be expected to. Humans weren't built for this. There's a reason nothing lives down here. Or nothing should. Eight. Luke was unaware of the exact point when it began to snow. Marine snow, according to Al. The detritus of animal and plant life that had died miles above. It fell steadily through each zone of the ocean, down and down, shredding into flakes, leached of pigment until it became bone white, a snow of death. It fell without cease, each flake composed of lace-edged rags of flesh and bone and gut. Looking at it, Luke thought back to that first night with Abby, the snow falling from a cold, dark Iowa sky. He tried to isolate the details of Abby's face, but they slithered through his mind, eelish and ungrippable. Al toggled the joystick, angling the challenger slightly downward. We're here, she said quietly. Luke squinted through the porthole. Darkness thick as grave dirt. Then, permeating that darkness, the tiniest speck of light. This speck attached to another speck, and another. From these specks a rough shape resolved and the treeist came into view. Luke sat by the window, jaw open, staring. It was repulsive. The blood backflowed in his veins, the strangest sensation, like a clock running backward against its mechanics, stripping gears and snapping springs. We need to ascend now, he thought wildly. Seek the sunlight fast and never come back. Part 3. The Triest 1. Luke could only glimpse the Triest in sections. Whenever Al swung the Challenger around, illuminating a section he'd already seen, it looked different to Luke as if it had shifted subtly, somehow reconfiguring its arrangement. Luke's mind continued to fight the reaction of his initial horror. It was nothing but steel and foam and space-age polymers, a marvel of engineering. It, of course, had no mind, no will. And still, it was awful. He couldn't isolate what repelled the eye, the revulsion that squatted so leadenly in the lizard brain. It was snake-like, for one, of course it was. The treeist was all tubes. They spooled along the ocean floor, which was clad in a powdery drift of marine snow. The tubes were oddly segmented, branching off at unnatural angles to appear vaguely arachnid, long, dark legs extending from a central hub. 
There was a manic union between its various parts. It shouldn't cohere as a structure. Its angles were bizarre and somehow despairing. Some tubes appeared to end abruptly. That or they burrowed into the sea floor like an enormous worm. Maybe the pressure exerted the same warping effect it had on Challenger 4, bending each angle slightly out of true, which cumulatively made the Trieste look disgustingly alien. Or maybe it was the fact that the bulk of it hadn't been assembled by human hands. Robots had no sense of beauty or symmetry. They simply slotted link A to coupler B. The structure throbbed with a numbing hunger. But for what? Luke was overcome with a sinister shrinking sensation, as if his soul had dwindled to a pinprick and the treeist had swarmed in to fill that space, reducing him under its brooding, inanimate power. Luke couldn't shake the ludicrous sense that the treeist had built itself to serve a purpose known only within itself. It seemed sentient, watching like a snake coiled in placid contentment under warm desert rocks, knowing in the seething core of itself that it need only to wait. It's got a certain look to it, Al said. You've been inside? A few times, not for long and only to drop off supplies. To speak the truth, none of us like spending all that much time down here. Docking's the trickiest part. She edged them toward the treeist. The challenger swayed under the enormous pressure of water, which no longer shushed and gurgled against its hull, but instead pushed back with leaden insistence, as if they were moving through hardening concrete. As they approached, Luke saw what had made those initial pinpricks of light. Windows, same as the porthole on the submarine, dotted the length of one tube. Weak fingers of light spilled from each. One of Al's navigational tools pinged as she zeroed in. Five feet? Four, three, two. Al guided the sub to the porthole and cut the engines. The challenger met the treeist with the sound of a locket snapping shut. Other sounds, whirrings, clickings, a pneumatic whine, the sound you'd hear in a mechanic's shop when they're tightening the lug nuts on your all seasons. It should be sealed now, Luke said. And if it's not? Al gave him a grim smile. We won't feel a thing. She unsnapped her belt. You're going to have to step through first. Me? Why? The flesh tightened around Al's eyes. For the first time, she got that mildly irritated look a person gets when they're dealing with a newbie. I've got to keep an eye on things from this end, Doc. There isn't anything on the other side of that hatch, said an unsteady voice in Luke's head. Nothing but your brother and another wonk and a few dogs and bees. Luke wondered, had Dr. Westlake told himself the very same thing the first time he stepped inside? Once you're through and I've shut things down, I'll follow, said Al. Luke laid his hands on the hatch. The metal thrummed with an odd tension as if a heavy motor was running behind it. His biceps tensed in expectation but after the slightest strain, the wheel turned easily. That's good. There was relief in Al's voice. The seal's tight. The hatch swung open. The thinnest trickle of salt water beaded along the upper curve of the hatch, a single drop falling, clip, to splash the metal. The light inside the Challenger wept into that hole of darkness. A smell perfumed the air, cave-like and slightly alkaline, as Al had mentioned. The foreign odor of the deep sea mixed with something else, something unnameable. A high note of dread sang through Luke's veins, a mocking aria that sent a shiver through his bones. What are you so afraid of? said that same voice inside Luke's head. Everything, another voice answered. There was no reason for his fear other than the obvious ones. They were eight miles underwater, about to enter a station built on the structural principles of an egg. Go on, Al said. I'm right behind you. Luke could make out the insides of the treeist, the dim slope of a wall, the dull wink of metal. He reached out to anchor his hands on the hatch. Then he saw something. His breath caught. What the hell was that? Two. When they were boys, 
their father used to take Luke and Clayton for a haircut at the Hawkeye Barber Shop. Give him a high and tight, he'd tell Vince, the old Italian barber. That, or, these boys are getting shaggy. Give them the old white wall. It was the only place in town Luke had ever seen his father get even a hint of respect, and even then it seemed grudging. Luke remembered the ancient magazines with names like Men's Adventure and Rage for Men, their lurid covers featuring men wrestling bears or cold-cocking alligators, their cover lines reading Swastika Slave Girls in Guatemala's No Escape Brothel Camp and Rabid Weasels Ripped My Flesh. He remembered how the barber's scissors would snip around his ears with the speed of hummingbird wings. After every haircut, the barber would show Luke the back of his neck in a mirror that telescoped from the wall on metal armatures. When he angled the mirror, sometimes Luke would see Clayton sitting silently or catch his father with his nose stuck in a magazine. That mirror offered a hidden view, Luke used to think, the face of the world when it wasn't aware you were looking at it. His mind fled back to that childlike sensibility, a mirror that showed the world's hidden face, when his gaze focused on the insides of the treeist. It was as if his view had shifted, tilted, the way that barber's mirror had, like a solid pane of glass. His body was suddenly awash in warmth. He stared closer, transfixed by that pitch-like black. His breath gritted in his chest like steel wool, were things moving in there? Sly, liquid shiftings, mincing suggestions of activity, all attended by a silky sound that made him think of sightless crabs shucking over one another in a shallow tide pool. What's wrong, Doc? Luke tore his eyes from the hatch. Some trick of the light, he croaked. It happens down here, Al said. The light reflects differently, gets absorbed in weird ways. Don't go in there, shrilled the voice in Luke's head. What choice did he have? What could he say? Sorry, I couldn't do my part to save humanity because I'm a teeny bit scared of the dark. Anchoring his hands on the hatch, Luke bit back his fears and propelled himself into that funneling blackness. 3. He toppled through awkwardly having shoved himself hard enough to silence that inner voice that kept shrieking, Don't, 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 don't! He'd expected some kind of crash pad, but there was nothing but steel gone frosty as the insides of a meat locker. He hit the floor, pain lanced down his collarbone and needled up his throat. The challenger's hatch swung shut. Luke rolled up, knees tucked to his chest. A goose egg was already swelling on his forehead. Lights winked on the floor, much like those of an airport runway. It didn't help much. He could barely see six feet in either direction. Cold. God, it was bracingly cold. This couldn't possibly be the temperature throughout the station. Everyone would freeze to death. Who's to say they're still alive? A new, maddening voice asked, joining the chorus in his head. This one sounded a lot like his mother's voice. Who's to say they didn't die days ago, Lucas, my dear? Noise from directly overhead. Tap, 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 tap. A sound that could be mistaken for the footsteps of eager children. This image now entombed itself in Luke's head, a pack of waterlogged youths with their eyes vacuumed from their skulls, scampering clumsily above him. Where the hell was Al? Luke stood, his adrenaline spiking, his head slammed into the tunnel. He couldn't stand at his full height. The ceiling was too low. Claustrophobia assaulted him. For a moment, he was suffocating inside his own skin. This is a tomb, he thought. Nothing but a vast undersea crypt, and I'm alone inside of it. Laughter. Luke's blood seized. Dry, nerveless dust caked his veins as if he'd been pumped full of fast dry cement. There it was again, unmistakable. This wasn't that dap, dap, dap noise from above. Unmistakably, it had been laughter. And it was coming from deeper down the tunnel. A boy's laughter. No way it could... Zack? 
Luke clapped a hand over his mouth. He couldn't believe he'd spoken the name, even now, disoriented at the bottom of the world. His lips burned with the shame of it. Of course his lost son wasn't down here. He wasn't anywhere on earth. He was in heaven. He was safe from harm now. You don't know that. His mother invading his head again, her voice honeyed and lacerating at once. They never found him, did they? He could be anywhere, Lucas. Anywhere at all. Sound from behind him. Luke spun on his heel. It came again, a tentative, staccato skittering. The urge struck to scurry back through the hatchway, a hatchway he feared was locked in any case, but instead Luke leaned into that sound, his eyes hunting desperately. A rhythmic panting traveled through the dark. A shape carved itself out of the gloom twenty yards away, squatting motionlessly. Luke could just make out the wet jewels of its eyes and the whitened plume of its breath. Come on, he thought, his hands balling into fists. Come on if you're coming. Which it did, eagerly, in fact, attended by a rapid clickety-click-click. Luke swung at its mad approach, wondering in some fear-shrunk chamber of his mind if this was something you could fight in conventional ways, with fists and feet and teeth. How did you fight a monster? His fist passed harmlessly over the creature's head, then it was on him, panting and whimpering and wagging its tail. 4. A chocolate Labrador retriever. It twined around Luke's legs, nuzzled its snout into his crotch, and whined companionably. Oh, Jesus. Hey, it's okay, boy. Luke said, running his hands over the dog's head. Oh, wait, girl. The dog looked healthy, though a little too thin and clearly quite cold. Her hind legs were shaking. She rucked her snout under Luke's armpit and rooted until her head popped out under his arm, giving his chin a slobbery lick. One of Clayton's lab animals? Did that mean the other specimens? Luke hated to think of them in his brother's clinical terms. Were out of their cages, too? The porthole opened. Al's boots appeared, her body gracefully following. She scanned the tunnel in both directions. Only then did her eyes settle on Luke. Your hands, she said. You're cut. Luke nodded. I didn't exactly nail the dismount. I'll live. What took you so long? The porthole shut after you went out. It shouldn't have. I had to disengage the pressure locks all over again. Al had a flashlight. When she flicked it on, Luke noted that they were situated in a gooseneck. The tunnel curved ninety degrees to the left and right, roughly thirty yards ahead on either side. The tunnel was ovoid, narrower at the top, wider at the bottom. Pipes and tubes ran along the walls, each labeled with their use. Many appeared to be wrapped with... Christ, was that friction tape? It was, the stuff the army called hundred-mile-an-hour tape as its manufacturers claimed it could hold a jeep together at that speed. My God, thought Luke with a dizzy species of dread. Is this fucking place held together with tape? Black foam had been applied around the entire tunnel in twenty-yard increments, in buckled seams running from floor to ceiling. Auto rails backs handiwork had to be. Elsewhere, Luke spotted signs of low-tech, on-the-fly fixes, bailing wire and putty and soldering lead, the station had that shop-worn, fix-me-up quality he remembered from the spaceships in the Alien movies. Al gestured to the dog. I see you've met Little B. Little B, Luke said. Did my brother name her? He named all of them. Luke should have known. Cholka and Mushka, Little B and Little Fly in English. They were the dogs in 1960 that were shot into space aboard Sputnik 3, but the Russians miscalculated the satellite's return trajectory. The poor dogs had been incinerated during re-entry. It was just like Clayton to name his specimens after those doomed pooches. So where are we right now? Luke asked. What part of the station? Docking and storage, said Al. Your standard dumping depot. You can see the start of the storage zones down that away. She aimed the flashlight. Luke could make out a pile of discarded air canisters. The beam threw wavering shadows on the wall beyond. 
Long, thin tendrils seemed to lick and lash just out of sight, only their serrate tips visible. Is it usually this dark, this cold? Al shook her head. It's running on phantom power. That's not unusual. Saving power is always key. But the heat's been cut, too. What's she doing in here? Luke asked, petting little B. Don't know, Doc. That's why we've been sent, to find out what's the rhubarb. It's why I've been sent, anyway. You're more the PR guy. That chilling noise kicked up again, children's feet dashing above them through the cold, dark sea. You'll hear it a lot, Al said. It's just the pressure from outside. The triest is built to disperse it in a kind of parabolic wave. Sounds freaky, huh? Like scuttling rats. Luke petted L.B., as he'd decided to name her, until she quit shaking. She peered at him with a grateful gaze. The edges of her eyes were a tallowy white. She was probably suffering from hypothermia. We have to get this dog someplace warm, Al. Right, she agreed. Let's get at... The scream came from somewhere to the left, although in truth it was so piercing that it seemed to radiate out of the tube itself. Al broke into a run, moving in the sound's direction, Luke dashed after her. L.B. remained pinned where she was. Luke said, Come on, girl. Let's go. Move your ass. The lab whined, her eyes rolling as the glow of Al's flashlight vanished around the gooseneck. Luke crouched down and cradled the dog to his chest. She whined again, mournfully this time. Please don't leave me. But began to stiffen when Luke set off after Al with her in her arms. Shh, girl, you're okay. The dog softened into his chest. She kept her chin tucked tight to Luke's shoulder, looking backward, studiously avoiding whatever lay ahead. Five. Tubes. Some kind of laboratory setup. A snarl of copper tubes spiraling at weird angles, like an octopus frozen in a huge lump of amber. This is what I saw before. Luke told himself, not the tentacles of some monster or mutant, just a mess of lab equipment. He avoided its spiky metal fingers while cradling the dog, which was already growing heavy. More clutter. MRE packets and empty jugs whose mouths were ringed with crusted pinkness. Shh, 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 shh. That eerie pattering overhead again. Luke craned his head up, his skull rung off the ceiling. He cursed, his body set in an uncomfortable stoop. Never in his life had he been so bummed to be six foot two. Portholes were strung along the ceiling. Luke saw nothing except the black water pressing down. If anything, the holes made the interior darker. You may as well install a porthole in a coffin. They reached a dead end. The tunnel had narrowed considerably. Luke's elbows nearly scraped the walls. He and Al couldn't stand side by side. Al stood slightly ahead. Luke hunched off her shoulder. The dog was squashed between them, though she didn't seem to mind. Some of the tunnels bottleneck as they reach a junction, Al said. It fattens out on the other side. Was that a scream we heard? said Luke. Al shook her head. Steam, I'd say. Another release valve. Luke didn't spot anything that looked like a release valve. They stood before a metal hatch with a single porthole. Al swung the flashlight. The ground was littered with junk, mostly busted glass, but also a gelatin-like lump that was dripping through the diamond grating. Its smell was spoiled and somehow malarial, the odor that might perfume an African village racked with disease. Luke peered through the porthole. After ten feet, the tunnel widened into what appeared to be a chamber. Luke could just make out its scalloped roof and the edge of a cot. It looked cramped, but still much warmer and more hospitable than his present situation. Luke set the dog down. His arms had grown weary. She bit his sleeve and held fast. Luke had seen this behavior with shelter dogs, abandonment issues. Al shone the flashlight through the porthole. If anyone's in there, they're being coy about it. She tapped on the glass. We can't get in here, she said. It only opens from the other side. Why? It's designed that way. There are two exits, this one and another one exactly like it on the other side. This area, primarily its storage, 
but the thinking was that in certain cases it could be used as containment, too. You mean a jail, Al, right? Or if one of the scientists got sick with the gets, we needed a spot where a person in that state could be put. Who's to say that a person doesn't lock the healthy ones in here? Al said, An imperfect system, I'll grant you that. Like a few other systems down here, most of them we never expected to use. So where does that leave us? How do we get out of here? Short answer? We don't, for now, unless your brother's waiting down at the other hatch. Wait a second. You're saying it never occurred to anybody that we'd be locked in? It did, absolutely, but we had to get down here all the same. They might be able to work a manual override up on the Hesperus, pop one of the locks electronically. Might? Are you kidding? Well, there could be technical issues. Luke couldn't believe it. He'd been sent to a trillion-dollar death trap at the bottom of the sea without any surety he'd even be able to reach his brother. He and Al could roam the storage tunnel until they froze to death. So, are we just going to wait until Clayton opens the door? He said. What if he refuses to? That's what you're here for, to sweet-talk him. Oh, my God. You obviously don't know my brother. Al's nose was running from the cold. We'll be okay. Look, we've got emergency blankets in the Challenger and a few days' worth of MREs. This isn't the best-case scenario, but it's not the worst. And what the hell was your worst-case scenario? Well, look around you. The station's still here. It's all uphill from here. Luke managed to return Al's cockeyed smile. Let's check the other hatch, said Al. Maybe your brother... Just then, a face filled the porthole glass, flexing and seething and threatening to shatter right through. The coppery, festering face of madness. Six. Its features were wrenched into an expression of tortured hostility. Its eyes, threaded with broken capillaries, bulged from their sockets. Luke flinched as he would from a vicious dog snapping at the end of a chain. The man behind the glass screamed. Flecks of spittle hit the glass. He slipped a gear, Luke thought. A familiar phrase back home used to describe someone who'd become addle-brained. But Luke figured this guy had done more than slip a gear. He'd fried his entire damn gearbox. It's Dr. Toy, Al said. Hugo the Horrible. This, then, was Dr. Hugo Toy, the molecular biologist Fells had mentioned, the only one still down here other than Clayton. He doesn't look so hot, Al deadpanned. Dr. Toy's expression reconstituted itself into a mask of chilly observation. His hands drifted in front of his face, his fingers tapping and fidgeting. One hand stretched toward the porthole, two fingers knocking on the glass as a child might tap on a terrarium to rouse a pair of sluggish lizards. His lips moved, repeating a simple phrase. His fingers tapped along in time. You are not who you are. You are not who you are. You are not, you are not, you are not who you are. One of his hands disappeared, then reappeared with a scalpel. Toy held the tip to his own throat and pulled it slowly across, not breaking the skin. Is he threatening us? Luke wondered, or threatening to do it to himself. Toy retreated down the tunnel with the scuttling, crab-like gait. He vanished around the bend and out of sight. Well, Al said finally, I don't figure he's letting us in, do you? Seven. They trekked back toward the Challenger. The cold crept into their bones. Luke was getting used to the patter of footsteps overhead, they had a rhythm he found oddly comforting. Do you have any clue what that was all about? He asked Al. It didn't look like the gets. Toy wasn't spotting. Down here, people... They go nuts, Al said. You see it a lot on subs. An extremely concentrated form of cabin fever. Even if you're cooped up in a cabin in the woods in the middle of winter, you can still open the door and breathe fresh air. 
Inside a sub, it's the same gray walls, same cold lights, same smells of bearing grease and dust burning in control consoles. On a sub, if a bubble head looked to be coming down with a case of the sea sillies, we'd give him a color wheel, same as you'd do with a grade schooler, or let him run his fingers through a book of carpet samples. I remember one guy carrying around a book of carpet rags, petting his favorite ones the way you'd pet a dog. But if you're prone to the sillies, you'll catch them eventually. The sea whittles at you like a sharp knife taking curls off a log until you just... Al mimed, snapping a twig between her hands. So Dr. Toy's gone batshit, Luke said. Didn't you say everyone down here was under psychiatric examination? Al shrugged. We had to go on what we could see through the monitors. Were these guys eating properly and sleeping on a regular schedule? That kind of thing. Westlake, Toy, and your brother were supposed to report for a counseling session every few days. Lately, they've all been AWOL. Luke said, Why did you call him that, anyway? Hugo the Horrible. That's everyone's name for him. He embraces it. He's not just a biologist. He's a chaos theory wonk. You know much about that? When Luke shook his head, Al said, Basically, it's a mathematical field based on trying to make sense out of random events, which seems in hindsight like a solid prescription for psychosis, wouldn't you say? Apparently, Toy was given to forecasting worst-case scenarios. Every silver cloud had a dark lining. And hey, she asked, did you make out what he was saying? I'm pretty sure it was, you're not who you are, over and over. Yeah, that's what I was seeing too. She made that stick-breaking gesture again. You are not who you are. They forged down the tunnel like parasites trapped in the guts of an organism so huge it was oblivious to their presence. The darkness closed in, running swiftly on their heels. Luke wanted to tell Al about the laughter he'd heard, the singing laughter of a child. His son's laughter? He couldn't. She'd think he'd gone nuts himself. He pictured the look of tolerant concern that would grace Alice's face when she heard, First toy, and now this poor fuck's gone around the bend already, she'd think. More crucially, Luke didn't want to associate the memory of his lost son with this unfriendly, unfeeling place. But that laughter continued to ring out in a recessed quadrant of his mind. Maddening. So maddening. 8. Luke's son had gone missing on a crisp fall day. He was six years old. Missing. The word didn't quite fit. Vanished was better. And like a tight-lipped magician, the world would never tell Luke how it had performed this horrible trick. It happened seven years ago at a public park not far from home. They often stopped by after Zach's first grade class finished to let some steam off before meeting Abby. The park faced the road, the grass rolling out fifty feet in every direction until it hit a dense forested area to the west. The afternoon was like any other. Luke took a late lunch, left the veterinary clinic, and picked Zach up. They walked home through the fallen leaves, holding hands. Zach made a point of stepping on the crinkliest leaves, loving the sound they made under his boots. At the park, Zach swung on the monkey bars and slid down the slide into a drift of leaves Luke had heaped at the bottom. Luke relished this time, knowing that before long Zack wouldn't be caught dead in public with his goony bird father. Too soon, the sun began to set over the firs. Five more minutes, sport. How many times had Luke imagined that they'd left that very instant? How many times had Luke wished that he'd taken his son's hand and ushered him home? He'd lost count. The thought never fully left his mind. Let's play hide-and-seek, Daddy. Okay, one game, then we hit the road. Zack smiled. It was the last clean look Luke would ever have of his boy. Zack's left canine had come out days before. His smile was lopsided with that fresh gap. Luke remembered that. He remembered every little thing. I'll hide, Daddy. Okay, but don't hide too far off. It's getting dark. Zack nodded obediently. Count. I'll count to twenty that I'm coming to get you. Luke said. One, two, three. Count slower. Zack's voice was fading toward the trees. 
You have to give me time to hide. Those were the last words his son would ever speak, the last ones to touch Luke's ears in any case. Whenever Luke closed his eyes, he could hear them, breathless and manic, as Zack hunted for a hiding spot, a spot he'd found and never left. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, Zack's giddy laughter carried back to Luke. Fourteen, fifteen. Luke heard another noise, impossible to identify. A ragged, zippering sound was the closest he could get to explaining it. Nestled within that wet, ripping note was another one, a resonant sucking. Suck, 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 a pair of enormous lips pulling on a straw. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Luke rattled off the last five numbers rapidly, adrenaline spiking in his chest. He couldn't say why he was so suddenly petrified. He could only accept that feeling inside of him and act on it. He rounded the corkscrew slide and scanned for a sign of his son. Nothing. Just this horrible emptiness, the wind screaming over every blade of grass. Zack? The wind snatched the name from his lips. Panic filched into Luke's chest, diffuse and dreamlike, wormed with self-consciousness. It was silly, so silly, to be worried. He'd spy the top of Zack's head peeking around that boulder over there, or ducked behind that trash can. And when that happened, Luke would chuckle at his foolishness and chase his son down and heft him, squealing with delight, into his arms. They'd go home, where supper was waiting, and after dinner, Zack would sit in his room, contentedly assembling a jigsaw puzzle he'd bought with the money the tooth fairy had left under his pillow. That's exactly how it would happen, Luke figured. That's how it had to happen, because until that very moment, Luke had believed the world was essentially reasonable. If you followed the rules, the world played fair with you. Kids didn't just disappear off the face of the earth, not in empty public parks, not in the time it took to count to twenty. Things like that never happened. You can come out now, buddy. Ollie, ollie, oxen free. The swings creaked in the wind. The street lights were popping on. Why had he stayed out so late? Daylight saving time had just kicked in, and he hadn't made the mental adjustment yet. But that could happen to anyone, couldn't it? A possibility came to him, that his son had burrowed under a drift of leaves, covering himself so that Luke couldn't spot him. Next he remembered the sounds, that meaty zippering, that sucking inhale. Come on, sport, you win. I'm sure Mom's got dinner ready. Spaghetti with macaroni noodles, your favorite. He'd reached the edge of the forest. Luke had lived in the city his whole life, treading every inch of it. He'd explored this very place for hours on end. He'd never gotten a sense of danger from it. But now, squinting into its dark tangle of branches, trees standing like gloomy sentinels, yes, it seemed very threatening indeed. Abby had lost Zachary a year or so before at a discount store, uneven floors, bins of irregular clothing, it was only for a minute, but she said that minute had stretched into an eternity. She was certain he'd been taken, snatched, she said. Someone had lured him away while her back was briefly turned. That was all it would take. Next, Zachary was in a van. Next, a remote warehouse or a soundproof basement. When she found him several aisles over, tickling his chin with a feather duster, she nearly wept with relief before furiously scolding him never to leave her sight again. And the same thing would happen now. Luke was sure of it. Zack? His voice rose several octaves. Buddy, please, enough. A thread of pure, unadulterated terror now braided into his heart. Fear mixed with a love more profound than any he'd ever felt and mingled with dizzying guilt for letting that most precious thing slip from his view at a crucial moment. He's gone. The voice in his head was black, discolored and malevolent, the voice of something conjured at a black mass. It spoke with calm certainty. Your boy is gone. Swallowed. The possibility jolted Luke into action. He stumbled into the woods. Zack! Zack! Christ! Zack! 
How long had he wandered through the trees, screaming for his son? Far too long. He should have called the police. They would have arrived in minutes. But even as he'd hunted more and more desperately, the fear and mania mounting, he remained certain that it was all some ridiculous accident, a misunderstanding that, once rectified, would be something they'd laugh about when Zack was an adult. Remember that time Dad thought he'd lost me in the woods, only what happened is I'd tripped and conked my head on a tree trunk and knocked myself cold for a few minutes? Har, har, har. Something just like that. Yes, goofy and commonplace and nothing to call the police about because it was fine. Really, everything was okay, okay, okay. Luke staggered out of the woods, wild-eyed and bleeding from the brambles. His mind was a jumble of horrific images, windowless vans and fillet knives and his son's fear-struck eyes. Only then had he dialed 911. The police arrived within minutes. Abby arrived a short time later. Luke couldn't bear to look his wife in the eyes. The first 24 hours were the real killers. That's what everyone will tell you. In any missing person's case, the chances of success drop drastically after a full day. The search area gets too wide, the potential locations of that person, or, it must be said, their body, become overwhelming. At first, Luke had been confident. The police cruisers with their cherries lit, the team of tracking dogs, just about every plainclothes officer in the city tromping through that half-mile stretch of forest. How could they not find his son? His son, who'd only been out of his sight for twenty seconds. No, less. A search and rescue helicopter strafed the forest with its spotlight. Luke had been in the woods by then, searching with everyone else. The helicopter roved toward the creek. Maybe Zack had fallen in, borne along in the current that flowed west toward Coralville. Maybe he was lying on its banks, shivering but unhurt. As midnight passed into the witching hours, a sense of disbelief settled over Luke. A feeling of unreality washed over him. This couldn't be happening. It was like waking up to find out your arm was missing. You went to bed, slept well, and when you woke up, it was gone. There was no pain, no scar. Only a smooth expanse of skin over the nub and an empty space where the limb once lay. It was that kind of nightmarish inconceivability he was facing. He couldn't cope with it. Luke could live without his arm, both arms, both legs, his tongue and ears and nose. He'd forfeit them all gladly just to have Zack back. But the world has always been resistant to bargains of that nature. When dawn paled over the treetops, Luke stumbled out of the woods into a ring of emergency vehicles. His brain was pinned in a merciless vice on the verge of tearing in half. He overheard some policemen debating the conceivability that someone had been in the woods watching and waiting until Zack had drawn near before grabbing him and stuffing an ether-soaked rag over his face, then dragging him through the trees and hucking. Luke remembered that clearly. The policeman had actually used the verb huck. Zack's body into the trunk of a car. After that, he could have been driven to where the access road met the main thoroughfare. If so, the abductor could be 400 miles away or only a few blocks distant in a nearby house. Luke sat beside Abby, who was wrapped in a blanket and sitting on an ambulance bumper. He slipped an arm around her shoulders and pulled her into him. She resisted, her eyes bruised and reproachful. Did he run away? Her voice had this terrible faraway quality. No, why would he run away? What did we do that he would do that? Oh, my God. There was something else in her eyes, too, fuming in the green of her irises. Fury. She was so, so angry at Luke. Over time, that fury might have even shaded into hatred. There were moments over the coming years when Luke wished that Zachary was dead. The fervency of his wish was sickening. But yes, dead. Of cancer or brain parasites, or even drowning in the creek. If he'd died of cancer, Luke and Abby could have been at his bedside, making his final days as comfortable as possible. It would have broken them in some ineffable way, yes, but it would have allowed them to love their son through his final days on earth. 
Even if he drowned in the creek, it was awful to envision, but at least it would be done. They would have a body to dress, rituals to observe, a coffin, a funeral. There would be a sense of knowing where their boy was, even if that meant under six feet of dirt at the Muscatine Avenue Cemetery. But Zachary wasn't dead. His case was classed as missing slash unsolved. There was no closure. It was the equivalent of a movie missing its final reel. Death was final. It meant Zack had passed beyond pain or fear. Missing was so much worse. Missing was a cavalcade of possibilities, none of them good. Neither Zachary nor his abductors were ever found. His disappearance made the rounds in the press, locally and eventually nationally, but the media's ardor cooled. There were other missing kids, and a million other tragedies besides. Luke drove. For a solid year after Zachary vanished, he spent every night on the road, driving around the city and farther afield, down the street-lit corridors of night, searching for his lost boy. He found him, too. Found him everywhere. It was a phenomenon other parents talked about. Luke and Abby had attended a support group at the urging of their grief counselor. A dozen empty-eyed parents, ex-parents, sitting in a circle in a chilly community center. They kept seeing their missing children, too. Seeing them in busy malls or whenever they drove past a schoolyard. They saw them in crowds, an arm, a foot, or maybe something in a child's posture that mimicked that of their own lost son or daughter. They had all rushed heedlessly into a throng, scooped up a child whose back was turned, so sure, so goddamn sure, only to see the frightened face of a stranger staring up at them. Luke could understand. He'd see the crook of Zachary's leg folding into a strange car and would follow that car until it stopped and a boy who wasn't Zach got out. He'd seen his son's tousled hair bobbing amid the crowd at the Iowa State Fair. In his more desperate moods, he'd considered snatching someone else's boy while his parents' backs were turned. Serves you right. You've got to pay attention every single second. He'd drive all night, come home at dawn, and fall into an exhausted sleep. His dreams were horrific. Dreams where Zack called to him from the bottom of a deep well, or where Zack screamed that he'd run away and never wanted to see Luke again. But the most insidious night terrors were the ones where Zack lay beside him in bed, his breath feathering Luke's neck. And when Luke awoke, his son just wasn't there. One evening, he woke up and Abby wasn't there either. She'd packed and left while he was sleeping. This came only as a small surprise to Luke. They hadn't spoken, really spoken, in months. They were two shells, emptied out by grief. The human shield. His old childhood persona, the one he'd cooked up to insulate himself from the predations of his mother. He'd always seen himself as that to Abby and Zack, a shield against the awfulness of the world, an awfulness his son would have to grapple with, yes, but hopefully not for many years. As a boy, he could simply stand beside his father and let Luke absorb the cruelest blows. Except somehow Luke's defenses had been penetrated. The forces of evil had found a blind spot, their tentacles creeping behind his back to snatch Zack away. Twenty seconds. Lives can collapse in that time span. Abby accepted the fact that it wasn't all Luke's fault. It could have happened to anyone, sure. And yet she came to hate him regardless. She walked out because she wanted to stop hating the man she'd once loved. And because she must have realized that her hatred, though powerful, was a pale reflection of the loathing Luke felt for himself. Luke couldn't blame her. He was even mildly relieved to discover she'd gone. When the divorce papers arrived a few weeks later, he'd signed them without rancor. In time, he returned to his veterinary practice. Tending to animals gave his life a glimmer of value, and if he occasionally broke down in tears or screamed or shook, well, animals were eminently forgiving of such behavior. So Luke did his job, and at night, to avoid sleeping, he'd drive. Consciousness couldn't stave off the memories, though. In time, his memories became waking dreams. 
It got so that he could actually dream with his eyes wide open. Luke remembered feeding Zack this one time when he had a fever. Zack, then just a toddler, hadn't wanted to eat, but if he didn't, he'd get sicker. This worried Luke tremendously. He'd wished Abby was there. He needed her calm composure, but she had been working late. In frustration, Luke shoved a spoonful of applesauce into his son's mouth. Just eat it, please. Zack went silent, the dismay and bewilderment building as his face turned pink. Then he'd begun to bawl, the applesauce still pooled in his mouth. Sick with guilt, Luke carried him upstairs to the bath. Zack sat in the tub, withdrawn and motionless. When Luke dried him, Zack started shivering. He wouldn't make eye contact with Luke. This scared Luke so badly. Had he wrecked that beautiful bond of trust between them? Some things you can never get back. Even if Zachary couldn't remember it consciously, the act, his dad shoving a spoon into his mouth and shouting at him to eat, would stick in his developing mind like a barb. That's why I ran away, Daddy. I ran because you were mean to me. Luke had been afraid that Zack wouldn't trust him anymore because he had let him down. And years later, Luke would let his son down again at the worst possible moment. As a father, Luke couldn't cope with that. He still breathed, still functioned, but he was ruined inside. Guilt and despair crushed him into something unrecognizable. So he drove and grieved, and in time the gets took its hold on the world. He dearly wished he would catch it. Forgetting was the best remedy, wasn't it? Forget Abby, forget Zack, forget the wonderful life they'd had together. Just let me forget, please, for the love of God. But the world was resistant to bargains of that nature, too. Nine. You okay, Doc? Alice's voice snapped Luke out of these unhealthy ruminations. First his mother, now his son. The sharp blades of a tiller churned through his gray matter, dredging up blackened pulp and odd bits of bone. Luke felt them there in the trees, both Bethany and Zachary. Not in any material way, but their shapes and voices clung tightly to him now. It had started the moment that the challenger slipped under the sea. He was trapped with them now, under the hammering intensity of a trillion tons of water. I'm fine, he said, just having some trouble concentrating. Luke was flanking Al. The dog, LB, padded behind them. They'd already stopped to collect their bags at the Challenger hatch. Then they'd rounded the gooseneck on the other side of the tunnel, heading toward the remaining hatch. Your brother will let us in, Al said. To Luke's ears, her voice held the mad certainty specific to leaders of doomed polar expeditions. Oh, yeah, most certainly. Luke glanced at the portholes along the ceiling. He caught movement across one of them, a pale shred drifting languorously along. Al? That's it, the ambrosia, she said, her eyes following his pointing finger. That's why the portholes were built, to see where it's concentrated. The ambrosia wafted to the portholes' rim and hung there a moment before vanishing. Luke continued to stare at the ring of blackness where the foot thick glass and polymer held back the crushing sea. He half expected something to flare across it. A disembodied face, perhaps, a suety, pockmarked face glowing a sick maggot white except for the eyelids which were red as flayed beef. The pressure had vacuumed the eyes into their sockets. They stared from deep within those cold pits. But of course nothing appeared. Just the bleak emptiness of the deep Luke wondered if this was how an astronaut felt staring through the porthole of his lunar module to catch a glimpse of space where not a single star shone, an infinite blackness, bleak and dehumanizing. The tunnel was less cluttered on the other end. Light burned behind the hatch's porthole. Al knocked on it. It sounded as if she was wrapping her knuckles on a cast-iron cannon at a Civil War memorial. Nobody answered. Thick door she said as if this were a new fact. Not to sound desperate here, Al, but what are our options? 
Al stuck her tongue between her teeth, biting down. Well, we can wait. Chances are your brother will pass down this way. Tip-top plan. And how do we know Toy doesn't have control of the whole station? Luke said. How can we be sure he hasn't tied Clayton up? Or worse? The thought crossed my mind ever since we lost contact, Al admitted. Most of the areas can be self-sealed and contained, the lab, the purifiers, so my hope is that it's Toy who's been isolated, or he's isolated himself. But you're right, he may have the run of the entire joint. We have to get in there somehow. You said something about triggering the lock remotely? Yeah, that may be our best bet. A shiver racked Al's frame. I'll head back and see what I can do. You stay here. If I pop the lock, you hold the door. She squeezed past Luke. The tunnel was so cramped that Luke had to suck in his stomach to let her pass. Her footsteps receded down the tunnel, and with them went the reassuring glow of the flashlight. Luke dropped his duffel bag and sat on the floor. The dog rested her head upon his lap. He felt foolish, ineffective. God in heaven sitting beside a locked door in the hope it would open. A glorified bellhop. God damn it. He said softly, Christly Jesus, goddamn hell. It felt good to blaspheme. Goddamn fucking good. Could God even hear him down here? You go ahead, son. He figured God might say, good sport that he was. Take my name in vain if it keeps your powder dry. People take it in vain when they stub their toe or get cut off in the freeway. I'm used to it. I'm closer to hell than heaven down here anyway. Luke said and laughed. It freaked him out a little how hollow it sounded. Hello, oh, 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 he said, his words soaked into the darkness only to come back in a mocking lilt. Oh, oh, oh. He glanced down and spotted a spiral-bound notebook that had either fallen or been wedged under the grate. Curious, he lifted the grate a few inches and fished the notebook out and nearly dropped it just as fast. The corners were slick with a dark, sticky substance. Psych report, the cover read. He rifled the pages. The first few were filled with neat, clinical handwriting. The overhead lights dimmed, a fluttering brown out. He slid the notebook into an empty pocket in his bag, not wanting that black gunk to touch his clothes. The lights went out. All of them, this time and all at once. The light beyond the porthole glass, the dim runway lights winking in the floor. Darkness clogged in Luke's sockets and invaded his throat. His brain fused shut in utter panic. He couldn't think. He could barely breathe. L.B. sat bolt upright, her breath feathering the nape of his neck. Her hackles rose against his arm, stiff as porcupine quills. A new noise slipped out of the darkness, back where Al had gone. Not footsteps. No, this was a deliberate, smooth slithering. L.B. whined next to Luke's ear. Her breath held a shaved iron tang, the smell of pure animal fear. What could possibly make a noise like that? Had Clay brought a snake down for his tests? Oh, God, what if he'd brought a python? Could it have gotten loose? Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Soft silky, advancing steadily through the dark. No, Luke remembered. Fells said there were dogs, lizards, guinea pigs, bees. No snakes. Those footsteps raced overhead again, but this time the darkness gave them a new, knowing cadence. Luke pictured a group of stunted youths in the water outside the station, their bodies white as candle wax, sun-starved flesh flaking from their skeletons. Their heads, projecting from their collared shirts, were flat as flounders. Their mouths were enormous and studded with the same needle-like teeth he glimpsed on the viper fish. They would be staring through the porthole with sightless silvery eyes, not really seeing, but sensing him. Now the whoosh, whoosh was joined by another sound. A dry, chittering, almost mechanical. The sound of a million tiny limbs dancing lightly along the metal floor. It's the old man, Luke thought wildly, the old man with the mantises on his head. Luke pictured him trudging down the tunnel, his radial tire sandals whooshing on the floor while mantises spilled off of his skull. 
Then another image darkened his mind, an older memory this time, a recollection drawn down from the surface world. Yes, said a cold voice inside his head. Oh, yes, that's it exactly. And it's coming for you, Lucas, coming for you this very moment. Years ago, when his life was much better, Luke had been invited to a veterinary conference in Arizona. They had gone as a family, staying at a motel edging the desert. The first night, they settled their infant son into the pack and play. Then, once Zack was asleep, Luke and Abby made love stealthily. Luke slipped inside Abby and rocked gently. Afterward, they slept, only to be awakened by Zack's horrific screams. Abby jackknifed up in bed. Zack, she said, what is it, baby? Luke could just make out the shape of his son and the finger of moonlight falling through the motel window. He was curled inside the pack and play. His face was pressed to the breathable mesh which distorted his features. Luke snapped on the bedside lamp. Zachary was shrieking, these lung-shredding sounds Luke had never heard before. He leapt out of bed. Zachary's face was beet red and alarmingly puffed. Luke picked his son up and pressed the boy to his chest, a calming gesture. Luke's heartbeat skyrocketed when he felt something squirming against his own chest, something inside Zachary's sleeper, trapped against his son's skin. Zach's piercing screams unlocked this dreadful hysteria in Luke. Each one shot a jolt of scalding acid through his veins. The boy thrashed and squealed as Luke gripped him under his armpits, his little face a balloon ready to burst. Jesus, oh Jesus, what the fuck is that? Something was moving under Zach's sleeper. Luke saw these terrifying whip-like motions in the left leg of Zach's sleeper. It looked like a big fish caught in a net trying to fling itself free. Luke made a dry gagging sound, the panic swelling in his throat like a sponge. He tore the sleeper open. There, curling around his son's ankle and all the way up his thigh, was the largest insect Luke had ever seen. A long, torsional tube. Its black body was segmented, sinuous, reflecting the room's meager light. It looked the same at both ends, so Luke couldn't tell where its head was. Luke saw inflamed divots all over Zack's chest where the fucking thing must have bitten his boy. It moved, was moving even as Luke stared, slack-jawed, with subtle undulations powered by a dizzying multitude of legs. It released itself from Zack's ankle, slipping up the back of his leg and around the frilled, absorbent ridge of his diaper. It was enormous, at least eight inches long. It kept coming and coming like a freight train steaming out of a tunnel, kinking and unwinding and flexing its revolting body. Luke caught the final half inch of it, disgustingly warm, with a greasy sheen. It reminded him of grabbing the fireman's pole at his old playground, the metal hot and slick from the hands of a hundred children. He pinched his fingers with the desperate hope of snaring the bug, ripping the fucker in half, but it shimmied free and slithered under his son's back. Abby tore madly at Zack's sleeve, trying to yank the sleeper off. The fear chewed into the sensitive wires in Luke's brain, paralyzing his nerve centers. He pushed Abby away forcefully, too panicked to notice, flipped Zack onto his back and pressed down on his sleeper, finding the bug, a millipede, he knew by then, and trapping it in the fabric. He freed Zachary's arms, then leapt off the bed with the balled-up sleeper. The millipede whipped in his grip. Luke absorbed a series of bites as painful as the sting of a wasp. Luke's only thought, This fucker's been doing that to my son. He threw the sleeper down and stamped on it with his bare heel, a satisfying metallic crunch like stepping on a beer can. He stomped again and again, fueled by a rage as primordial as any he'd ever experienced. Die, you fucking brainless monster. Die, you awful thing. He stepped away, panting. Abby cradled Zack. He was still bawling, but his cries had lost their death-struck pitch. Luke's gaze returned to the sleeper. Amazingly, it was moving. The millipede crawled out of one sleeve. Skittering hesitantly, leaking viscid pus-yellow fluid, it curled into a cochlear coil on the carpet. Oh no, Luke breathed. Oh no, no, no. 
he retrieved his heavy-soled dress shoe and slammed it down. The bug actually leapt up, bouncing off the thick, nappy pile. With the same shoe, Luke flicked it through the open bathroom door and onto the tiles, muttering, Fucking thing, oh you fucking thing! and knelt on the tiles, slamming the shoe down furiously till the insect was nothing but a jam-like smear. And right then, alone in the Triest's tunnel, this was the memory Luke's mind conjured. That slippery whoosh-whoosh in the cavernous dark was the whoosh of a millipede stalking toward him, chitter-clattering on its million skillion legs. This wasn't your garden variety one either. Oh no. The darkness nursed it into something new entirely. A millipede the size of a fourth-generation Aleppo pine, thick around as a trash can. Something primeval, hailing from the Permian Age, where the scale of life was all out of whack. Its mandibles, sharp as head shears, clacked silkily, the sound of a razor drawn down a leather strop. Whoosh, whoosh. Pause. Whoosh, whoosh. Chit chit screech chit chit chit. It advanced slowly, in no rush. Where was there to go? It had all the time in the world. Impossible, the rational center of Luke's mind insisted. Even if it did exist anywhere on Earth, which it absolutely fucking does not, how would something like that get down here? It's nothing, nothing at all, for fuck's sake, nothing at all. His mind took a sickening lurch. That reasonable, if increasingly shrill, voice in his head held no sway down here. Maybe his brain had conjured this nightmare bug out of nothingness, but it was still here, if only in this moment. Either he'd created it, or the treeist had, or he was coming down with a case of the sea sillies already. Your sea bag's leaky, sailor. Isn't that what they say in the Navy when a guy went batshit? Your sea bag's leaking its guts all over the friggin' place, Swabby. You've gone Section 8, you fucking loony bird. Whoosh, whoosh. Whoosh, whoosh. You think that's nothing, Luke? His mother said mockingly, with that throaty chuckle of hers. Oh, I think we both know it's something. After all, the dog can feel it, too, wouldn't you say? Can't you feel her shivering against you? Oh, yes, it's something all right. And whatever it is, Luke, it's coming for you. Luke pushed the dog behind him and butt-bumped him toward the locked hatch. The tunnel narrowed. His breath came in hot, nauseous gusts. Whoosh, whoosh. Luke swore he could see the segmented shape of the millipede's gargantuan and somehow gothic body, the plating of its exoskeleton exuding its own sick glow. It was approaching with a mincing sidewinder movement. Jesus, no, this is not happening. There's nothing, nothing. He flattened his back against the hatch. The dog was tucked and trembling behind his knees. Luke leaned forward slightly, terror buzzing in his skull like angry yellow jackets. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. The airlock hissed behind him. The hatch fell open. Luke's heels stuttered back and hit the metal lip. He squawked, toppling backward as he scrambled away from the chattering noises in the hallway. Light flooded his eyes. A familiar face stared impassively down at him. Hello, brother. Ten. Clayton Nelson's face wore a particular expression a good deal of the time. It had begun to grace his features as a child, and although his face had changed over the years, the expression had not. There was a noticeable thinning of the lips and a flaring of the nostrils. The flesh drew tight at the top of his nose where it met the edges of his eyes, while his eyebrows tinted in an inverted V. It was the look of a man who'd sniffed something foul but could not determine the source of the odor. Clayton Nelson's face could hold this expression for hours. It was the very expression it held now, in fact, as he looked at Luke sprawled on the tunnel floor. Thanks for rolling out the welcome wagon, said Luke, feeling stupid, 
which is how he frequently felt in his older brother's presence. Clayton was narrow-shouldered and thin-lipped, dressed in gray coveralls, a custodian's uniform. His face was austerely handsome in a way particular to polar ice caps, flinty and remote. As he'd aged, Clayton had come to look more and more like a member of some fallen Eastern European aristocracy. The only feature working against that perception was his hair, which hung down his neck in a ragged fringe, the beginnings of a mullet. It gave him the look of a double-A middle relief pitcher, an aging player who'd had a cup of coffee in the majors and was now playing out the string with the Tuscaloosa mud hens or Richmond flying squirrels. The fingertips of his left hand were bandaged. Let me help you up, Clayton said mechanically, offering Luke his unbandaged hand. Luke glanced down the storage tunnel. Empty. No giant millipede. Of course not. He rubbed his head. A fresh goose egg parted the short hairs on the back of his skull. L.B. hunched behind him, her tail tucked between her hind legs. Ah, you located the specimen, Clayton said. Anger flared in Luke. It was partly the adrenaline burn-off and the shame at his crazed imaginings, but primarily the familiar rage he'd too often felt toward his brilliant, careless brother. Why was she in there? he said. It's freezing. It's dark. She was alone. I wasn't aware. Hugo took it. Luke bristled at the pronoun. It, as if Dr. Toy had stolen office supplies instead of a living creature. He must have abandoned it in there, Clayton said. Why would he do that? Clayton's eyebrow arched. Have you seen Hugo? When Luke nodded, Clayton said, then I don't need to tell you why he might act irrationally. I don't know why he locked the specimen. She, Clay, she's not a specimen, Luke said. Technically, yes, it is, Clayton placidly replied. You named her Little B. And it's just a name. A stupid one. Well, I'm sure the specimen appreciates your concern. Luke willed himself to calm down. What profit was there in arguing as they had as children? He wished Al would get her ass back. He needed a buffer. Clay, what the hell is happening down here? He asked. The monitors are out. You haven't communicated for days. I get a phone call at three o'clock in the morning telling me to hightail my ass to Guam. They play me a recording where you're telling me to come down, come home. After that, they took me into a chilly room, rolled out a slab, and showed me Dr. Westlake. Hold on. Clayton held up his unbandaged hand. What's this about a recording? Luke nodded. The last transmission they received from you. You were saying, come home, Lucas. We need you, Lucas. Stuff like that. Clayton scoffed. Asking for you. Why in God's name would I do that? Clay, I heard you. Clear as day. Come home, Lucas. Clayton's features were fixed in that just-sniffed-shit expression, and again Luke was left feeling that he was the dog-shit on Clayton's shoe, the foul muck that his brother was just now realizing he'd stepped in. Whatever you heard, it wasn't me. I have no need of you here. He gave Luke an are-you-serious look. What would you possibly add? Clayton was telling the truth. Luke knew him well enough to see that. Who the hell could have sent that transmission then, and how? Had someone taped Clayton covertly and spliced a sound file together? Why would Westlake or Toy, the only possible culprits, do that? You said something about Westlake? Clayton prodded. Luke eyed his brother evenly. Are you saying you don't know what happened to him? We've had no recent contact with the surface. Disturbances in the water have muddled our transmissions. I know Westlake took the sub. I have no idea how he managed it. None of us were taught how to... He exhaled through his nostrils. I haven't seen him in some time. He locked himself in his lab. He left in... I was about to say the dead of night, but it always feels like that down here. He certainly left without telling me. He's dead, Clay. Luke paused to let it sink in. I mean, not just dead. The word failed to express what Luke had seen. I've never seen anything like it. I never want to again. Clayton accepted the news stoically. 
Perhaps his upper lip twitched, but if so, it was barely noticeable. What the hell is going on down here? Luke resisted the urge to punctuate each word with a poke to his brother's chest, anything to pierce that Teflon exterior. You've got Dr. Fells and everyone else in a flap, and that was before Westlake surfaced. Our research. The tests are ongoing, Clayton said. He had already accepted both Westlake's death and Luke's untimely arrival. His mind had processed both phenomena, catalogued and dismissed them with typical Claytonian swiftness. It's remarkable, what we've discovered beggars' description. There have been setbacks, some expected, others less so. Dr. Toy isolated himself. He glanced at his watch with a hint of perplexity. I can't say how long ago. Time has a funny way of behaving down here. And we're in, Al said, abruptly stepping in from the storage tunnel. Nice work, guys. She offered her hand to Clayton, who shook it dryly. Sight for sore eyes, Doc. I was trying to get the door unlocked remotely, but I can't pass a clear signal to the surface. We've been having the same trouble, said Clayton. Is that why the monitors are on the fritz, too? Clayton shrugged. I don't know why that might be. I assumed it was a breakdown on your end. Luke told Alice what Clay had said about not sending the transmission. That seems unlikely, said Al, turning to Clayton. I've listened to that transmission two dozen times. It's you, Dr. Nelson. It's the reason Luke's here. Clayton bristled. It wasn't me. Why on earth would I need a veterinarian? He spoke the word veterinarian with the same dismissive inflection others might accord the word moron. Well, isn't this a touching family reunion, Al said. Maybe you were sleeping, Clay, Luke said. LB barked energetically, as if in support. When you recorded it, I mean, you didn't sound like yourself. Clayton wouldn't dignify this possibility with an answer, but Al coaxed Luke to go on. You sounded... you sounded gone, Luke said. Just, I don't know, somewhere outside your own skin. Your voice had a floaty quality. Maybe you were sleepwalking. Maybe you sent the transmission without knowing it. I've never sleepwalked in my life, Clay said. But Al was nodding. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Happens a lot on submarines. Sailors getting out of bed, walking around, and waking up in funny places. Guys who never had the habit before. Lots of lucid dreaming, too. Talking in your sleep. Your brainwaves go a bit buggy down here. Why didn't I think of that? Well... Clayton said with a stagey eye roll. Now that's been sorted. Perhaps you'd like to leave. Alice laughed without mirth. You crack me up, Doc. I figure since we've come all this way, and factoring in what happened to Dr. Westlake, we best stay a while, take a proper accounting of things. Clayton nodded impassively. As long as you don't disturb my lab or intrude on my work. A hard look at Luke. Either of you. Wouldn't dream of it, said Al. Clayton's face reminded Luke of a blanket pulled over a nest of scorpions, seemingly tranquil, but with all manner of thoughts and instincts twisting beneath it. Well then, come along. Clayton turned and walked away with every expectation they'd follow, treating them with the indifference you might accord to a pair of slack-jawed yokels who'd just fallen off the hay truck, which, Luke noted with an absence of bitterness, was how Clayton treated pretty much everybody he met. He'd always been an equal opportunity disdainer. 11. Despite the low ceiling, Clayton moved down the tunnel with the grace of a man who did not so much walk as he did float a millimeter or two above the ground, hovercrafting on a ribbon of air. The tunnel was well lit. Warmth emanated from gilled vents, they walked in silence and squeezed single file through a gap where the tunnel winnowed to a bottleneck. Separated by a flimsy barrier of polymers and foam, Luke could feel the sea pressing against his skull. His eardrums throbbed from the pressure of that static silence. Luke had never been particularly prone to claustrophobia. As a child, he'd navigated drainage tunnels and dusty attics, happy as a hamster in a habit trail. But these tunnels truly resembled a kind of digestive tract with their ridged walls and scalloped ceilings. No wonder toys and Westlake's mental states had eroded, 
on top of the pressure and isolation, they'd spent too much time pacing these sinister tubes. They rounded a tight bend. Luke stopped so suddenly that L.B. butted into the backs of his legs, leaving a streak of drool on his overalls. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. The tunnel hit an abrupt stop. It was as if they'd reached a dead end, except for the circular hole in the wall at the end of the tunnel, about the size of a manhole. The mouth of the hole was dark, but Luke could see that it stretched off to meet some unknown terminus within the station. Relax, said Al. They're called crawl-throughs. It's a structural necessity. You'll see the same thing at space stations, chutes connecting one area to the other, which the astronauts float through. We, unfortunately, are tethered by gravity, but at least it's got rungs just like a ladder. It's a twenty-second trip, Luke. Piece of cake. Luke approached the chute. God, it was tiny. A choking ring. He could see straight through it, at least to the lit tunnel on the other end. Rungs ran along its ceiling. But why had he thought it was the diameter of a manhole? It looked about as big around as the door on his clothes dryer, if that. Clayton slid on his stomach. He wriggled until his ass was past the chute's mouth, transitioned onto his back, and gripped the rungs. He pulled himself through, grunting slightly in exertion. Shortly afterward, he slid out the other end. You go, Al said to Luke. Then the dog, then me. Luke slid himself in. He tried to move as he'd seen his brother do, but it was difficult. He turned over awkwardly. A black tongue of foam ran along the chute, top to bottom. When he exhaled, his shoulders touched its edges, an uncomfortable feeling, one that made his knees rise to his chest instinctively. His kneecaps hit the top of the chute and made no sound at all. There was a terrible solidity to everything down here, put there by the water. He could have been crawling through an underground cave with a billion tons of rock pushing down. It doesn't matter, he told himself. If this chute collapses, you'll be dead before your mind even registers the threat. Gripping the rungs, he pulled himself through. The chute was coated with a helpful silicon agent. He slid as effortlessly as a plastic puck over an air hockey table. He reached the other end, turned onto his stomach, and fell gracelessly to the floor. Clayton made no effort to help him up. You really know how to make a guy feel welcome, Luke said. With some gentle coaxing, L.B. came next. She whined and whimpered, but Al gave her a push and the dog slid through the chute as if she'd been greased. Once Al herself was through, they continued. The tunnel followed a gentle curve until it hit another hatch, which opened into a lab area. It was much larger than any room Luke had seen so far. His head nearly touched the overhead lights, which buzzed with an insectile hum. The lab was spartanly appointed, a few chairs, cardboard filing cabinets, Everything was collapsible, foldable, compressible, as it would have to be to have gotten down here. It's not as if they could back up a moving truck to the Triest's front door and let burly men in weightlifting belts offload supplies. It all would have been ferried down in the Challengers and been small enough to fit through their hatches. Luke noted five hatches, the one they'd come through, marked Access 1, plus four more, marked LN, LW, LT, and Access 2. The second hatch, L.W., was locked. Luke saw a keypad beside it. L.W.'s porthole was slicked from the inside with coagulated dark matter. A buzz emitted from behind the hatch, which quivered the delicate hairs of Luke's inner ear. A foldable lab bench was scattered with papers, most of them scrawled with his brother's spiky handwriting. Petri dishes were stacked in a small cooler. Empty MREs were heaped in a trash bin. Luke said, is that a viewing window? Yes, Clayton said. The only one of any size in the station. It stretched nearly floor to ceiling, perhaps eight feet across. Luke's eyes charted the curve of the glass. Was it glass? Probably not. Glass would shatter. Beyond lay a blackness so profound that it unrooted something in his chest. Clayton flicked a switch. The interior lights dimmed. He flicked another. A bank of high-intensity spotlights flooded the ocean bottom. Twelve. The sea floor was as flat as a ballroom. It unfurled to the farthest edge of the light's reach, perhaps twenty feet, 
before rolling under a solid wall of darkness that no man-made light could penetrate. The marine snow drifted in seismic comers, gentle waves of motion, or as though something was moving cunningly under the surface. Luke's heartbeat thudded dully at his temples. He put a hand on the window. The mammoth density of the sea throbbed against his fingertips. He pictured spider-legged cracks forming in his reflection, then water needling through to slice his fingers off painlessly. Next, the window would shatter inward as the ceiling crumpled down, crushing him before he could make peace with God. We watch it out there, Clayton said. Perhaps it watches us, too. Luke saw it then, as though it had arrived on cue. Ambrosia, a solid sheet of the stuff. It drifted across the ocean floor, reminding Luke of a manta ray. It shaped itself into a playful O and rolled along like a hula hoop. Luke got the oddest sense of being teased. It was like watching a lure jigged past his sightline, some canny angler making it dance and shimmy oh so invitingly in hopes Luke would lunge and take an incautious bite. Then what? Clayton said, Magnificent, isn't it? Luke caught a sense of shapes cavorting where the light turned granular. At the precise point where the spotlights faded and died, he swore he could see things. They coalesced, solidifying into something swirling with angry movement, so large that the darkness could scarcely contain it, rushing at him swiftly. He flinched. But there was nothing. The drifting snow, the impenetrable wall of black. Are you catching much of it? Luke asked his brother. Will it... Will it let itself be caught, was the question he thought but did not say. We don't have to catch it anymore, Clayton said. You have enough? Oh, you can never have enough, Lucas. Then why don't you have to catch it? Because it's coming to us. He snapped the lights back on. Luke saw that Al had gravitated toward the door marked L.W., her face had a disconnected, swimmy quality, the look of a person suspended in a wonderful, all-consuming dream. Al? said Luke. Her expression didn't change. She trailed one finger over the hatch of L.W. sensuously, as she might over a lover's sensitive flesh. L.B. gave a short bark. The fog over Al's eyes lifted. Sorry. Off in my own world there she said sheepishly. This is Westlake's lab, right? Of course it is, Clayton waved his hand edgily. Come away from there. Obediently, Al did so. She was grinning and rubbing the back of her neck as if she'd been caught doing something embarrassing. Luke watched her circumspectly, a little weirded out by her detached expression, too much like the zoned-out look that would enter an animal's eyes once the youth assault took hold. L.B. padded over and sniffed Al's pocket. She produced a half-eaten energy bar, snapped off a piece, and tossed it to L.B., who snatched it out of the air and wolfed it down. From another part of the station arose a dull, monotonous knocking. Is that Dr. Toy? Al asked. Clayton shrugged, said, Who else? You figure he's dangerous, Doc? said Al. We can't have him running around trying to punch holes in the damn walls. He staked out his fiefdom, Lieutenant, Clayton said. He's squatting in the animal quarantine. He's not bothering me. I'm not bothering him. Luke said, what is he doing? Pursuing scientific inquiry, I assume, Clayton said. What else? Luke's gaze tracked from Clay to the hatch marked L.W. Suddenly it hit him. L.W. Westlake. L.T. Toy. L.N. Nelson. These must be their private labs. Luke could see into Dr. Toy's through the porthole, orderly and empty. He could even see into Clayton's. But Westlake's porthole was obscured by that slick black coating, and there was that odd hum from behind the hatch. Has anyone been in Westlake's lab since... said Luke. Clayton shook his head. It's locked. Only Westlake knew the keypad code to gain entry. Should we take a look inside? Luke said, eyeing that black stuff critically. That is unwise, 
Clayton said. Westlake was working with certain toxic compounds, I believe. There may be a contamination risk, but we're perfectly safe if it remains shut. That hatch is hermetically sealed. Clayton folded his hands complacently, smiling at them both. Smiles always sat badly on his face. Too often he appeared to be snarling. Luke thought his brother looked haggard. Exhaustion was etched into the flesh around his eye sockets. Something's happened to everyone down here, and it's still happening. But what? It refused to be pinpointed, no more than a dark speck in Luke's brain, growing steadily and gathering weight. Why are you here again, anyway? Clayton asked Luke icily. Why you, precisely, I mean, of all people? Like I said, they called me, the government. They thought you might... Lucas, come home. We need you. Come home. Need me here. Need something from me. I can tell you that you're not needed here, Clayton said simply. A sheet of anger draped over Luke as he was ripped back through time, a younger brother knocking on the door of his big brother's basement lab. He was holding a small gift, a glass of chocolate milk, and in return only hoped for a glimpse of Clayton's sorcery, or, far better, an invitation to help out. But inevitably the door would open a crack, his offering hurriedly snatched away, and the door slammed shut in his face. You're not needed. Luke was furious that his brother would still treat him so shabbily. That fury crystallized into anger at himself. Why did Clayton's predictable scorn still wound him? He wasn't here for his rat shit brother. He was here for the people up in the real world, the ones who had human feelings and needed the help Clayton might be able to provide. You don't know what you need anymore, Clay, Luke said. You ever consider that? That you might be in over your head? Oh no, not the legendary Clayton Nelson, not cute Clay, one-time pinup boy of bubblegum magazines from coast to coast. Luke swooned. The lab tilted under his feet, the light streaking across his vision. You're dead on your feet, Luke, Al told him. You need to get some sleep. When had Luke last slept? An eternity ago. He'd powered through on fear and adrenaline, but now the fatigue hit him like a hammer blow. The Nelson brothers' death match, the same battle they'd been engaged in off and on for their entire lives, could wait. Yeah, maybe just an hour or two, he said. Recharge the batteries. Al took his hand. Her grip was strong and calming. I'll take you somewhere you can rest. Luke grabbed his bag. Clayton watched in stony silence as Al led Luke down the tunnel marked Access 2. LB patted behind Luke her head darting side to side alertly. How are you feeling? Luke asked Alice. They'd been inside the station only a few hours, but oh God, it felt much longer. I'll manage. But Luke could hear the fatigue in her voice. Flee, Luke thought. Jet, blow this popsicle stand. Use your feet to beat the street. Don't be a worm, Lucas, his mother spoke up. You could as soon outrun your own skin. What are you, scared? A little fraidy cat? They came to a hatch that opened into a cramped bunk room. A cot, a stack of journals, a heap of dirty clothes. LB sniffed around the cot, chuffed dubiously, and curled up on the floor. It was Dr. Westlake's, Alice said. Will it do? Luke thought, why ever not? The last body to lie on this cot now lies in a vault. Yes, he said, tamping down his revulsion. Thank you. Sleep. Then we'll put our heads together and figure things out. Luke stowed his bag and sat on the bunk. LB leapt up, prodding Luke with her snout and eventually settling over his thighs. He shooed her off. She went reluctantly, her eyes shining wetly up at him. The floor under the bunk was scattered with Westlake's research. A laptop lay atop one pile. The silver casing was sticky with dark matter. He scraped at it with his fingernail. It peeled away in a long ebony curl. It reminded him of the half-set coating on a toffee apple, so sticky it could rip the fillings out of molars. He sniffed at it. Ugh, a sweet decay, 
like the pool of mystery juice at the bottom of an amusement park trash can. Clayton's voice drifted through his mind. Westlake was working with certain toxic compounds. Luke opened Westlake's laptop. Files were clustered at the bottommost left-hand corner of the desktop. Luke used the trackpad to spread them out. Three audio files. Contact one, contact two, contact three. Curiosity overruled exhaustion. He clicked on the first file. Thirteen. The buzzing. That was the first thing he heard. Low and ragged, the burr of a malfunctioning servo motor, hundreds of them on the fritz at once. Next, a voice, close to the microphone. Test one, Wednesday the 13th of August, 5.13 p.m. Westlake's voice, keening, slightly nasal, the voice of a dead man. I noticed it just last night. Last night? I think so. Yes, yes. Time has a way of slipping through one's fingers down here. In the wall, eating through it, you might say, behind a box of equipment. This was why I missed it at first. The buzz settled. Westlake breathed heavily into the microphone. Ah, <sighs> hole. This is the best means of description, though that does not adequately describe the phenomenon. A hole, after all, is a, an emptiness, yes, this, on the other hand, the phenomenon is roughly two inches in diameter. I'd measure it to get its exact size, but it may be unwise to draw too near. It exudes a certain disturbance. A hole, Luke thought, in the station? Couldn't be. Insanity. Its surface is black, shimmery. I cannot discern whether it is simply lying atop the wall or whether an exterior influence something outside the station in the water has managed to eat its way through. Either way, it appears to be growing incrementally. Amazingly, it has not breached the structural integrity of the triest. I wouldn't be here to transcribe this, if so. Ambient noises, clickings, snappings. The bees do not seem troubled by it. In fact, they display great interest. They cluster at the edge of their containment unit facing the phenomenon, occasionally bashing their bodies against the glass. The other specimens, my lizards, display the opposite reaction. They huddle as far away from it as possible. I covered it with several long strips of duct tape. I have not alerted Doctors Nelson or Toy. They are occupied with their own labors, and this will sound foolish and doubtlessly unprofessional, but I don't want them interfering. Clayton, most especially. If he knew about this, he would swing his hammer of divine authority. Westlake's voice changed, became flinty, obsessive. This, this is mine, my discovery. A gulf of silence punctuated by Westlake's breathing. Then, ha, <laughs> listen to me, a covetous schoolboy hoarding my packet of candy. Good God, if the ethics committee could see me now. I imagine they would... Westlake's voice trailed off. His breathing grew heavier. Can you hear that? Is the microphone picking it up? Luke strained his ears. Nothing but that buzz and Westlake's ragged breaths. Sounds emanating from the phenomenon. I hear them. Feel them. There's a prickling sensation over my skin. How very bizarre. Silence. Can you hear them? Can you? Click. The file ended abruptly. Dreamily, his blood racing, Luke opened the next one. Test two. The buzz again, quite a bit louder now. The hole has doubled in size. Ceaselessly, the phenomenon chews into the wall. The bees, surely you can hear them. They are compelled by it. I let one out yesterday and it flew straight toward the hole, but it banked sharply away and settled on the wall a foot above. It made a few creeping attempts to approach this phenomenon, its antenna flickering, but it never drummed up the gumption. When it settled back on the lab equipment, I cupped it in my palm in order to return it to its hive mates. The little brute stung me. 
These are the most docile creatures I've ever dealt with. They were so tame I could almost sing them to sleep. Never once have I been stung without cause. I... I killed it, ground it to paste between my palms. I was in a rare rage. The buzz rose and fell rhythmically. The other specimens have expired. Every lizard, dead. They made it down here without issue, adjusting well to their new habitat. Then, yesterday, I awoke. I've been sleeping in the lab the last few nights to discover them all unmoving, their bodies stiff, strangely white. It was as if they'd been injected with liquefied chalk. I've never seen anything like this. I wondered for a moment if they could have died of fright. Surely they cannot feel emotions. The bees, however, are thriving. Their numbers seem to be increasing. Luke could hear Westlake fumbling around. A sharp click. Suddenly his voice was amplified, the sound of it much richer. I've hooked up the microphone. Hello? Hello? Good. It runs on a long cord. I'll attempt to feed the mic into, through, the hole. This sounds absurd. How could I push a microphone through a hole eaten into the wall of an undersea station? Were I even able to do so, where would it go? That I am unable to answer as yet. A series of staticky raps. The mic stretching against the weave of Westlake's clothes, Luke figured. I've hooked the microphone to a metal rod. I'll feed it through the hole from a safe distance. In all objectivity, the hole alarms me. It exerts a pull, not on one's body so much as the mind. I can only compare it to the sensation of some kind of, of claw, I suppose, sunk into the tissues of the brain. More noises as the microphone, clipped to the metal rod, bumped along the laboratory floor. Careful now. Careful. A series of harsh baps as the mic bumped up the wall. Luke could discern the exact moment it slipped through the hole. The resonance became watery, as if the mic had slid into a deep pool. But Westlake's voice remained clear. It's in. I've run a secondary audio channel to record my own commentary. Both my voice and whatever the microphone picks up should be clear. For a very long while, nothing. Only the liquid shifting as the microphone drifted in whatever lay beyond the hole. Then, a powerful knock, distant yet resonant. Hello? Westlake made a noise of his own, a chiding tisk, as if sickened at himself for thinking someone, some thing, might answer him. The noise came again, that faraway knock, and again, an even careful cadence. There was something knowing in it. Luke couldn't say why he felt that, yet he did. He broke out in a sweat, the clammy kind he associated with onrushing sickness, the maiden signs of the flu. The knock, watery but insistent. Again. Again. Is someone there? Knock. Who is it? Luke almost laughed at the inanity of Westlake's question, but the fearful quail of the man's voice stilled that impulse. The silence ran thick as a current. Then, knock. All right, let's try this. When I ask a question now, you may answer by knocking. One knock for yes, two knocks for no. Will that be acceptable? Knock. You understand? Knock. Well, good. Uh, very good. The excitement in Westlake's voice was palpable. Are you extraterrestrial? Knock. Knock. So you are of this planet? Knock. Knock. Are you friendly? No reply. Do you know what that means, friendly? Knock. How many of you are there? Knock once for only one, knock twice for more than one. Knock. Knock. Do you come in peace? No reply. 
Do you come to share information with us? To help? Knock. Do you know what is happening to us? Of the disease we've come down in search of a cure for? Knock. Can you help us? A gulf of silence. Do you know what that is? The substance we're here to study? Again, silence. The feathery sound of water swirling around the microphone. When next he spoke, Westlake's voice was tight. Do you wish us no harm? Sounds from the liquid rustling and shucking. Knock. Knock. What the hell does that mean? Luke asked himself. No, we wish you no harm, or no, we do wish you harm. I'll ask again, came Westlake's voice. Can you help us? We are... We may be dying, our species. Do you understand? Can you... A gnashing grind, the squeal of feedback. Jesus cr... Click. Fear crawled over the dome of Luke's skull. He was filled with a sense that he was hovering on the cusp of something as terrible as he'd ever known. New knowledge, facts he could live a thousand lifetimes without knowing. He could feel it pulsing against his skull, tapping at the plates of bone with an icy fingertip. He ached with the desire to hurl the laptop at the wall and smash it to pieces, but there was no way he could allow himself to do that. Heart thudding, he opened the third and final file. Test number immaterial. The day is immaterial. Time also immaterial. The buzz was incredibly loud now. Westlake's voice drifted hazily, sounding somehow untethered from his body. The phenomenon ate the microphone. Ate? <laughs> is there a better word than that? Something certainly yanked it through the hole. So, yes, ate. It happened so fast. I was lucky to salvage the laptop. A sucking sound, very close. A rapid suck -uck -uck. A wet pop. Was Westlake... Was he sucking his thumb like an infant? There has been no further contact, not in the prior established manner, I should say, but the hole has grown a great deal, I must say. The bees are now constantly agitated, and I... I hear things. Sometimes it's things being ripped. Other times they are noises like nothing I've ever heard. The buzzing of flies, this sounds quite different from the drone of the bees, somehow lower, and not only in register, it is the hum of a baser order of life, of stupid, witless, shit-colonizing flies. Occasionally, there is also a hammer and a crash of machinery. How the hell is that possible? And, and laughter? Yes, I do believe I heard that, too. A child's laughter. If it were not... Absurd to say so, I'd tell you it was that of my own daughter, Hannah. Westlake loosed a tortured laugh of his own. This is madness, of course. It's difficult to hear anything above the drone of the bees. I haven't stepped outside the lab in some time. Nelson and Toy would only interfere. They wouldn't understand. Their minds are too dense, too literal. Westlake's voice turned brittle. Luke could imagine him hunched in his lab, his body grown gnomish, his posture covetous as he hoarded his dark secret. And I... I don't want them to have it. This is all mine. More sucking. Luke pictured Westlake's thumb pink from the suction. I have to say this. Not long ago, when I was staring at the hole, it commands my attention, I'll tell you that. It changed, went opaque, is perhaps the word, like watery milk. Behind it, or through it, I saw shapes, indistinct but wonderful, like dark wings fluttering, an enormous space filled with this antic fluttering. 
The tone of Westlake's voice was off-putting. There was an uncomfortable echo of Alice's voice in it, the way she'd sounded after she'd been caught staring at Westlake's hatch. Whatever it is that I've discovered, it, they, can be communicated with, I am sure of it, reasoned with. They are here to help. I sense no hatred, only curiosity. Curiosity. The word stuck in Luke's brain like a quill. Somehow it seemed even more frightening than pure hatred. This is my final recording. I will continue to chart my progress in my journals. I am confident that what lies on the other side is beneficial. Are they the bringers of the ambrosia? If so, perhaps they will tell us how to harness its awesome power. I believe in this possibility, and I will endeavor to make it so. Click. Fourteen. Luke's arms were tensed, hard as marble. A concerted effort was needed to force his muscles to relax. He had to consider the possibility that none of this had happened, that Westlake had caught a malignant case of the sea sillies, that or a particularly baffling indicator of the gets. These files were no more than a manifestation of his creeping insanity. He'd imagined the whole goddamn thing. He'd isolated himself in his lab the same way a dying bear will crawl into the shadows of its cave. In his own sickness and delusion, Westlake had played make-believe, slave to the apparitions in his head. What had Luke heard, really? The buzz of bees, some scraping and scratching, a few knocks, knocks Westlake could have made himself, playing a game of call and answer with himself. What about the watery echo? Luke figured immersing the microphone in a glass of water would have the same effect. Disconcerted, Luke lay down. He was so damn tired. His body was physically shutting down, a power grid starved of electricity. He'd rest briefly, and upon waking, he'd take Westlake's laptop to Al and Clayton. They could listen to the files and decide what to make of them. He shut his eyes and tried to conjure Abby's face. Instead, a different scene. Abby and Luke in the bedroom of their shoebox apartment, back when they were graduate students. The heat lay thick inside the walls. The late summer warmth did something to Abby. Set her afire. She'd sat on the bed with that beguiling smile. She pulled his sweats down, then his fruit of the looms, with one finger, leaving them strung clumsily around his knees. Get closer, silly, she'd whispered. This isn't going to work unless we're pretty much touching, is it? Luke remembered being overtaken by the friendliness of it. Just a chummy blowjob, followed by some aw shucks sex. You know, the kind of thing pals do, friendly and practiced, Luke felt the tiniest ripple of concern about that. Just how had she gotten so damn practiced? But Luke had felt so overjoyed at the fact that your ideal lover could be your best friend, too. Then Abby's face changed. Her features went viscid, reshaping themselves into something dark and fearsome. Luke's eyes snapped open. He swore he could see a face at the portal now, peering in at him. Clay. No, Al. Then Westlake's tortured face from the vault. All three faces blurred together and became something else. They became Zachary's face, Luke's son as a tot. His boy was laughing. Was there anything more wonderful than a baby's laughter? Not now, though. This was menacing, too adult, full of cruel mocking. Luke couldn't look away as Zachary laughed with unhinged gasps, his face shading redder and redder, the same color it had been when he'd screamed with the millipede inside his sleeper, laughing at his father, laughing fit to bust a gut. Ha ha! They won't let you go, Daddy. They won't ever let you go. Part 4. Ambrosia one. Luke dreamed that he was sitting at his kitchen table back home in Iowa City. The sunlight prickled his arms as it streamed through the window above the sink. Distantly, through the open door, came the giddy shrieks of children at play. 
Zachary sat in his high chair. The sunlight glossed the downy hairs of his infant head. How's it going, buddy? Luke said, smiling. How you doing, Zach Attack? Zach smiled. His milk teeth had punched through his gums, these rounded slivers that looked like soft, pale cheese. He still had that new baby smell, too. Luke would press his nose to his son's scalp to inhale that fantastic scent. Ah, Mama, Zack said, his chin tilting proudly. Close, bud. Dada. Try that. I'm Dada. Ah, Mama. His son had been saying Mama for a month now. Mama and Ball and even Kitty. He'd never once said Dada. Gaga and Tata and Baba, oh yes, those syllables rolled merrily off his tongue. But not Dada, not once. He gripped his son's hands. Dada, Zach, say Dada. Tata. Luke's hands tightened. Dada. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Dada. Say it, boy, you fucking say it. Dada. Luke squeezed tighter, his son's bones pulsing in his grip. Ah, wawa! Tears leapt into Zack's eyes. Luke had been gripping his fingers so tightly that they turned white, the blood crushed out of them. Luke whistled tunelessly as he walked over to the fridge. He's hungry, boy, is him? Zack want his lunch? He took a bowl from the cupboard. There was a picture of a puppy on the bottom, Zack's favorite bowl. Luke opened the fridge. Zack continued to cry. Tears rolled down his face and splattered his bib. Luke rooted amid the tubs and bottles, still whistling. The jar his hand closed upon was warm. Why would it be warm in the fridge? He had to lever his fingernails under the jar's lid and dig them in. It felt like peeling off a massive scab. He slopped the container's contents into the puppy bowl, not really looking, smothering the puppy's grinning face with whatever it was. The bowl gave off a strange heat, as if he'd just taken it from the microwave. He grabbed a spoon and sat next to his son. Zachary's tears had dried up. He stared at the bowl with mingled hunger and revulsion. Who the hungry baby? Here's some lunchy lunchy for the fussy Zach. Luke dipped the spoon into the bowl. It made a gross, squishy sound, like a shovel sunk into a pile of rotten seaweed. He brought the spoon to Zack's mouth. His son's eyes reflected whatever was in the spoon. Its shifting scintilla reminded Luke of embers glittering in a campfire. Zack began to scream, a high, hopeless sound. Luke prodded the spoon into his mouth harshly. Just eat, please, shutting those goddamn screams up. Zack's eyes widened, so huge they seemed to consume all the sunlight in the kitchen. His mouth worked against whatever Luke had shoved into it, lips quivering in a futile effort to spit it out, but his gorge flexed automatically, he swallowed, and when his mouth opened again, it was to scream. But not with pain, with hunger. Is it good, Zacky? Is it tasty in the belly? Open wide, here comes the airplane. The spoon dipped and loop-de-looped, -de delivering its payload into Zack's screaming mouth. His lips were coated in a glutinous gloss. He's a hungry boy, is it? Mm? Nom, nom, nom. His son swallowed and opened his mouth again, screaming even louder now. A fine wire of unease corkscrewed into Luke's chest. The ambient sounds and scents, previously comforting, had changed. The sweet smell of the backyard lilac had become a rancid foulness you might catch downwind of an open sewer. The sounds of children at play had become fear-struck shrieks, as if those children were being pursued by monsters intent on ripping them limb from limb. He continued to feed Zack. Strangely, the bowl never seemed to empty. His son's stomach strained against his bright blue onesie. Zack's cries intensified, louder and more demanding. His mouth stretched, the flesh loosening as it puckered into a suckerfish orifice. A carp. Luke thought with distant horror. He's growing a carp's mouth. The force of Zachary's shrieks caused the papery flesh of his new mouth to flutter like a flag in a high breeze. Luke tried to wrench his gaze downward to see what he'd been feeding his precious son, whose every morsel had always been carefully scrutinized. 
Abby would spend hours at the supermarket reading labels on the baby food jars and buying organic produce to mulch in the baby bullet. With aching slowness, Luke's neck finally gave out, his skull wrenching painfully downward. His breath caught with an agonized hitch. Oh, 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 was all he could think, his mind skipping like a stone on the still surface of a lake. Oh, 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 oh. The bowl was full of ambrosia. Almost gone now, just a few pulpy balls stuck to the sides. The puppy's face was gone, too. It had been erased. All that remained was a brownish smear, as if the ambrosia had eaten its face away. Don't feed him another bite. Throw the bowl away now. Stick your finger down his throat and make him vomit up all that he can. Take him to the hospital and get the doctors to pump his stomach. Get it out of him, Luke. Christ, get it out! But in that awful way nightmares have, he scraped the sides of the bowl, collecting the remaining ambrosia into a tiny dollop. It sat on the spoon, tumor-like, heaving slightly as if breathing. Zachary issued a string of gibbering hiccups. He bucked in his high chair, his engorged stomach rattling the feeding tray. Dada! He screamed, the sound of a nail pulled from a sun-bleached plank of wood. Dada! Dada! Shh, Luke said. Eat all you like. You can never have enough. Luke stabbed the spoon into his son's mouth. Zack's lips closed over it triumphantly, sucking every last speck off of it. He stared at his father with a feral, too old expression. Ancient hate radiated from his dead, gray eyes. He opened his mouth again, screaming, screaming. There's nothing left, Luke said, holding up the bowl, which had melted entirely now, a gummy mess running down his fingers, burning slightly as something worked under his flesh. Zack vented maddening, lung-rupturing shrieks in response. His strange new mouth stretched wider, wider. Luke saw something in there. Oh, God. Oh, good God, no. A dozen or more eyeballs stared at Luke from inside Zachary's mouth. They nested in the soft pink flesh of his palate and throat, staring unblinkingly, appraising Luke with cold scrutiny. We all have different sets of eyes, my son. His mother's voice. Very different, but very lovely, Lucas. You only have to let them out. Like I said, I'd gladly do for stupid Brewster Galt. Let them out to see the world. The eyes in Zack's mouth blinked in unison. A dozen lewd winks. They made an awful pipping noise as the inflamed flesh inside Zack's mouth clipped shut for an instant, like the edges of a fresh wound making contact. Luke scooped his son out of the high chair and into his arms. Zack's body had a sick, pendulous weight. His cheeks showed deep dents as they sucked greedily at the air. He kept screaming through his suckerfish mouth, bathing Luke's face with noxious breath. The mouth eyes stared at him balefully. Luke rocked him as he'd done every night since Zack was born. Hush a baby. Hush a hush a sleep now. Sometimes, when Zack was overtired, Luke would hold his eyelids shut, very gently, rolling Zack's eyelids down and keeping them shut with gentle pressure from his fingertips. He did so now. Zack's eyelids strained as the muscles trembled under Luke's fingertips, much like flies buzzing under saran wrap. Luke pushed a little harder. Keep those eyes closed, my beautiful boy, please. Zack's screams only intensified. The eyes inside his mouth rotated madly in their cups of flesh. The skin of Zack's chin and cheeks and forehead was developing red, throbbing cysts, and Luke knew eyes would soon be sprouting there, too. Luke felt around in Zack's eyes just a little. Gray fluid, the consistency of model glue, squished between the eyelids. Shh, now, sleep. What's there to see? Nothing good. His son's face was cracking open in a dozen places. Luke peered at these new eyes, each one offering a hateful, shriveling stare. Luke's fingers sunk into Zack's eye sockets to the second knuckle. 
promptly punched into a pocket of curdled sludge that reminded him of the congealed porridge his mother used to eat. There came a hissing sound, but from where, Luke couldn't tell. Stinking fluid, the cover of molten lead, bubbled up from Zachary's sockets. Luke pushed until the webbing between his fingers touched the bridge of his son's nose. Zach's flesh offered no resistance. Luke's fingertips passed through the grooved tangerine of Zach's brain to touch the inner swell of his skull. It'll be over soon, he whispered, hoping his son could hear. I'm so sorry. The fontanelle on the top of Zach's head pulsed ominously, as if something underneath was struggling to free itself. Luke stared, trapped in the calm eye of his dread, as his son's scalp split in a bloodless trench. Something pushed through the squandered flesh, horrid and spiky and flecked with white curds, and turned in Luke's direction, staring not with eyes, but with a sense of merciless curiosity mingled with furious intent. Two. Luke struggled out of sleep like a man crawling out of a mine shaft. Gummy strings of the nightmare clung to his brain. He heard Zachary screaming somewhere as the dream continued to unravel. Luke reached for his lost son, but his fingers closed on empty air. Luke's brain felt unattached to his senses, the way it often felt following a bad dream. He blinked and stared around Westlake's quarters. The hatch was open. Just a hair. Four small appendages were wrapped around the edge of the hatchway. A child's fingers. Luke saw them. Then he didn't. They had slipped away. Next came a series of excitable, clumsy footsteps trailing down the tunnel. His son's name passed over his lips before he could choke it down. Zack? Laughter bubbled up the tunnel. The sound grew fainter, threatening to vanish. Luke rolled off the cot and shoved the hatch open. Zack? That champagne bubble laughter flooded the dim tunnel in reply, the kind of laughter Zack used to make when Luke hefted him under the arms and lobbed him into the air, catching him deftly as he came down. This is not happening, chirped a voice in Luke's head. Your son isn't down here. You know that, Luke, in your heart, in your head. But he didn't, really. That was the thing. Zack was everywhere, anywhere. That's what tore you apart. Unthinkingly, Luke followed the laughter. The tunnel seemed to heave like an enormous pair of lungs, the walls constricting before expanding again, just a trick of the light. He stumbled forward heedlessly, borne on a bubbly foam of anxiety. Luke felt his boots sinking into the floor as if into some sort of weird, metallic mud. He felt it sucking at his feet, a disturbing sensation, and told himself it wasn't actually happening. His mind was playing a funny trick, was all. Ha, ha, real funny. Thanks, brain, you have a great sense of comedic timing. He glanced around in an attempt to moor himself. He noticed a string of pipes jutting upward along the wall like the flutes on a church organ, their curves winking dull bronze in the dim. A rhythmic churn emanated from behind the walls, the sound of motors pounding without cease in the center of the earth. Ahead of him, in the darkness, something moved. Who's there? Luke said, the tendons cabled down his neck. No answer, only the watery echo of his voice. There, air, air. When it faded, Luke heard, or was certain he'd heard, the low rustle of breathing. He stood in the tunnel dark, the hairs quilling on his forearms. That rustling did not come again. He was set to reject it as a figment, figmen, of his imagination, conjured by the terrible pressure of this place. A shape coalesced where his eyes were trained. He saw a pair of pajamas. Oh, so familiar. They were Zachary's favorites, his PJs, Abby used to call them. Zach, it's bedtime, get into your PJs with a pattern of fire trucks and police cars, signifiers of law, order, and safety from harm. Small hands and feet jutted from the sleeves and leg holes, shining whitely in the gloom. He could not see a face. The air above the neckline was dark and empty. The headless pajamas turned, a coy movement that seemed to say, Follow me, follow me, 
and scampered down the tunnel. Luke obeyed the directive. The floor sucked greedily at his boots. The metal flowed over his ankles as his feet sunk into the chilly muck at the bottom of the sea. Darkness closed in behind him, deeper and deeper shades. Zachary's laughter peeled off the walls and rebounded all around Luke. Zach, hold on, please, stop. Zach slipped around a bend in the tunnel up ahead. Luke let out a strangled cry. No, 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 not again, please, not again. He tried to run, but his boots were mired, making every step an ordeal. He finally rounded the turn, only to see he'd reached a dead end. The blackness was absolute. It was no different than staring down a mine shaft. Three words were written on the wall in wet letters. Instinctively, Luke knew they were written in blood. Daddy, come home. Something tugged on his sleeve. A small hand, four small fingers gripping his overalls. He didn't want to look. He didn't want to see his headless son or something far more horrible. He tried to jerk his arm away, but the tugging was insistent. Look at me, Daddy. Look! No, Luke thought. I don't want to. You're not my son. Oh, but I am. I'm your little Zack attack, right here in the flesh. The voice was not that of his son. It belonged to something ineffably older, more calculating, and worse beyond anything Luke could imagine. A terrific jerk on his arm now. You fucking look at me now! Luke snatched his arm back. He overbalanced and fell, hammering his skull on the wall, and came to slumped against the tunnel. The overhead lights burned. L.B. stood a few feet away, eyeing him with a canine version of concern. His sleeve was wet with her slobber. His son was gone. He'd never been here, of course. There was no dead end, no bloody words on the wall. He'd dreamed it all. Of course he had. He thought he'd woken from a nightmare only now to discover that the nightmare hadn't yet finished. And yet he'd left Westlake's room. He'd opened the hatch, never waking, and walked down the tunnel. He'd sleepwalked? Bullshit. He'd never done that in his life. L.B. must have followed him, then tugged on his sleeve to wake him up. Sleepwalked. Just like Clayton might have been sleepwalking when he sent that transmission to the surface. Happens a lot on submarines, Al's voice chimed in his head. Guys who never had the habit before, your brainwaves go a bit buggy. Thanks, girl, Luke said. You beat an alarm clock all to hell. L.B. chuffed as though to say, No problem, boss, just doing my job. Luke returned to Westlake's quarters, then caught noise from the main lab. He followed it, craving any kind of companionship. L.B. tagged along at his heels. It was Clayton. He was leaning against the lab bench, his head lowered. He seemed disoriented discombobulated, as her mother might have said. He had the look of a man who'd been kicked awake with a pointy-toed shoe. You okay? Luke asked. What? Clayton's face swiftly recomposed into its regular withering expression. Yes, why wouldn't I be? Clay, I just had the strangest dream. His brother said, Yes, they can be incredibly vivid down here. Luke decided to speak no further about it, the dream about Zachary eating ambrosia. After all, Clayton, wonderful sibling that he was, hadn't even contacted Luke when Zach had gone missing. Not a phone call, not an email, nothing. Complete radio silence. Maybe he hadn't known what to say, or perhaps he hadn't even known Zach had gone missing, or worse, and probably more accurately, he hadn't cared. He'd never even met Zach, or Abby, for that matter. Clayton hadn't responded to the RSVP for their wedding or Zack's first birthday party. No cards, no gifts. What else should Luke have expected, anyway? It was fine, as far as Luke had been concerned. Better that Clayton exist distantly, his brother, the brilliant scientist. On a primal level, Luke hadn't wanted Clayton's presence wafting through the lives of the people he loved. Clayton, do you think it might be a good idea to get out of here for a while? Take a powder? Head up to the surface to clear your head? Luke wasn't about to mention his sleepwalking incident either. 
or Westlake's audio files. Not yet. He couldn't face Clayton's sneering scorn, not without Al here to back him up, at least. You can do whatever you want, Lucas, his brother said. You shouldn't even be here. But I can't leave. Why not? But Luke already knew the answer. The triest was at the seat of the unknown, and his obsessive brother wasn't about to abandon his attempt to unlock its secrets. Fine, he said, setting it aside for now. Where's Alice? She's getting some sleep, Clayton cocked his head. In the meantime, would you like to see what I've discovered? Now that you're here. Clayton clearly wanted to show Luke. Childishly, part of Luke wanted to give his older brother what Abby used to call the RFU, the Royal Fuck You. Nah, not interested, Clay. Sounds pretty boring, to be honest. Hey, you got a TV in this joint? You get decent reception down here? More crucially, did Luke really want to see? He'd witnessed Clayton's blooper reel before, a mouse with a collapsed nose on its back for one. Luke's skin crawled at the thought of what his brother had been up to down here, where the light never shone. But of course, Luke did want to see. If anyone could figure out how to harness the ambrosia, his brother was that man. Alice's voice floated to them from another part of the station. She sounded vaguely fearful. Luke? she called out. Hey, Luke? Hurry up, Clayton said, shepherding Luke into his lab. W wait, what about Al? Clayton shook his head. Luke hesitated as Clay punched a code on the keypad. Family only. You have eight seconds to get inside, Lucas. Then it locks automatically. Luke didn't move. Eight. Seven. Clay's jaw tensed. Six. Luke said, The dog comes with me. It does not. No dogs allowed, said Clayton. It was Luke's turn to cock his head at his brother. He knew Clayton wanted to show him. Otherwise, he'd never have offered. Alice's voice drew nearer. Luke? Three, two, fine, get in, both of you. Clayton snapped, relenting. Quickly. Luke gripped Elby's collar. She backpedaled, fighting him. What's the matter, girl? It's okay. Really? Was it? Luke picked her up. LB tucked her head into his throat the way Zack used to before falling asleep. One. Three. The lock engaged with a hiss. Clayton draped a blanket over a hook above the portal, shielding them from the main lab. Clay's lab was a cube, yet its walls didn't meet at right angles. Instead, they bellied outward to maintain the triest's egg-based physics. A cot in one corner. Clayton must also sleep in here, Luke figured. Westlake took the sleeping in his lab, too, he recalled. He wanted to be close to the hole. His hole. Luke set the dog down, but she remained zippered to his side. Her eyes rolled in their sockets. She was clearly afraid, but Luke couldn't pinpoint any immediate cause. A terrarium and a cage housing a pair of guinea pigs sat against one wall. Beside those rested a pair of larger cages, dog crates, one of which had surely held L.B. Where's the other one? Luke wondered. Where's Little Fly? A stainless steel lab bench occupied the middle of the room. Luke could see where it had been riveted together, as a bench that size would have been brought down here in sections. A large poster of Albert Einstein, that famous shot with his tongue sticking out, was hung on the wall directly behind the bench. The quote read, If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. I didn't know you were a fan, Luke said. It's good to visualize your competition. Clay smiled. You will laugh at this, Lucas, but sometimes I talk to Albert. If I've been working long enough, sometimes he'll talk back. A squat white box sat along the near wall. Clayton opened its lid. Plumes of vapor billowed out. He reached inside, whistling absentmindedly. Clayton used to whistle or even sing in his basement lab all the time. The notes would drift up the staircase into the kitchen. The most inane melodies, the theme to Gilligan's Island or even Whistle While You Work, except Clayton used to screw with the lyrics. Whistle while you work, Hitler was a jerk, Mussolini bit his weenie, and now it doesn't work. Clayton shut the cooler, but not before Luke noticed a squared-off shape wrapped in black plastic. 
It looked a bit like a butchered hog loin, though Luke knew it wouldn't be that. Don't be alarmed, Clayton said, placing a guinea pig on the lab bench. The animal was frozen stiff, glittering with frost. Luke wasn't alarmed at all. As a veterinarian in the Midwest, he'd seen plenty of frozen animals. How did it die? Luke asked. Or is that important to your scientific query? The guinea pig tipped onto its side, its legs jutting up at the ceiling. LB edged to the lip of the table, snuffling with keen interest. Clayton swatted at her. The dog flinched away in fear. Luke reached out and snatched his brother's wrist. He felt the live wire twitch of Clayton's tendons. He also noted that Clay's fingers were now bandaged to the second joint, swaddled under thick gauze. Not very nice, Luke tisked. Do you treat all your guests that way? Clayton offered a grave digger's smile. The guinea pig was melting out of its icy encasement. A small pool of water had already formed around it. Whoop it! Luke craned his head around. Where had that noise come from? A dripping tap? They wouldn't have running water down here, would they? The sound stirred a memory, yet Luke couldn't lay his finger on it. Wait a second. The guinea pig's leg, had it twitched? LB spun in an agitated circle, whining pitifully. The guinea pig's leg twitched again, obviously, this time. Clay, Luke said. What's it doing? What's that dead thing doing? Who said it was dead, brother dear? It had to be dead. The laws of nature dictated as much. Some creatures could be frozen for a short period and be reanimated. Flies, crickets, not warm-blooded animals of an elevated biological genus. And yet, the guinea pig's sides began to heave as it took the smallest breaths. This is not happening, Luke thought. It's not possible. The coating of ice over the guinea pig's face melted. Its eyeballs were vibrantly red, the color of blood leaping from a torn vein. It flipped to its feet and trundled awkwardly over the lab bench. Clayton picked it up and offered it to his brother. Luke was beset with a profound revulsion. Why? There was nothing obviously the matter with it, other than the fact it had just come back from the dead. A perfectly ordinary guinea pig shivering in his brother's cupped palms. Don't you touch it, Luke said the voice of caution. It's diseased. It'll infect you. It doesn't even have to bite you. Touching it will be enough. It's a little bitty fluffy wuffy guinea pig, Clay said. I take it you're afraid. Luke's jaw tightened. He held his hands out and Clay gave it to him. God, it felt awful, like holding a throbbing bezoar, a tumorous hairball, one of which he'd removed from the stomach of a narcotized leopard at the Des Moines Zoo. The creature just sat there in his palms, its pert nose twitching. An odd notion came into Luke's mind. It was trying to look cute, the same way a calculating child could become doe-eyed and saccharine when there was something to gain from it. Its teeth, old man teeth, the nicotine-stained teeth of three-packs-a-day smoker, clashed like tusks in the wet hole of its mouth. Clayton opened the cage. Put it inside. Luke did so with great relief. The other two guinea pigs, both quite small, avoided the unfrozen one, burrowing into the cedar shavings and squeaking in consternation. How? Oh, come now, said Clayton. You've spoken to Fells, haven't you? So you know perfectly well how. He retrieved a kit from beneath the table. Luke had used the same kit thousands of times. Inside, you'd find two syringes and a vial of euthasol. An EK, extinction kit, as it was known in the veterinarian biz. Clayton unwrapped a hypo and affixed the needle. He extracted 2.5 cc's of euthasol, enough to flatline a Great Dane. Agitated squeaks broke out inside the cage. The unfrozen guinea pig was now attacking the other two. It lunged at the sensitive webbing of the much smaller guinea pig's legs, hamstringing it. The third guinea pig clambered up the cage to hang in screeching, stupid shock from the upper bars. The unfrozen one flipped the small one over. Its head darted between the small pig's legs, teeth gnashing at the poor thing's exposed privates. Its victim shrieked in terror and pain. LB advanced on the cage with a growl building in her throat. 
Keep that damn thing away, Clayton said, pulling on a pair of vulcanized rubber gloves. Luke gripped LB by the scruff. Clayton reached into the cage and vised his fingers around the zombified, except that it wasn't really the case, was it? Guinea pig. It squealed as he pulled it off the smaller one. Luke caught a glimpse of the victim's shredded sex organs and blanched. Clayton pinned the guinea pig to the table. Its face was a mask of blood, its head whipping in crazed paroxysms. The needle, he grunted. Luke handed it over. He wasn't about to question his brother. He'd just as soon protest Clayton driving a stake through a vampire's black heart. An ungodly shriek bubbled out of the guinea pig's throat. It bit Clayton's glove and tore a groove out of the rubber. It shouldn't be capable of that. Luke was gobsmacked. A pit bull would have a hard time biting through those gloves. Clayton sank the needle into the guinea pig's flank. The needle bent. Jesus Christ, it actually bent, as though Clayton stabbed it into a car door. Clay jabbed again, and the needle snapped with a singing tink, the spike of metal spinning through the air. Luke's mind was reeling, but his brother remained calm, calm-ish. Greasy balls of sweat dotted his brow, but whether that was from dread or exertion, Luke couldn't tell. Luke's own body was bathed in sticky heat that radiated up from the balls of his feet, panic ghosting through the ventricles of his heart. Screw on the other needle tip for me, would you? Clayton said. Luke did so, an action he'd completed thousands of times, thank God, his fingers working instinctively. Clayton flipped the bleeding creature onto its back, located its rectum, and stabbed with the needle. It sank in deeply, the guinea pig hissing like a cockroach as Clayton depressed the plunger. Clayton injected the full 2.5 cc's. Luke thought of telling him to save some for the guinea pig with the bloodied privates, but right now he just wanted this big bastard dead. The guinea pig's body relaxed. Clayton quickly ducked under the lab bench and came up with what looked like a pair of sterling silver bolt cutters. They were Bethune surgical rib shears, an instrument used for splitting the cartilage between human ribs during open-heart surgery. Clayton was singing now, a familiar children's song sung in a toneless, dial-tone voice. The itsy-bitsy spider went up the water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. He brought the shears down. The blades formed an inverted V around the guinea pig's neck. The hell are you doing, Clay? Look closely. Clayton's eyes glittered. Part its hair so you can see the flesh. Luke didn't want to touch the thing again, but curiosity overrode his squeamishness. The guinea pig's fur was stiff, like the bristles of a dirty broom, the flesh under it pink and oily. Its body pumped off the noxious warmth of a compost heap. Do you see it? said Clayton. That shine? Its skin held the barest scintilla, as though dusted with powdered diamonds. It's the ambrosia, said Clayton. Is it leaking out of its body? I don't think it was ever inside its body. I think it covers bodies in the thinnest skein, so thin it would take electron magnification to spot it. Think of a spider's web. It doesn't take much pure matter at all. An ounce of ambrosia stretched into skeins could cover the entire population of our home city. Luke couldn't help but picture it. The citizens of Iowa City covered in downy threads of ambrosia, finer than baby hair, unnoticeable to the naked eye, but coiling deep into their bodies, fastening around their organs and bones. Everybody shimmered in the sunlight, their bodies a glitter. It might send roots inside. Clayton wiped the feverish sweat collecting above his lip. Roots so slender that they can slip between molecules of flesh and blood, so small they can even twine around atoms. Think about it. Floop. A dripping sound again, coming from somewhere inside the lab. That old childhood memory Luke's mind had been chasing entombed itself in his skull with a concussive thump. Four. The standing pipe on Old Langtree Road in Iowa City. A concrete tunnel with a grate over its mouth to prevent idiot kids from clambering into its damp, moss-crusted darkness. An overflow pipe. When the river rose, excess water jetted out of it to saturate the floodplain. But the river could go months at low ebb, 
meaning that the area ringing the pipe was most often a stagnant swamp that on high August days smelled like a pile of mildewed gym trunks. Clayton visited the swamp often as its microclimate hosted prized specimens. Unsurprisingly, he favored the most disgusting life forms. If its body had the texture of a snot-filled bath bead, chances were that Clayton wanted it. Sometimes he'd let Luke tag along, needing an extra pair of hands. One long-ago summer day, the young brothers had arrived at dusk, when the coolness brought the best specimens out of their hidey holes. Luke never visited the standing pipe alone, its wide, cavernous mouth jutting out of the gray caliche, which reminded him disconcertingly of elephant skin, sent an unpleasant shiver down his arms. The pipe's interior was hung with rotting strands of moss that dangled down in stiff stalactites. Sunlight couldn't penetrate it more than a few feet. After that, it turned grainy, the shadows swimming with clever movements. It was stupid to think. It was just a tunnel. Sure, it was dangerous. You wouldn't want to squeeze past the grate and walk down it. Not because there was something waiting for you in its gloomy guts, but because you could trip and fall and bust your fool skull wide open, as Luke's mother was apt to say. By the time the boys reached the pipe that day, the surrounding swampland was hovering with shadows. The inverted bells of the carnivorous pitcher plants lay bronzed in the dying sun. The creatures that had lain dormant during the day were slithering and spidering from their resting places. Clayton forged into the swamp in a pair of hip waders, sending up a swarm of noceums. Luke's sweatpants, he couldn't bear waiting for the bug-infested swamp bare-legged, were soaked to his crotch. The fluffy tops of cotton grass poking out of the swamp reminded Luke of Peter Cottontail the bunny, which led him to envision the grass wads hiding a thousand drowned rabbits submerged in the brown muck with their tails sticking out of the water. The brothers reached the mouth of the pipe. A new moon glossed its concrete lips, a silver O enclosing a solid pool of darkness. Clustered along the pipe were translucent, vein-strung sacks, each roughly the size of an oxblood marble. They were arranged in gooey clusters, bunches of albino grapes or mutant fly eggs. They're hatching, Clayton said. Perfect. The sacks were breaking open to disgorge tallowy creatures with flagellate tails. They squiggled to the edge of the pipe and... Wallop! Dropped into the water. Pollywogs are interesting creatures, Clayton remarked. No other amphibian undergoes such a massive change as it becomes an adult. Humans have a few more bones as babies, which fuse together as we grow, but we don't grow new arms or legs or lose any part of our bodies as we mature. Humans, he said with something approaching sadness, are boring. Luke always felt unbelievably grateful for these moments when his brother treated him like a human being. In such moments, Clayton seemed most like a human being himself, full of childlike wonder. The mama bullfrogs croaked in protest as Clayton dragged a net and deposited pollywogs into the bucket Luke had brought. Luke heard something from inside the pipe, a sound that vibrated the sensitive hairs of his ear canal. It came again, a gelatinous sliding, like something coughed up from a kitchen drain. And what was the pipe, anyway, if not a drain? A huge, long drain. It stood to reason that the things coughed out of a pipe that size would be massive as well. Ghostly spiders scuttled up the back of Luke's neck, his mouth filled with a dry wash of horror, the taste of mothballs covered in a choking film of dust. The swamp stilled. The bullfrogs stopped croaking. Even the insects seemed to stop buzzing. Only the sucking, slurping sound coming from the pipe. The sound or its maker, was drawing nearer in a stealthy kind of way, but not too stealthy. Maybe it wanted to be heard. The sucking sound was joined by an icy clickety-click, reminiscent of cockroaches scuttling behind water-fattened drywall, or ragged claws dragged along mossy concrete. The pipe's mouth was covered with a checkerboard rebar grate to keep stupid kids out. Because kids were stupid sometimes, even the smart ones like Clayton. They would come to an isolated swamp past dark, say, to collect pollywogs, far from the reliable street-lit world. Hell, they may as well be on another planet. They could disappear and nobody would even know until morning. It was tragic, but it happened all the time. 
Even a smart kid had to be stupid only that one time. Clayton's jaw was clenched tight, his eyes fixed above the tunnel's mouth as if he couldn't quite bear to stare directly into it. The sound came again, closer now, a choked and mocking gurgle, an enormous mouth laughing around a wad of rotting meat. Pollywogs fluttered against Luke's sweatpants as they flicked past, racing away. He wished he could shrink somehow, become as small and insignificant as they were, and flee with them. He wished he had a minuscule and idiotic pollywog brain because his own was an inferno of fearful images and possibilities. The great will stop it. It stopped dumb kids from getting in, and it will stop anything else from getting out. But Luke knew this wasn't true. Whatever it was, and he understood in his lizard brain cortex that it was something real bad. It could snap the grate like matchsticks, or else ooze through the metal latticework like cancerous black taffy. The brothers backed away slowly, the way you might from a slumbering bear. Clayton's breath came in a flighty whistle like the whinny of a horse. Luke averted his eyes, didn't dare look at the pipe. If he only heard but didn't see it, it wasn't real. The sounds could be anything, the gurgle of sludgy water over ancient bottles and cans, or even over the water-bleached skeletons of drowned animals. But if you saw it, made eye contact with it. Their heels hit the dry wash. Once that happened, the boys turned and clawed up the pebbly incline, abandoning the bucket and net, hitting the moon-glossed road and running as fast as their legs could carry them. Some reckless urge made Luke glance back over his shoulder, only once and only for a second. He saw something. He would swear to it. Something moving. A hand? No, not exactly. It was too elongated to be human. The fingers were twice as long as any he'd ever seen, the digits thin and witchy. Each finger was tipped with a cruel sickle that trapped the moonlight along its curve. This enormous hand ticked delicately along the rusted rebar, back and forth, back and forth, as if plucking notes on an instrument, a soft and beckoning gesture. Come back, Lucas. Come back. Bring your brother, too. Three is never a crowd. We'll have all the time in the world. God help him, Luke felt himself turn around. His hip, gripped by a compulsion he couldn't fight, wrenched back. His feet would follow shortly, surely as two follows one. Then Clayton jerked Luke's arm so hard that it almost tore out of its socket. Come morning, the flesh of his collarbone would be a sullen model of bruises. No. Don't, was all Clay said. His neck was flexed taut, as if he were fighting an insistent pair of hands that were trying to wrench his gaze back to the pipe. Don't look. They turned and ran until their lungs burned, until the standing pipe and its noises were well behind them. The next morning, Luke wouldn't believe what he'd seen. It had been a trick of the moonlight, nothing more. But he never did return to the pipe. Neither did Clayton, who struck up a deal with the local pet shop owner to buy mice at a bulk discount, which he claimed were better specimens anyway. Five. The sound broke Luke out of his reverie, except they had begun to feel less like reveries than waking dreams. Lacuna was the term that leapt out at him, an old Latin word that meant an empty space, a missing part, a gap. His mind seemed to slip into those gaps much easier down here. Since he boarded the Challenger, he'd been tumbling into and out of these old memories. His past, trapped within these dream pools, kept reaching out and pulling him into their murky depths. Now he was back in his brother's lab, where Clayton still held a pair of shears to that awful guinea pig's throat the sound coming from somewhere inside the lab. Thup. It was almost the same sound those pollywogs had made falling into the swamp when they were boys. Before Luke could figure out what was making that noise, the guinea pig's leg twitched. Impossible. Clayton had injected it with enough youth assault to stop a full-grown man's heart. There was no way it could come back from... Its front legs stiffened. Its lungs inhaled reflexively. It unleashed a hellish squeal that sounded shockingly like the shriek of an infant, 
Its eyes burned, twin embers socked into the white fur of its face. It lunged. Clayton brought the shears together. Shk! The sound was that of a bolt cutter snapping a brass master lock off a school locker. Luke's eyes widened as the guinea pig's head was snipped neatly off its neck. No blood at first, not a drop. The flesh and tendon and bone were clearly visible down the face of each wound, both head stump and neck stump. It was like sawing a tree in half. None of this makes any sense, Luke thought stupidly. None of this can actually be happening. Clayton pulled the guinea pig's body and head apart, separating them by a foot. Belatedly, blood began to leak from its neck in thick strings that spread across the bench like fingers. Blood tentacles, was Luke's thought. These tentacles crept toward the guinea pig's body, which was releasing tentacles of its own. They merged in the middle of the bench. L.B. whined and buried her head against Luke's thigh. The tentacles began to constrict. With aching slowness, the split halves of the guinea pig began to inch back toward each other. They're trying to reattach. They want to make the guinea pig whole again. Watching this, a small but essential part of Luke's mind untethered itself from the hole. Luke actually heard it, a cartilaginous thock, like a drumstick wrenched off a Thanksgiving turkey. He felt it go to a physical sensation that he could liken only to a lifeboat setting off from a sinking ship, taking some vital cargo with it. The guinea pig's sundered halves drew closer. The blood tentacles sucked and squirmed. What would happen once the halves had linked up? Stop it, Clay. Please, just stop it. Clayton retrieved a plastic container with a snap-top lid. He put the gloves back on, grabbed a scalpel, and slit the bloody weddings. Luke heard a snake-like hiss as the blade severed the crimson tentacles. Clayton picked up the guinea pig's head gingerly, still trailing ribbons of blood, and set it inside the container. He snapped on the lid and left the box on the bench. The tentacles from the guinea pig's body crept over the container, investigating, it would seem, sniffing it like a lonely hound at a porch door. They actually climbed the plastic and poked along the seal. Their progress stymied, the tentacles sagged. A few moments later, they surrendered their shape and collected into a pool of plasma. The guinea pig's headless body relaxed, evacuating its contents in a stinking gout. A tiny speck of ambrosia gathered on the guinea pig's foot. Clayton lifted the ambrosia on the scalpel's edge and crossed to the cage. The guinea pig with the torn privates lay in a pile of bloodied cedar shavings, Clayton set the scalpel near its head. The ambrosia rolled off onto the wounded creature's ear, then vanished. The guinea pig bleated and went rigid. Then it rolled over and scampered to the running wheel. It began to race as fast as its stubby legs would carry it, tearing around and around and around like a mad dervish. Clayton reached in and withdrew it from the cage. He showed Luke its sex organs. They were whole and for all Luke knew, functional. This is madness, utter madness. No, Clayton said. It only looks like madness. You don't know what you're seeing. Clayton carried the guinea pig to the cooler. Lifting the lid, he set the creature inside. Luke didn't protest this treatment, putting a live animal in deep freeze. Was that thing really alive anymore? What use is it? Luke had to ask. This ambrosia, look at what it does, Clay. It perverted that animal. Am I wrong? That guinea pig was savage. There was something demonic about it, was the thought his mind spat out. He'd felt the creature's awfulness in his hands, the clammy grossness of its body. There could be any number of reasons why it acted that way, Clayton said. Firstly, it likely had no conception of what was being done to it being done to it. Interesting choice of words, brother of mine. So let me ask you, do you know what was being done to it? I'm beginning to understand, yes. There may be pain or trauma associated with the assimilation. The ambrosia may trigger certain psychotropic side effects, leading to heightened aggression. 
My God, Clay, do you realize what you're saying? This substance you're studying won't allow a creature to die. Not by freezing it, not by pumping it with a lethal dose, not by hacking its fucking head off. There has to be some other intelligence at work here. I don't mean some take-me-to-your-leader shit, just something we can't possibly understand. The way that blood moved, it was smart. It had a purpose. Clayton's expression didn't indicate that he felt the same horror Luke did. Rather, it seemed that the prospect of a purposeful intellect excited him immensely. How can you know it won't function the same way when used on a human being, said Luke, that it won't turn people into raving maniacs? There's only one answer to that, Lucas. We don't know how it will work because we haven't tried it on a human subject yet. Yet. Dear God. Clay, think. What about Westlake? What about him? Clayton said, eyebrows innocently raised. You've calculated this angle already, said Luke. You realize Westlake must have come in contact with the Ambrosia. I think, a grudging nod. Yes, that's likely accurate. He must have abandoned the necessary precautions. He forgot the risks. Or the fucking stuff crawled inside his head, Luke thought wildly, or else... Clay, what if he purposely brought it into contact with himself, not an accident or a goof-up, said Luke. What if he smeared it on himself, or swallowed it, or some other goddamn thing? What if he let himself be assimilated, as you put it? Luke suddenly wanted to tell his brother about the dream he'd had. He wanted to spill his guts about the giant millipede that, for a span of pulseless seconds, he'd been absolutely sure was stalking him down that darkened storage tunnel. He wanted to let Clayton know that these depths exerted a breed of pressure that lay entirely apart from the 800 fluid tons of water that pressed down on every square inch of the treeist right this moment. But he had a terrible feeling Clayton knew all that already. He'd know it deep under his skin by now. Why don't we leave? Luke asked again. A little sunlight on your face. You remember the sun, don't you? Hey, just a few days. Then you come right back down. And maybe, if we're lucky, this whole place will cave in on itself in your absence. Would that be so bad? Clayton shook his head, lips pursed in a playful tisk. It must be hard on you. It must really sting, Lucas, acting as their errand boy. Luke frowned. What the hell are you talking about? Think about why you're even here, brother dear. They flew you halfway around the world and jettisoned you to the bottom of the sea. Could you be any more a pawn? Did they tell you how to frame it? Did they coach you? You never were a good liar. You're too earnest. Dr. Fells and the others, and I'm sure there were others, what did they promise you in return for retrieving me? Luke's jaw hung open in disbelief. Holy fuck, what could they possibly offer? A new car? An all-expense-paid trip to Cabo? I came because I wanted to. No, Jesus, I came because I had to. There was no other choice. Everything's gone to hell. I came for Abby and for... for... Oh, please! Clayton said. You don't think I know, Fells, that incompetent nitwit would like nothing more than to take over. Why do you think I stopped attending those shrink sessions? He was orchestrating it, trying to get them to declare me insane so that he could have me deposed. Do I look crazy to you, Lucas, a mad scientist from a late-night creature film? Do I really? Luke noted the itchy squint to his brother's eyes and the fatigued bags under them. His skin seemed too tight. It was as if a big metal key, same as on a wind-up toy soldier, was screwed into the back of his neck, twisting and twisting, pulling the flesh of his face to a sickening tautness. Insane, Luke thought. Maybe not yet, but I'd say you're within spitting distance. I'm not going anywhere, Clayton said. You go on and toddle up to the surface and tell Fells that. But don't think that I blame you, Luke. Understand this. I pity you. This is far too immense for you to comprehend. Go now. Go. Let Alice take you and don't argue with me. We're done here. I don't give a shit about Fells, Luke said, a flashpoint of anger exploding in his chest. I came here. 
Christ, Clay, you want the truth? I didn't come here for you. You? You're just a shitty, careless person whose last name I happen to share. Did Clayton's expression change just a bit? A wounded wince? I'm here for what you might accomplish, for the people it could benefit. But now that I see all this, I'm not so sure. Hell, maybe you'll figure out how to harness this stuff, but right now I'm getting a seriously fucked up vibe here, okay? That's all I was suggesting. We head topside and recalibrate. Then, if you want to come back down, I say fuck it. Fill your boots, asshole. Clayton smiled thinly. You're a better liar than you used to be. I'll give you that. The men considered each other, neither talking. The guinea pig scratched at the cooler. Luke thought, Westlake's computer. Westlake said there was a hole in the station, in his lab. Clayton's voice was laced with disdain. Westlake said this? What a shock. Now he did go crazy, nutty as squirrel turds, as our darling mother would have said. After listening to Westlake's files, Luke wasn't about to argue that the man hadn't gone insane. But having spent only a little time aboard the Trieste, Luke wasn't about to blame him either. Luke told his brother about the sound files, the tests, Westlake and the hole. About these files, Lucas, said Clayton, his scorn undisguised. Tell me, did you hear anything besides Westlake's voice? There were knocks. Knocks. Uh-huh. Luke bit back a jeering rejoinder. Hadn't he dismissed Westlake's claims himself just hours ago? Mocked them as Clayton was mocking them now? Why don't we give them a listen? You tell me what you hear. Luke was convinced Clayton would dismiss the offer out of hand. Instead, he surprised Luke by nodding curtly and saying, Fine, show me. Six. The main lab was unoccupied. Al? Luke called out. Hey, Al! Silence from the tunnels leading into the lab. How long had he been in Clay's lab? Less than a half hour? Luke now felt treacherous for leaving Alice out here all alone, but he wouldn't have gained entry into Clayton's lab any other way. His ears caught the buzz emanating from behind Westlake's door. The sound crested and ebbed, the sonic equivalent of waves crashing on a beach. You're sure that hatch isn't going to open? Luke asked. Clayton shook his head. Password protected. Our labs are meant to be bastions of privacy. If we wanted to share research, we did so out here. Luke turned from Westlake's lab. It continued to exert an uncomfortable pull on his thoughts, insistent fingers tickling his forehead, seeking entrance. He faced the viewing window. The sea was endless and hungering. It stirred a childlike fear in Luke, the dread of getting lost in the dark, only to find yourself prey to whatever creatures made a home of that inhospitable element. Turn the lights on, will you? Luke said. Clayton switched on the spots. Twenty yards of seafloor was washed in a skeletal pall. Something moved at the edge of the light, or had it flinched? Skittishly fled? No, it hadn't really done that, had it? When you prod a snail with a stick, it will retreat inside its shell. Things react that way when they're scared. But the things occupying the mammoth sea beyond the window weren't startled. Luke was sure of that much. If they were there at all, if they weren't just fabrications of his overheated brain, then they had merely withdrawn, the shadowy fluttering of black scarves wavering through the water, because for the moment they preferred to remain hidden. It's not dangerous, he heard Clayton say. Not if you respect it. Luke turned to find Clay's cold mineral eyes trapping his own. Luke led Clayton to Westlake's chambers. He opened the laptop on the cot. Screen was black. He pushed a few letter keys. It remained stolidly black. Did the battery die? It still had plenty of juice when he'd shut it down last. Stupid goddamn thing. He pressed the start button with increasing irritation. The computer screen remained obstinately black. I'm telling you, Clay, this was working a few hours ago. Okay. Well, it's not working now. 
and whatever's on it isn't the proof you believe it to be anyway. Luke wanted to put his fist through the fucking screen. It would feel so damn good to release the poisonous tension pulsing behind the bones of his face, put his fist through it, and then plant that same fist square in his brother's smug mouth. He wouldn't be expecting that, would he? Fucking A right. It'd be so easy, his fist pistoning until Clay's skull was nothing but a bowl of red mush, Luke laughing and laughing, his lips flecked with blood. Luke recoiled, snorting like a man who'd been given smelling salts. Where had those thoughts come from? He'd never perpetrated premeditated violence on another person in his life. Yet he'd seen himself doing it, his fist slamming down again and again. His eyes alight with mad glee, an insectile buzz invading his mind as he nursed crude animalistic impulses. Clayton was scrutinizing him now. You all right, brother? Yeah. Luke laughed coldly. Just pissed this thing won't work. Down here, it's unwise to let your emotions get out of hand. Are you coming down with a case of the sea sillies, El Capitan? His mother's mocking voice. You weren't built for rough water, sailor. Luke shut his eyes and squeezed her out of his head. 7. They found Alice in the main lab. She was once again staring at Westlake's hatch. Her skin had a sickly pallor. Cadaverous was the word that sprang into Luke's mind, her eyes peering out of her cord sockets with bovine confusion. Her lips moved, reciting words or phrases Luke could not make out. She ran a hand over the hatch, intimately, somehow searchingly. Luke could hear snatches of her speech now. I want to. Yes, oh yes, I'd love to. Luke said, Al? Her hand circled the hatch, tracing odd patterns. Her fingers fell to the keypad. Clayton flicked a switch, bathing the lab in a harsh wash of halogen light. Al blinked, disoriented. In that moment, her face held a wrathful, almost murderous look, the look of a person awoken from a dream she wished would never end. Luke said, You okay, Al? Al swiped her palm across her nose, a childlike gesture. Never better, Doc. Feeling fine like cherry wine. Luke peered out the window. Those inky scarves unfurled beyond the spotlights. A wave of panic rose in him. He tasted it the tang of pure dread, acrid as the juice in a springtime leaf. Get out of here, he thought wildly. You have to convince Al to leave. Alice, listen, do things feel a bit hinky down here? I'm asking because you've spent years underwater. Maybe it's just me. Al pulled her gaze away from Westlake's lab with what seemed like a great, almost Herculean effort. Somewhat reluctantly, she nodded. It's not just you. Luke pointed to Westlake's lab. Something happened in there, I'm pretty sure. Something not good. For all I know, it's still happening. Clayton grunted dismissively. Luke ignored him. And, oh yeah, Clayton showed me something very interesting. Don't you say a word, Clayton snapped. Oh, screw off, Luke said casually. Al, you should give Clay a round of applause. Why? Well, my brilliant brainy brother was able to cure a guinea pig of what is commonly viewed as a terminal condition, a condition known in the veterinary biz as getting its fucking head cut off. He told Al everything, the ambrosia, the shears, the blood tentacles, about Westlake's files, too, the whole. Is this true? Al asked Clayton. Clayton said, The ambrosia, you mean? Yes, it's a remarkable substance. But regarding this hole my brother keeps babbling about, Clayton rotated his finger around his ear, the universal gesture for loony. That does sound a little nuts, Al said to Luke with a charitable smile. And Westlake, well... I never claimed it was sane, Luke said defensively. I think it's symptomatic, maybe, of what's happening down here, how this place tears at your head. Westlake went nuts, fine. A hole in the wall is impossible. I thought so, too. 
but maybe the tree is, or whatever, it caved in his mind. Al nodded sympathetically, but to Luke it seemed too much like the pinched, dismissive nod someone would offer a raving bag lady. Some people aren't built for this, she said. Doesn't matter how smart they are or how rugged in every other way. This is a specific kind of pressure, and you can't toughen yourself against it. How do you feel, Luke? Clayton asked with mock concern. This from the guy who's walking around in his sleep, sending up pleading transmissions. Luke's voice rose to a reedy falsetto. Oh, brother, brother, where art thou, my brother? I needs you. Clayton's jaw tightened. I did no such thing. I'd have soon called for a janitor. Luke turned to Al, refusing to be baited into a fight. I told Clay we should head up, just until we can get a grip on what's happening down here. I can understand how this may come as a shock, said Clayton, recovering his poise. The things I've discovered are daunting, frightening, even. But imagine living in the shadow of a dormant volcano. It's scary at first, but you get used to it. People do it all the time. They exist under perpetual threat. And there's so much work to be done here. Up there, he pointed toward the surface, people are suffering, dying. They need us to stay here, to be strong and persevere. Surely you understand that. Oh, please, you sententious bastard, Luke thought. You only care about yourself and your research, same as it ever was. What about the animals? Clay continued. It was the first time he'd referred to them as anything but specimens. If we go, we'll have to leave them, and Dr. Toy, as well, who could destroy the station in our absence. Can we really take that risk? What's to stop him from destroying it right now? Luke shot back. Maybe just us being here? Al said reasonably. There's nothing in Toy's quarters that he could use to wreck this place, but if we leave, giving him the full run... Luke was dismayed to see that Al was taking his brother's side on this. So we lock the hatches, Luke said. Can't we do that? Can't we... Look, I told you I'm not leaving, Clay said simply. There's too much to do and too little time left. As I keep telling you, do whatever you want. A sense of despair had settled under Luke's skin, itching like pink fiberglass insulation. Al held the deciding vote. Fuck it, Al said after a spell. Dr. Nelson, no disrespect, but Luke's got a point. I think things may be on the verge of a catastrophic fuck-up. Clayton impassively regarded Al. I've spoken my piece. Fuck it, Al said again. Luke, let's go talk to Topside Operations. Dr. Nelson, I want you to stay where I can find you. I'll be in my lab, Clayton said. He turned his back to them. He was singing another nursery rhyme as he retreated into his lab. Ladybug, ladybug, fly away home. Your house is on fire, your children all gone. 8. Luke and L.B. followed Al to the storage area. They shimmied through the crawl-through chute. It was easier this time. Al caught L.B. as she rocketed awkwardly out of the chute. She licked her face appreciatively. Luke came last. They continued on to reach the storage tunnel hatch. Al spun the wheel. There was a steady hiss as the pressure abated. Hold the door for a sec, Luke. I don't want us getting locked in again. She hunted around until she found a used air purification canister. Okay, come on through. LB hesitated. She'd been locked in the tunnel for Lord knows how long before resignedly slipping through the doorway. Al wedged the canister in and let the hatch close under its own weight. It crimped the canister slightly, but left the door propped open a few inches. That'll hold, she said, unless someone kicks it loose. Who would do that? Al tilted her head, an analytical insurance adjuster's gaze. I spent a lot of time with Westlake, she said. We trained together, eight, ten hours a day. Most eggheads have got their head in the clouds or up their own clueless asses. Westlake was different, on the level, even keel. Al headed down the storage tunnel. Luke followed, a cold locked around his limbs almost immediately, as if it had been waiting to embrace him again. Point being, she continued, Westlake and I got on. Your brother and Dr. Toy were all business. Westlake was different. 
normal. And he was still pretty normal down here, at least at first. In fact, he seemed better than normal. Better how? Al shrugged as if to say it was hard to explain, but she tried. Training was intense, right? It ground us all down, all but your brother, who seems sort of cyborgish. I'd expected Westlake's furlough down here to wear on him. Dr. Toy really struggled in training. He almost didn't make it down, in fact. We nearly replaced him. And like I said before, you can't do mental push-ups to prepare yourself. You've either got that tolerance or you don't. So we were surprised to see that when Westlake first got down, he actually seemed brighter, stronger, healthier. I couldn't pinpoint it, but it was a change. Maybe not a good one, either. What do you mean? They'd made it around the gooseneck, forging down the tunnel toward the Challenger's entry hatch. I mean, just different. Something off in his eyes. His movements were weird, jerky, on the monitors. That is to say, before all the screens went blank. When we were topside, Westlake had a sense of what the Ambrosia might be able to do, but he was skeptical. Once we got down, that changed. At his psych appointments, which were delivered remotely from a special room down here every two days at the outset, it was all he'd talk about. The miracle agent, he called it. A kind of mania invaded him. And then he went AWOL, stopped attending his psych appointments, stopped being visible on the monitors. He just... poof, vanished. Al shook her head. And then you tell me Westlake was raving about holes in the station and other assorted bat shittery. I'm not judging. I think I get it now. Luke, I need to ask you, when you fell asleep down here, did you dream? Luke's footsteps faltered. The phantom children raced overhead, their own footsteps keeping pace with the rapid beat of his heart. Did you? she repeated. Yes, he said finally. A nightmare, the worst I can ever recall. Al nodded with a grim look of commiseration and of understanding. In the gloom, her teeth were gray, a row of tiny tombstones. Luke told her about his dream. He trusted Al and was emboldened by her forthrightness. He told her about Zack, the ambrosia, the eyes. He didn't tell her what happened to his son that day in the park, which had been the reason the dream hadn't just scared him, it hurt him, too but it felt good, necessary, to disburden himself. He kept the sleepwalking episode to himself. He needed her to trust him. She needed to trust that he had things on lockdown, because he did have things on lockdown, pretty much, at least, and was going to keep it that way. I managed to catch a few minutes of shut-eye, said Al. I had a nightmare same as you. She leaned against the tunnel. The wall seemed to belly inward around her body, opening up like a toothless mouth. Stand up quickly, Luke wanted to say. Get away from it. But that would sound crazy, like he didn't have things on lockdown. I spent three years aboard the USS Kingfisher, Al said, a nuclear attack sub. We were on tactical maneuvers, routine stuff. I was junior lieutenant, tactical armaments. We suffered an electrical malfunction. We lost power. Total blackness at 300 feet underwater. Then we were hit with a power surge. One of the two main engines blew out, exploded, more or less. Luke said, God, I can barely imagine. So when the engine blew, our team evacuated into the maneuvering room and locked the hatch. But there was this kid, Eldred Henke, 19 years old. He got trapped in the hallway. I tried to open the hatch, but the locks had engaged. The kid hammered his fists on the porthole until his knuckles broke. Another explosion rocked us as the turbine blew. The wall beside Eldridge tore apart like a tin can. Bits of superheated turbine, screws and rivets and what all blew through the ripped steel and buried into him. He slammed into the far wall and reeled like a drunk. This thin metal rod was stuck through his throat. Bolts and whatever else had ripped his cheeks open. I could see inside his face places nobody ought to see. Next, the hull caved and the sea rushed in. I saw it all. I was safe. The current carried him out, lickety-split. The kid disappeared like he'd been sucked out of an airplane cruising at 25,000 feet. Luke digested this, then said, Al, there's nothing you could have done. Surely you understand that. No, I get that. I mean, if I nailed myself to the wall every time I couldn't save someone's dog or cat, 
I think this is a little different, Doc. I'm just saying that guilt carves you up, right? Things happen sometimes, and there's no way to fix it in the moment or any time after. But no creature is more adept at putting themselves up on that cross than human beings. She nodded, accepting Luke's logic. The thing is, I used to dream about that kid. But those dreams weren't so bad because in them I wrenched the hatch open and yanked him through just before the sea poured in. Those dreams were bittersweet, sure, because some part of my subconscious knew there was a cream-colored headstone in a cemetery in Eldred's hometown with his name etched on it. But the dream you had down here wasn't like that, was it? Luke said. The dream you had here was worse. She nodded reluctantly. Her face looked softer and almost girlish in the queer light of the tunnel. Much worse, she said. The dream had the same setup, she told Luke. Eldred was trapped behind the hatch. Al was torquing the hatch wheel, and same as in real life, it wasn't budging. Then the turbine blew, and that shower of superheated rubble hit the kid. Except in the dream, Alice noticed something else. There was stuff mixed in with the rubble, a glittering patina in the air. The ambrosia, Luke said softly. That's it, isn't it? Ding, ding, ding. Give the man a prize, Al said. Alice dreamed it in down to the tiniest detail, every pore on the kid's face. He started to shriek. Why? Because of the bits of metal spiked in his flesh or the ambrosia? She could hear him screaming through the hatch, fluttery, boyish screams. Which is impossible, right? She said. Those hatches are soundproof. You don't have to tell me any more, Luke said. Don't I? Alice said wretchedly. Next, the dream got real funny. Not ha-ha funny. Funny awful. Eldred's skin, it healed. Or only sort of. The metal was pushed out of it, the wounds shrinking, then disappearing altogether. He stayed that way for a heartbeat, his skin flawless. Then the wounds opened up again, even though there was no cause for it. It was like watching his face get torn open by invisible surgeons with terrible intentions. Or like watching the most awful movie, Alice said, rewinding it and playing it again. Next, the sea rushed in and carried Eldred down, and Alice knew the kid would keep suffering, but he'd never quite die. He'd keep falling into the dark, but he'd live on, and in an agony like no human has ever known. The worst part is this, she said. Before Eldred sucked out as his body's swirling out of that rip in the sub, he catches my eye and he says, and I hear this clearly, you did this to me. This is your fault, Alice Sykes. God damn you to hell. She leans forward miserably, cradling her skull in her palms. LB patted over and settled her head on Al's knee. The station? Luke said, I don't know what's going on. It's in the air, in the metal. Alice, it's the most awful place I've ever set foot inside. Clearly, you've never felt the need to take a piss at a dog racing track, Al said with forced levity. Luke smiled, appreciating her efforts. There are two possibilities, he said. One, something unexplainable is happening down here. Or two, and by far and away the most reasonable possibility... Is that we're going a bit batty, said Al. Jesus. Luke, we just showed up. This is a cup of coffee compared to the hitches I've pulled. This isn't a sub. It's a different animal entirely, isn't it? Alice ran her hand over her stubbled skull. I'm inclined to agree with you. Bad enough to make Dr. Toy flip his lid, and with Dr. Westlake, God rest his soul. With strange serenity, the two of them sat with the fact that they could be sunk neck deep into a case of the sea sillies, or were perhaps even coming down with the preliminary manifestations of the gets. It made more sense to believe they were going crazy or falling prey to the gets than to believe that, well, any other logic was not logic at all. It was total insanity. Your brother could be suffering too, said Al. He may just wear it differently. Dr. Toy's words floated through Luke's mind. You are not who you are. 
Nine. They reached the Challenger. Al said, Stay here. Keep an eye out for Dr. Toy or your brother, although I don't think you'll see them. I'll try to get a signal up to the Hesperus. I'm not ready to pack up shop down here yet. Too much on the line for that. Luke grudgingly nodded. He'd already come eight thousand and eight miles, the last eight miles straight down, and he didn't want to leave quite yet either. He could withstand the pressure a bit longer, couldn't he? Al opened the hatch and slipped through. The hatch closed and locked. Luke crouched beside LB. She chuffed, a doggy hack, and gave him a look that said, What are we doing here, boss? Stuck in a holding pattern, girl. Somewhat stunningly, Luke didn't find it at all weird that he'd be talking to a dog. LB could well be the sanest creature down here. She set a foreleg on Luke's knee and rested her head on his thigh. It's okay, he said. The reassurance felt cold. A faint humming filled his ears. The feverish drone of flies hovering over a heap of shit was the revolting mental image that hum kindled. He didn't hear it so much as feel it. The hum radiated from his bones. The crushing pressure of the station sucked to him like a second skin. It entered his clothes, stabbing through the material. He felt as if he were wrapped in bands of sinew while a huge muscle contracted, splitting his every vein. LB licked his cheek. The tang of her breath was bracing. The hatch opened and Al reappeared. There's no power. A storm of busted glass blew through Luke's chest. What? No power, Luke. Nada. The Challenger's out of juice. How the hell did that happen? No idea. I didn't leave the fucking headlights on, if that's what you're asking. Luke flinched at the tone of her voice. There was plenty of juice when I left her. Now I can't even get a charge off the glow plugs. I couldn't stay inside too long. It's pitch dark and freezing cold. But that's not all. I found something on the Edison. What's that? A stock ticker. Last-ditch communication method. It runs off a pair of nine-volt batteries. If the power goes, it'll still feed communiques through. She handed him a ribbon of paper, same as the stuff that used to fall during a ticker tape parade. Luke read the words on it in a gathering swell of dread. Current ring reappeared, 8.51 a.m., severe-slash-deadly ascension risk. It hardly matters, said Alice. The challenger's kaput. I sent a message back through the Edison, but they won't be able to do anything until the ring clears. It's as powerful as a tornado, and it'll make mincemeat out of any vessel they send down. How long will that take? How long will the rain fall? How long will the wind blow? It's nature, Doc. It doesn't operate on a clock. You said the last current ring was in place for... About two weeks. Two weeks? The thought of spending that much time inside the guts of the triest. No, it was unthinkable. Luke opened his mouth to ask the question. Are you saying there's no way to get off the station? But Al's expression answered it well enough. Can we route electricity from somewhere else to power up the Challenger? I mean, in case the ring clears? Do we have a portable generator? Al considered it. We do have a Jenny, yeah, and it could work. Draw off the main power source, but we couldn't overdo it. A blowout could black out the whole station, and then we're royally screwed. The triest in total darkness. Christ, Luke couldn't even contemplate it. If we fed enough juice into the Challenger, we could make a low-power ascent, she said, providing the current ring clears or even slackens a little. We'd need enough juice to run the oxygen pumps, a few key utilities. We could surface fifty miles from the Hesperus. We could run into the trench wall or straight into the ring, or... Or what? Well, I could steer us through the heart of the ring. The water is calmest there, but it's an eye-of-the-needle maneuver but you could do it? Al actually smiled. Believe it or not, I've done crazier things. I believe it, Al. So let's find that fucking generator. Okay, but we need to head to the communications room first. Maybe I can get in proper contact with the Hesperus from there. They backtracked toward the wedged open door. Luke glanced over his shoulder, certain he'd heard something. 
a rustling like a giant moth flapping its wings. But there was nothing, was there? A gelatinous shimmer along the ceiling, a glittery snail trail that, even as Luke watched, dimmed to nothingness. We're trapped, he thought, bugs in a kill jar. Come on, girl, he said to the dog. L.B. needed no prodding. She was already at his side. Ten. The hatch was closing as they rounded the gooseneck. Luke heard the canister pop from where it had been wedged with a chilling tink. Al had already broken into a run. Luke could see the lip of light beyond the hatch thinning by heart-stopping degrees. Alice dove like an outfielder laying out to catch a long fly ball. She struck the hatch with a muffled thump and let out a strangled squawk. When Luke reached her, he saw that she'd managed to jam her left hand between the frame and the hatch door. Push it open. Al's voice was calm, but her face was white. Quick. Luke rocked the hatch open a few inches. Its weight was immense, as though something was pushing from the other side. Al snatched her hand out and cradled it to her chest. Luke assessed the damage. There were twenty-seven bones in the human hand. It looked as if Al had broken more than a few of them. Let me see what you've done. Her pinky was bent at an unnatural angle. Her middle finger snapped amidships. The dent in the back of her hand was a clear indication that some of the bones of her palm had been crushed. Her hand looked as if it had been compacted, as if something had set its considerable weight against the hatch and shoved with merciless pressure. There goes my juggling career, Al said, her face greasy with shock. Luke saw the dislodged air canister. He'd watched Al wedge it in. Its metal was dimpled where she'd rocked the hatch shut against it, pinning the canister firmly in place. Still, it had popped out. Had the tunnel heaved slightly, a sensation unfelt by Luke, to knock it loose? Or had somebody jarred it free? Where's the first aid kit? he asked. Should, should be in the communications room. Luke helped her up. Al was running on shock and adrenaline at the moment, before long the pain would set in. Come on, she grunted. She stumbled from the storage area and stopped at another hatch set in the tunnel wall, about fifty yards shy of the crawl-through chute. You're gonna have to open it, Doc. Can't manage right this second. Luke cranked the wheel. The hatch opened into a tight passageway. He followed Al in, L.B. following them. The tunnel was strung with hatchways, four by Luke's count. He figured this was a central hub branching out to other sections of the Trieste. A red X had been slashed across the porthole window of one hatch. Luke remembered reading about when the Black Plague swept across Europe. Red Xs had appeared on doors of houses. This place is infected, steer clear. After a dogleg, they reached the communications room. Al said, What in fucking blue hell happened here? The room was tiny. The overhead lights were smashed, but enough light leaked through from the tunnel to see by. A bank of monitors occupied one wall, labeled Lab N, Lab W, Pure, Sleep, and so on. Looks like someone didn't want to be watched, Luke said. Nine of the ten monitors had been shattered. It looked like an act committed in a violent frenzy. Glass was scattered on the floor. Luke shooed L.B. away, fearing she'd get a shard in her paw. The final monitor, marked pure, was unbroken but dead and gray. Luke walked over to it, his swollen reflection played over the screen's convex surface. The comm link's busted, Al said. Fuck me, Freddy. She pointed to the snapped and skinned remains of the sea-to-surface radio. The receiver was broken neatly in half, the wires stripped out. Luke said, You think this was done recently? I can't tell. Whoever did it, I mean, they were fucking anal about it. Dr. Toy's the strongest candidate for this shit. Or maybe Westlake before he surfaced? Your brother, even? Luke pictured Clayton wielding a bone mallet, destroying the monitors in a state of controlled wrath, the steely calm in his eyes as he methodically stripped the wires from the receiver, stranding everybody down here so that he could study in peace. 
Yes, Luke whispered. It's conceivable. Conceivable, if insane. If Clayton or Toy didn't want to be in contact with topside operations, okay, don't answer their calls. But there was no need to destroy their only link to the surface. What if an emergency arose? Lucas, nobody is coming to get you. Shut up, Mom, Luke thought, bristling at the sound of her voice in his head. Shut the hell up. Who asked you anyway? If I wanted your opinion, I'd visit your gravesite. Al winced, cradling her mangled hand to her chest. Hey, let's get your hand looked at, Luke said, figuring it was best to keep busy. Good idea, Lucas, said Bethany Ronix. As they say, idle hands are the devil's workshop. The first aid kit was clipped to the wall. Luke opened it and snapped on a pair of surgical gloves. Lay your hand on the console, he said. I'm going to splint your fingers, then tape them together. Fair warning, though, this'll hurt like hell. Al nodded wryly. Vicodin, Vicodin, my kingdom for a Vicodin. Al yelped when Luke set her pinky bones. He did it as quickly as he could, but still he could feel the broken edges of bone grinding. Sorry, I've done this before, but to cats or dogs. You're... Yeah! Al hissed through gritted teeth. Yup, yup, you're doing a bang-up job. Keep going. Luke cut a length of splint tape and wrapped it around her pinky. The ring finger was only badly swollen. Luke taped those two fingers together. Your middle finger got it the worst. It's broken down near the knuckle. Does that mean I won't be able to flip the bird anymore? Depending on how it heals, you may not be able to bend it at all. So you might always be flipping the bird. Hold on. This is gonna hurt like a fuck of a bitch. Al picked up the broken receiver and jammed it between her teeth. Luke had to pop the finger up to set the bone. It took three hard tugs. On the third, Al's jaw clenched so hard that the black plastic cracked between her canines. Luke tore open a roll of gauze to wrap Al's hand in hopes of keeping all the little nicks free from infection. You're good to go. The lone monitor fired to life. Their heads jerked in unison. The monitor was labeled Pure, the O2 Purification Chamber. Do you see that? Al whispered. The camera angle offered a long view of the chamber. Light pulsed at the entrance, but trailed to shadows at the far end. Luke squinted. Nothing definite. Slow, insistent, rhythmical movement that reminded Luke of kelp strands drifting in a night tide. A red warning light began to flash on the console. Two words were stamped below the warning light. The first was oxy, the second low. Oh, good Christ, Al said as she sprinted out of the room. Eleven. Luke caught up with her in the passageway. She stood before one of the four hatches leading to unknown areas of the tryst. This is the one. Can you open it? She said. What's happening? You saw the light, right? We're losing oxygen. The system monitors the amount of CO2. When the concentrations get too high, it gives a warning. That's it? A little light flashing in some room? Usually there'd be an alarm, but the system could be screwy. The door, Doc. Hurry. Luke threw his weight against the wheel. The hatch cracked open with a tortured squeal. The tunnel beyond was narrower than anything Luke had seen so far. A weak welter of light spread across the ceiling as if sickly fireflies were trapped inside it. Leave the dog, Doc. It's safer right here. Luke agreed. Stay, girl. LB regarded Luke worriedly, afraid he'd leave the way everyone else had. I'll be back, I promise. The dog didn't seem very reassured, but obediently stood her ground. They stepped into the tight passageway. Luke shut the hatch behind him, and his ears popped. He immediately became aware of the oxygen quality, stale and cool, not unlike the ancient air in a subterranean cave. They inched through the diseased trickle of light. The walls hugged their bodies lovingly. The metal seemed to breathe as they moved forward. How far do we go? he asked. Al grunted. 
I don't know. I've never been in here. Luke could barely see his fingers in front of his face. The walls brushed his hips. The passage was tapering ahead of them, but also, as he sensed it, behind them. He could almost hear the tunnel issuing sly snaps and crunches as it crimped the steel folding like onion skin. The air tasted horrible, not just stale, infused with the taste of dead things. They could have been in the mouth of some enormous monster picking their way along teeth hung with rotted meat. Adrenaline twined up from Luke's feet. It crawled into his chest and forced his breath out in harsh, plosive pops. Fucking, what the? Al said. What is it? said Luke. Dead end. Spiders crawled over the dome of his skull as a skittish panic rushed over him, an unaccountable fear that reminded him of being a child in Iowa walking down a lonely country road at night as headlights bloomed over the curve of the earth behind him, conjuring an uneasiness that would linger until the car had passed, the red embers of its taillight dimming around a curve. It's not a cave-in, Al said. The wall is sheer. Her feet shuffled. There's space at the bottom. Back up, will you? The walls pushed at Luke's spine, an adoring suction like the mouth of a hungry lover. He managed to clear enough space for Al to get down on all fours. There's something down here, Al said, knocking her fist around. Same as a crawl through, really, but it feels even smaller. An access chute, I'd say. Could be that the air passes through a series of filters or what the fuck above the chute. I don't remember the schematics. Can we get through it? We'll have to wiggle and pray there's no grate at the other end, but yeah, it's doable. It's the only way into the purification room. You're sure? Yeah, that I do remember from the schematics. And there's absolutely no other... Doc, hey, not trying to be an asshole here, but this is it. No alternative. Okay. Luke vented a shaky breath. Fine. Fine. I'd let you stay here, but I may need help, she said. My hand's fucked. Luke exhaled heavily. Go on. I'll follow. Al's body bumped into the tube. Her elbows and knees made no noise at all. It was as if she were crawling through a hole carved into a mountainside. You coming, Luke? He knelt. His knees and feet were pressed tightly together the knobs of his ankle bones touching. It felt as though the tunnel behind him was no longer an O, but had been crimped into a V, a pair of jaws closing by degrees, forcing him forward if he didn't want to be crushed. The air changed once again as he entered the chute, heavier, sickeningly moist. He worked his way forward on his belly, bucking his hips in a clumsy, humping motion. Dig those moves he said, hoping the sound of his voice might drive away the onrushing panic. Liquid hips, baby, liquid hips. The tube reduced his voice to a hysterical warble. After a few feet, his arms were pinned to his sides. He could barely move them other than to spider-crawl his fingers along the inside of the chute. How the hell was Al managing to do the same with her broken mitt? She was smaller than Luke, more nimble, the tube was coated in a thin layer of oil, but instead of making it easier to move, as it did in the crawl-through chute, it had the opposite effect. Luke felt like an insect gummed on a strip of flypaper. Al? Hey, Al? When the reply finally arrived, it held a funny echo. Luke, ook, ook. He wriggled forward, his breath coming in hot gasps. He adopted a peristaltic wave the way a maggot gets around. Toes, then calves, then thighs, then ass, then hips. This movement netted a few inches at a go. Al grunted an exertion somewhere ahead. The chute tightened as Luke forged deeper into it. His nose raked the metal, which was pebbled with rough bumps. Luke envisioned a huge, greasy tongue covered with diseased nodules. It's okay, 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 okay. Even the voice in his head sounded hysterical now. Al's made it through. You can bet she's already waiting in the purification room. You just need to get a few more feet and you'll be there too. And then? Well, damn, he'd just have to turn around and do it all over again. Don't think about that. Just take it inch by inch. His shoulders jammed. Pushing with his heels did nothing. He was stuck. 
His body pinned. He couldn't budge. His heels drummed a helpless tat-a-tat. His lungs constricted as darkness poured into them. Was the chute shrinking? It pressed on the back of his skull with an insistent, menacing weight. It would keep pressing slowly and remorselessly until the bones of his face collapsed. It's a bend, Luke. Just a little bend in the tube, for God's sake. Suddenly he felt it. The chute was pressing into his right-hand side, but there was a little space on his left. Luke torqued his elbows and bucked his hips, squirming onto his side. His spine followed the bend of the tube now. He could breathe shallowly again. He pushed against a chute with his feet, which slipped on its greasy coating. Incrementally, fighting for inches, he propelled his torso around the bend. The air before his eyes burst with puffs of cottony light. Those puffs were a manifestation of exertion, panic, and a lack of breathable air. He was gasping now, the onset of claustrophobic attack. He'd never been prone to that. Crowded elevators and windowless rooms had never bothered him, but now he was eight miles underwater. Eight miles! Eight miles! His mind parroted idiotically, in a chute that felt like it was being compressed in a vice. The sea was held back by nothing more than a fragile shell. He heard, or believed he could hear, the subtlest creaks as the water exerted its bone-smashing force. Except it wouldn't smash his bones, would it? No, it would do something else entirely. He'd be crushed into a cube, like a car at a wrecking yard. It was highly unlikely that his body would be compressed into anything so neatly geometric, but that was the image his mind settled around. Dap, 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 dap. Those nightmare children dashing overhead, the bloated pads of their feet only an inch from his face now. He wriggled his shoulders, clenched his fists, and inched onward. He was bathed in sick sweat. His thighs chafed. He couldn't hinge his knees more than a few inches. His lungs burned, packed with hot rivets. Why had he done this? How could he have been such a fool? It was torturous to breathe. Were his sinuses constricting? What if the chute narrowed until he couldn't move another millimeter? What if he caught up to Al, who'd gotten stuck herself, his head butting her heels? What if she told him that the exit was graded? Could they get out? Luke didn't think so. Moving forward was hard enough. Moving backward would be impossible. They would die in the chute like rats trapped in a heating duct. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. The sound floated out of the darkness, dancing delicately up his calves, slipping around his skull and into his ears. Whoosh, whoosh. That insistent, unpleasantly familiar sound. No, 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 no. He was nearly around the bend in the chute. He'd been progressing in centimeters, in millimeters, in millipedes. The smallest increments, but he was making headway. His hips were clear. In a minute or so, he'd be able to work around the bend and really boogie. But something was inside the chute with him now. Whoosh. 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 He could picture it behind him. Twenty feet long, thick and sinuous its feelers dancing lightly along the mouth of the tube, its exoskeleton throbbing with moody colors. Under that armor, its guts were as soft and featureless as mashed bananas, its compound eyes pulsing with alien hunger. The millipede was inside the chute with him, its million skillion legs tapping as it advanced gradually, but with complete ease. Tubes were its natural habitat, weren't they? Luke tensed, every muscle quivering, his heart hammered at his rib cage. The fear paralyzed him, his body, his mind. Finally, he began to move, hips bucking, feet shoving. But his body just uselessly accordioned. He felt like a worm stuck in the barrel of a clear, cheap ballpoint pen. Panic chewed his brain into pulp, rendering him stupid with fear. Bug! yelped a giddy voice from his lizard brain, obliterating every last vestige of calm. Bug! 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 Whoosh, whoosh. Tick, 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 tick. He felt it now, at his feet. Its antennae, long and thick as extension cords, picked along the exposed skin of his ankles. Its mandibles, gnashed like scissors. Its proboscis, they had those, right? It was a thick needle dripping venom. 
but it punched through the soles of his shoes, injecting poison into the pads of his feet while he thrashed helplessly. Would that poison kill him or only paralyze him? Would he feel it chewing through his boots, snipping off his toes like jujubes and funneling them into the clotted hole of its mouth? The sound switched direction. It was coming from ahead of him now. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God, no. His feet would be bad enough, but for it to devour his head, its legs twitching through his hair as it scuttled over his forehead, his face carrying the insectile stink of a roach nest, noxious nectars drooling out of its mouth as its mandibles fastened around the fragile nut of his skull, its proboscis injected through one twitching eyeball. Bug! Bug! Bug, 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 bug! Luke shook all over, screeching now, gripped by out-of-body terror. A vein of white-hot fire ripped up his spine as his overtaxed synapses detonated in his brain pan. Fingers, feelers. Something was gripping his shoulders and was hauling him into... Twelve. It's okay, Doc. Doc, you're out. You're out. Luke lay on the floor of what must be the purification room. Grainy light trickled down the walls, illuminating the canisters screwed into them. He tried to sit up. His body wouldn't comply, his muscles limp as wrung dish rags. A tidal wave of embarrassment crashed over him. Mindless terror had cracked him right open inside the chute, and over what? There wasn't a goddamn thing inside it except for the cloying stench of his fear. I'm sorry, Al. I... I lost my head for a second there. Al touched Luke's shoulder. I was jumpy by the time I made it out, too. Enclosed spaces, right? She displayed her broken hand. The fingernail of her index finger was peeled back, hanging on a tenacious strip of skin. I wrecked my hand some more, too. Thank God for adrenaline, huh? Luke swallowed the burnt chalk taste in his mouth. That stuff's a godsend. Al walked to a control panel on a near wall and flipped it open with her good hand. Son of a bitch. God damn it. The relay chip's missing. What does that do? Regulates the warning system for one. Luke stood. Did somebody take it? I don't see it laying around here anywhere and I can't see how it'd just pop out. I was thinking Dr. Toy might have taken it. Some nutty sabotage attempt. But would that bastard, no matter how ratchet crazy he's gone, go through what we just did to cut off his own air supply? So, maybe we're not losing air then? Impossible to tell without that chip. Thankfully, Al forded deeper into the room. Luke trailed her. It was perhaps fifty steps long, the longest room Luke had been inside down here. Thousands of canisters were screwed into the walls. They glowed faintly like enormous eggs. At the very back of the room lay a lone crate, the size of an old army footlocker fashioned from molded black plastic. Its latch shone silver in the dim. Seeing it, Luke's feet churned to a dead stop. Something the matter, Doc? No, Luke said. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Nothing. He felt it then his mind opening up, an inky blackness flowing into it. The room spun and swam as he slipped suddenly into a memory hole, his psyche funneling deep down a dream pool. You okay, Doc? Al's voice was far off, swimmy. It's fine, Luke tried to tell her. It's nothing at all. It's just... It's just... Just my old tickle trunk. Thirteen. His mother had found it at Treasure Village, a flea market on the outskirts of Lake Okoboji. It called out to me, she would told Luke with a self-satisfied smile. It said, pick me, Miss Ronix, pick me for Lucas, his very own tickle trunk. He'll just adore me. Tickle trunk. His friends had the same type of thing, except theirs were called toy boxes. 
but his mother insisted on the name, as she insisted on a great many things. A tickle trunk for my special boy, she'd said. A special place for all his ticklish things. She'd seen it at the flea market amid the ninja stars and chipped knickknacks, seen it and known. It must have shone like a beacon to her. Oh, she would have thought, Luke will just die when he sees this. The trunk was a nasty trick. Luke knew that right away, exactly the sort of trick his mother liked to play from time to time to show who was boss. But of course she presented it as a gift, a token of love and affection. Tickle Trunk. That name. Luke pictured a trunk lined with disembodied fingers, hundreds of them, calloused and bony, with nicotine-stained fingernails. And if he wasn't careful, those fingers would snatch him, drag him inside, and tickle and pinch him until he screamed. The trunk appeared joyful. It was big enough that Luke's seven-year-old body could fit inside and was decorated with smiling clown faces. His mother urged him to name them the same way Clayton would name his poor mice. Look, there's Chuckles, she'd say, pointing them out. And this one can be Coco, and there's Mr. Tatters and Flopsy and Pumpkin Pie. The trunk's lid was rounded like that of a treasure chest. The clown's faces stretched over its top, as warped as reflections in a funhouse mirror. If you looked closer, you'd notice most of the clowns weren't smiling so much as leering. Their lips were swollen and too red, as if they'd been painted with blood. And if you looked very closely, the lips of a few of those clowns, the ones his mother had named Bingo and Pit Pat specifically, were parted just slightly to disclose what looked like a row of discolored, daggery teeth. The trunk had a huge silver latch. If you got trapped inside the trunk, if that were to happen, somehow accidentally or not, the latch would keep you locked in. Its interior smelled like the white balls Luke's neighbor Mr. Rosewell scattered under his crabapple tree to keep mice away. That, plus another smell, impossible to name. The trunk was lined with cracked brown skin, Luke imagined it had been stripped off an alligator or a Komodo dragon. The skin was tacked inside the box with dull brass rivets. Luke didn't like the box. No, his feelings were stronger than that. He hated it on sight. He wondered if whoever had sold it to his mother had given her a steep discount just to get it off his hands. Luke hadn't wanted it in his room, which was, of course, where it ended up. His mother insisted. Now you've got a spot for all your stuff, she said mock brightly. A place for everything and everything in its place. He grudgingly threw his toys into it, all but his most precious ones, which he couldn't imagine leaving inside. His foolish prepubescent self had been scared that when he closed the lid, the trunk would release an acid that would melt them into a runny goo like beaten eggs. Its lid would open and close, a pair of greedy lips, Gummy strings of what had been his matchbox cars and army men stretched between them. Feed us, Lucas, he'd imagined it whispering in a guttural voice after all the house lights had been switched off. We're so hungry, so hungry. Feed us any old thing, we don't mind. It's all meat. Come closer, why don't you, so we can tell you what we really want. He hated sleeping with it in his room. Clayton had been spending most nights down in his lab by then, so it was just Luke and the trunk and the shadows cast by the backyard maple bending over the walls. Sometimes he'd awaken with a shudder and swear he'd heard the trunk moving on its casters, the sound of marbles rolling across a pane of glass. He decided one night to mark the trunk's edge with a piece of sidewalk chalk. The next morning, Luke discovered with fright that it had moved an inch over the line. Slowly but surely it was advancing toward his bed. When he told Clayton, his brother smirked. The floor is warped. The trunk is on wheels. Of course it rolls a little dummy. The next day he dragged the tickle trunk down to the basement. His parents were both out. Clayton was supposed to watch Luke, but he'd left the house on a specimen hunt. It was Luke's best chance to rid himself of it once and for all. He hated touching the wormy grain of its wood, festooned with those capering clowns. As he'd backed down the staircase with it, the trunk sat heavily against his chest. Its weight was dreadful, a slab of pulsating stone. He dragged it across the kitchen linoleum and bumped it down the basement stairs. 
He dropped it, breathing heavily, and opened the crawl space door. A three-foot-tall storage room sprawled over half the basement. Inside were old boxes cowled in spider's webs, full of stuff Luke's parents had no use for but were loath to throw away. He snapped on the light bulb, which swayed on a knotted cord, and pushed the trunk past the crawl space door. He got on his hands and knees and pushed it farther inside. Dust motes swam in the air. His heart thumped. His mouth could have been packed with sawdust. He wanted to abandon the trunk at the very back of the crawl space. It seemed to have gained fifty pounds since he'd lugged it out of his bedroom. Suddenly, he pictured the crawl space light bulb burning out, the door slamming shut, and the trunk lid popping open. Alone at last. That guttural whisper, but real this time, not just in Luke's mind. Come here, Lucas, and let us whisper in your ear. No? Okay, we'll come to you. Anxiety coated Luke's brain in a suffocating glaze as he pushed it to the very back of the crawl space. It was early afternoon. Sunlight streaked through a dirty casement window. If it weren't for that fragile link to the outside world, Luke might not have gotten it that far. He let go of its handle. For an instant, his hands wouldn't come unglued and started back toward the door. The trunk sat in the fall of weak sunlight, bloated and sullen. There, Luke said with a triumphant little smile, you stay where you belong. That night, his mother forced him to go fetch it again, in the dark. She'd immediately noticed it was missing. Luke was positive she had been waiting for Luke to try something sneaky. She crossed her enormous, fat-girdled arms at the dinner table, eyeing him down. The trunk, Lucas. You've moved it. Luke didn't look up from his plate. He pushed peas around with his fork. I put it downstairs. It's just, there's not enough room. The trunk's big in our bedroom, with me and Clay both in it. It's really too... What do you suggest? Move into a mansion? Harsh, barking laughter. Do you think your father could afford that? Luke swallowed, forced his head up. I don't like it, Mom. I'm sorry. Thank you for buying it, but... Her mouth set in a hard line. It was the only part of her body that hadn't gone permanently soft. You've hardly given it a chance. You will go downstairs, Lucas Adelaide Nelson. You will bring it up. The dread etched on his son's face forced Luke's father, Lonnie, to intervene. Beth, honey, do we really have to... Lonnie's objection died with a glance from his wife. He gathered his menthols and his cup of tea and slipped into the family room. What are you waiting for? His mother's arms remained crossed. An engraved invitation? Luke sat rooted to his chair. It wasn't a matter of wanting to move. He physically couldn't. His mother gripped his wrist fiercely and marched him to the basement door. Go, his mother said. Now. Luke didn't argue. He had a vague but dire notion that given reason, his mother could conjure torments worse than whatever the trunk held in store. He trooped down the squeaky, sway-backed stairs. He waved his hand around until his fingers brushed the light cord. The bulb illuminated his father's workbench, the water heater, and the door to Clayton's unoccupied lab. His mother shut the door. Luke's heart made a donkey kick in his chest. It's just a stupid trunk, he told himself. It's ugly and gross, but it's not alive, okay? It can't hurt you. Then why did you try to get rid of it? Asked a second traitorous voice. And why did it inch across your bedroom floor? The crawl space's cheap plywood door swung open to reveal a darkness that raised the downy hairs on his arms. The trunk lay inside, waiting. You're back, Lucas. So soon, so soon. Lovely. Do come in. The crawl space's light cord dangled to the left of the door, a flimsy string with a bell-shaped bob of plastic on the end. It took a few adrenaline-pinching seconds to find it. Had it been moved? He overbalanced, nearly toppling face first onto the floor. His fingers brushed the cord. He'd reached too far at first. The trunk sat where he'd left it, at the very back of the crawl space. Boxes were stacked on either side, forming a rough corridor. He hadn't noticed the alignment that afternoon. Had someone 
Something moved these boxes. He crawled toward it. Silky rustling noises emanated from behind the boxes. Mice? But they didn't have a mouse problem. Clayton trapped them all, every last squeaker. Luke's nose filled with the smells of wood rot and mildew. Our house is diseased, Luke thought weirdly, but only right here in the crawl space. And Luke was in the heart of the disease now, crawling toward its decaying tumor. He craned his neck back to the door. He'd seen something in his periphery, or sort of thought so. Fleeting movement behind the stacked boxes, a skittering of little legs as something moved behind him. To do what? Close the door? Switch off the light? Lucas, you're such a precious boy. So soft, so pretty. Come closer. Fuck you, Luke thought. He'd never uttered this word aloud. God only knew what his mother would do to him, but it felt good to say it in his head. Fuck you, Box. I can burn you and say it was an accident. I can flood you until your wood bloats and rots. I can leave you on the stoop on garbage day when mom's gone and the garbage man will take you to the dump where seagulls will drop gooey turds all over you. The trunk waited for him, unmoving, unblinking. Luke's head jerked. He saw it again, something moving behind the boxes. They were in rows like big brown teeth, and he saw, or thought, he'd seen something scuttling between the gaps. A pair of pants. Were those pants? They were wadded up like the skin of an enormous serpent on top of one box, and something else that might have been a lampshade, and something that looked like... The trunk's latch snapped open. It made a silvery snipping sound. Luke turned in time to see it happen. The metal hasp fell forward lazily, like the tongue lolling from a tired dog's mouth. Luke couldn't believe it. That is to say, his mind couldn't process it. There wasn't a puff of wind. No earthquake had shaken the house's foundation. The latch had simply opened. The clowns on the trunk suddenly seemed different. Their eyes were tracking him now, pinning him in their fleshless, jeering gaze. Luke spun wildly on his knees. As he did, he heard a sound that chilled the ventricles of his heart. <coughs> the trunk's hinges levering up. He didn't want to look back, not one bit, but his skull was gripped by an immense force which twisted it slowly around. The trunk was open. Not much. It couldn't open fully as the lid would hit the crawl space's ceiling. No. It was open only a bit, just a hair. When he faced back the other way, an odd thing happened. The crawl space elongated, its dimensions stretching like taffy. The door was thirty feet away when it should only be twenty, and it was moving farther away by the second. Lucas, don't go. Stay. Luke began to scrabble toward the door, his fingers scraping madly at the cement. A spider web broke across his face, strangling the cry building in his throat. He wanted to call out for Clayton, his mother, anyone, but his voice had fled into his stomach. All that came out of his mouth was a breathless whisper. He looked back again. He couldn't help it. A hand was coming out of the trunk. Gray and waxen, the hand of a long dead thing. It was thin, the fingers terribly long, the bones projecting under that drab stretching of skin. If it were to grab him, Luke figured each finger could wrap around his ankle at least twice. Every finger was tipped with a sharp black nail. It was, he realized with dawning horror, the same hand he'd seen inside the standing pipe, the hand belonging to the creature they'd fled in the swamp. That thing was here, now, in the basement. He'd been wrong to fear his mother. His mother could be cruel, yes, but at least she was human. Is this actually happening? This was the most adult question Luke had ever asked himself. There was no place in the normal world, the world his mother and father and brother lived in, the world of baseball and snow cones and sunshine, for this thing to exist. This is not really happening, he thought more definitively now. And quite suddenly, the crawl space turned insubstantial, gauzy, a dreamscape. He felt a strange inner buoyancy, as though his stomach were full of soap bubbles. He drifted on a sudsy wash of horror, but it was dream horror, unattached, 
to real-life concerns. A giant hand in his tickle trunk. How silly. It was nothing to be afraid of, really. He realized with a thickness of mind he felt only when waking from a very deep sleep that the voice he was hearing in his head was actually coming out of the trunk. An insidious, narcotizing mimicry of his own voice. It slipped out of the trunk and slid into his ears like some effortless oil. It matched his own voice exactly, or almost exactly. It held a coppery undernote that rasped over the vowels and consonants like a straight razor over a barber's strop. Nothing to be afraid of. Not really happening. Luke turned to face the door again and started to crawl desperately. His fingernails and kneecaps scraped the cement, opening the skin up. The door galloped away in heart-clutching increments. He chased it the way a car pursues a heat shimmer on the highway, always tantalizingly close, but you never quite catch it. The hand spider walked down the trunk. The attached arm was long and sinewy and seemed both boneless and jointless, a ropey appendage like a fire hose. I don't exist, Lukey Lou. You said so yourself, didn't you? You're just a big dummy, like your brother says. But it did exist. At least right then it did. And that could be all the time a creature like this ever needed. He crawled, blood welling on his knees, throwing a glance over his shoulder at the trunk. The crawl space light went out. Luke didn't know if something had switched it off or the bulb had chosen that exact moment to go out. It didn't matter. The darkness galvanized his blood. Maybe the darkness was better in a weird way. He raised his back, pumped his legs, and scurried across the crawl space. The wooden beams raked his spine, but he didn't feel any pain. His adrenaline was redlined, the fear sharpening the edge on his every sense. He could hear the thing's arms slithering and shucking across the grimy cement, a ha-thump, ha-thump noise as if it were flapping in a wave-like motion, those long nail-tipped fingers digging into the cement for purchase, and then a thump as it flicked forward another foot. The door was closer. He could see the light of the basement now, the edge of the water heater. Mercifully, the crawl space was shrinking back to its old dimensions. Or maybe they'd never changed. It was just a nasty trick the thing in the trunk had been playing on him. A thump! Right behind him now. Luke swore he felt a hard, cold finger touch his ankle, a sharp nail leaving a sizzling line of pain. With a final convulsive heave, Luke propelled himself through the doorframe and into the forgiving light of the basement. As he skittered away on his heels, his eyes were drawn to the square of blackness housing the crawl space. All was silent, only the drumming of blood in his ears. But he may have seen something. Maybe not. Eyes? Black? ageless regarding him from the dark. Some other time, Lucas. We have all the time in the world. The adrenaline curdled in his veins. Luke hurtled upstairs, bawling. His mother was too shocked to insist he go back down. But she got her hangdog husband to bring the trunk up. Luke sat on the front porch, chewing his fingernails to the quick as his father had hauled it up two flights of stairs, quiet as a church mouse. Afterward, he'd given Luke a sheepish grin, his shoulders sunk forward, and his hands deep in his pockets. What are you gonna do? His expression said. Luke had never known his father any other way. He was broken by the time Luke had been born, and was beyond hope by the time he could have been any use to either of his sons. Luke stayed away from his room until bedtime. He begged to stay up a half hour later to read his comics quietly in the family room, but his mother refused. Of course she refused. The tickle trunk sat in the corner of his room. He forced himself to open it. Empty. By then the events in the crawl space had taken on a taint of absurdity. Nightmares get blown apart in the sane light of day, even in a boy's mind. And Luke was a rational boy. Everyone said so. His knees were skinned and his palms scraped, but there was no cut on his ankle from the creature's nails. No, it had been a silly episode. Luke was embarrassed to think about it. But one corner of the trunk had been pried up. A triangle of that strange brown skin was peeled back from its interior as if something had come out through there. A tiny rip, no more than an inch. Would that have been enough? A different boy, 
one more flighty than Luke, might have viewed it as a sign, something wanting him to know it had been inside the trunk, not a figment of his imagination, no way, no how. It wanted to show how it had gotten in and leave the hint that it could easily do it again, any old time it wished. The next day, Luke accidentally spilled fish oil over the trunk. God, that smell could gag a maggot, his father said when he got home. Why he'd been in the proximity of the trunk with a full bottle of fish oil was a fact Luke could never fully explain. But the deed had been done. The room had to be aired out. Luke slept on the sofa for two nights. The trunk was thrown away. His mother had her methods of making Luke pay for that, but at least it was gone. He never saw it again, except for once, years later, in a dream. He dreamed that the tickle trunk sat at the city dump. The moon cast its pallid light over the wind-blown piles of trash. The trunk's lid hung open like a cavernous, toothless mouth. A raccoon trundled through the stinking wasteland. It scrambled up a softening heap to the trunk. Nose twitching, it clawed up the bloated wood to squat on top of it. Next, it screeched, having seen something inside the trunk that must have left it petrified. The lid levered up, snapping closed on its back. The sound of the raccoon's spine breaking was as sharp as the report of a twenty-two cartridge. The raccoon slipped bonelessly inside. The lid closed, the trunk swayed slowly, the way a mother rocks a child in her arms. Inside, the raccoon started to scream. This had been the worst part of the dream, the way the animal had sounded very much like the squall of an infant. A substance resembling red pancake batter burped out of the trunk. The lid opened again. The moon shone down from its icy altar, the dump wrapped in stillness once again. Fourteen The blackness slid away as Luke floated up out of the dream pool. This long-buried memory had flooded back to him whole cloth, the sights and smells and fear that had filled his veins that afternoon in the crawl space, a terror as bright and sharp as lemon juice squirted on a paper cut. Doc? said Al, shaking him with her good hand. You still with me? He was back inside his own skin now. He stood in the triest with Alice, staring at a supply crate that rested in the deepest, most shadowed point of the purification room. How long had he been checked out? It didn't feel like more than a few seconds, and maybe that was all it had been, each second stretching out inside his head. Eight miles above, all over the world, people were forgetting their pasts. Trapped down here in the charmless dark, Luke couldn't escape his own. I'm okay, he said shakily. My memories are so vibrant down here. I, I find that I'm getting a bit lost in them. Sorry. Al said, good to have you back then and turned her attention to the crate. It didn't look like the tickle trunk, not one bit. It was plastic and black and ribbed. Its dimensions were roughly the same, but its lid was flat. No, it didn't look anything like the tickle trunk, yet it held the aura of it. It's like bullies, was Luke's strangely apt thought. They can be hulking and potato-fisted or weasley and slender, it's that cruel quality in their eyes that identifies them as part of the same tribe. Which was idiotic to think this crate had no relation to his old trunk. Luke used to chastise his own son, often far too harshly, for his childish fears, the monster in the closet, the fanged thing under his bed, the fig men. But here he was, an adult, filled with dread at the sight of a crate that projected the same air of coy menace as his old childhood nemesis. Ooh, little old me, the crate seemed to say in a cutesy poo voice. Menacing. No, I'm just a crate, Lukey Lou. I'm a tool that stores other tools. Switching to a Popeye growl. I am what I ams, and that's all that I ams. Hal stepped toward it. No, Luke wanted to say, but why? It was nothing but a crate, a tool that stored tools. Al reached down and cracked the lid. A jumble of spare parts, rooting through them, she found a plastic case. She opened it and shook out a small chip. Bingo. Al closed the lid and latched it. She gave a final considering look, the skin tightening down her throat, before turning back the way they'd come. The chip slotted neatly into the control panel. 
the air quality changed, where before it had held a steely aftertaste that built up like plaque in the back of Luke's throat, now it was, well, marginally better. Al slumped against the wall. I don't get it, she said. That chip just vanished. It wasn't burned out, wasn't busted. It was gone. Same thing would happen on board a sub, too. Things would go missing. The guy's books or personal photos, the little tchotchkes that tethered someone to the surface. In most cases, it was petty thievery, no reason aside from boredom and opportunity. A hollow knock emanated from the recesses of the purification room, back where the crate sat. Knock once for yes, knock twice for no. A few times, though, things went missing and never did get found, Al went on. Was this one guy, Fields, a machinist, carried a photograph of his dead mother in a locket, wore it strung around his neck, woke up one day, it's gone. He tore that sub apart to find it, peered into every cranny, even went through the trash. Nada. He figured someone stole it, hooked it off his neck in the night, but sometimes things just go missing, fall through cracks, you know? The knocking intensified. Luke peered in that direction, but his view was walled off by an impenetrable expanse of gloom. The canisters glowed whitely, a clutch of huge insect eggs laid in the walls. Could be the system's kicking over, Al said, reading his thoughts. Lots of weird noises in a sub, too. Knocks and clunks you can't explain. Only pressure and the ocean's currents, but it can sound a little like... like ghosts, huh? Right. Booga booga. Their laughter sounded both canned and forced, as if they were recording a laugh track on a soundstage. You ever had a man go missing, Al? On a sub, you mean? That'd be the ultimate locked door mystery, huh? I heard about something that went down on another vessel, the SS-228 Stickleback. A guy went missing. They turned that sub inside out, never found him. How do you vanish from a submarine a thousand feet underwater? Turns out this guy got into an argument over a game of cards. Another guy, a sonar tech, hits him with a closed fist. Guy falls and hits the bulkhead all funny. Fractured skull. He dies. So the sonar tech and his buddy, a cook, chopped up the body and fed it into the garbage disposal. Those things could chew up cinder blocks. MPs dredged the disposal, found bits of the guy's spine and rib cage. A new noise floated to their ears, a crisp, somehow silvery sound. The sound of a latch coming undone, maybe. Fifteen. Luke saw it in his mind, the crate's hasp falling open just like the tongue lolling from a tired dog's mouth, the lid opening the tiniest bit, just a hair. Al? I heard it too. Al had this what-the-fuck look on her face. There wasn't a soul back there, only the crate, and whatever was inside the crate, which was nothing. Luke told himself he'd seen inside it, hadn't he? Nothing but tools and... and an unnaturally long hand tipped with jet-black nails. And circuits and nothing else. Not a goddamn thing else. Al stood and moved toward the noise, her boots going tack on the steel grate. She took five steps, then ten. Tack, 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 tack. Her body knit with the darkness carpeting the deeper recesses of the room. That darkness seemed to drink at her body, sucking her in. Luke stood. Al, why don't we... But she'd already melted into the gloom. Tack, 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 tack. The silence stretched. Luke's breath came out in whistling gasps. Al, get your dick swinging ass back here. Let's bug the fuck out. Tack, tack, tack. An enormity of silence. Then Al's voice wafted over the dim. Jesus Christ! No! No! Jesus Christ! Tack! 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 Al flew out of the darkness and barreled into Luke, nearly knocking him down. Her face was set in a rictus of terror. Her mouth, frozen open in fear, emitted a series of choked, hiccuping wheezes. Luke had never seen a grown person look so petrified. He couldn't conceive what could have reduced Al, as sturdy a person as he'd ever met, to a twitching puddle of nerves. A thump! It came from the dark, where such sounds always germinated. From the crate, 
which in his mind's eye no longer resembled a crate at all. It was wooden now, engraved with a pattern of leering clowns. Yuck, 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 coming to get you, Loki Lou. Yuck, yuck, and we're going to finish it this time. It was impossible. It hadn't been possible all those years ago. It had been a manifestation of his overburdened imagination, something his mother had planted, he'd often thought, to coldly chart the effect it would have on her younger son. The trunk was empty. The crate was empty. There was no... A thump. Closer now, closing the distance. How could it get down here? Luke childishly asked himself. The answer was equally childlike in its logic. That's a stupid question. It got down here because it's a monster. That's what monsters do. Luke gripped Al's shoulders. Her body rocked unstably, eyes wide and horrified. What did you see? Luke hissed. For God's sake, Al, what? He's alive, Al whispered. He's... he's still alive. She gave vent to a series of nerveless screams. Still alive! Luke's mind settled around the image with shocking ease. The young sailor, Eldred Henke, crawling out of the crate, his body bloated with seawater, the skin hanging off his bones like hunks of wet wool, his face torn apart by searing metal, squelching toward Al on his water-rotted feet, leaving blots of pulpy black flesh in his wake, lisping, You did this to me. You did this. They were clearly seeing something very unalike. Whatever horror lay inside that trunk was different for each of them, but Luke wasn't sure that mattered. Whatever it was that was making them see those things was no doubt capable of doing to them what it might so easily have done to Westlake. It could tear their brains apart. Go, Luke shoved Al toward the tube. Go, go, we've got to move now. A thump. Al cast a dazed glance toward the noise her face a mix of shock, disbelief, and primal fear. Luke noted the vacant cast to her eyes. She looked utterly barking mad. Prepare the lifeboats, mates. The SS Sanity is capsizing. We're going down. A thump! This time so forceful that the metal grate shivered under their feet. They retreated to the chute, that gaping mouth of darkness. What was your original face before you were born? It was a zen cone. Luke used to recite in veterinary school. Since then, it had a habit of popping into his head at times of direst emergency, like that time Zachary choked on a strip of undercooked bacon and Luke had to give him the Heimlich. What was your original face? He'd never been able to picture his original face, but he realized that was the point of the exercise. It created a mental distraction, a pinprick of tranquility at the dead center of all that twisting fear, an eye of the storm within which he could operate. We can get out of this, he told himself now. I've saved lives before. Animal lives, okay, but a soul's a soul. I can save us both now. You've lost lives, too, his mother reminded him. Lost the most important one. That was true, too. And he was as scared as he'd ever been. A terror more keen than he'd felt at the standing pipe or even in the crawl space. At least then he'd had the whole world to escape into. Now only one congested tube. You go first, he told Al. Al? Al stared gape-jawed into the darkness behind them. A thread of saliva spooled over her bottom lip and down her chin. A thump! A great sinuous flex, as though the darkness itself had gulped. Luke swore he saw something pale and snake-like thrust itself forward. Al! He shook her roughly. Come on! God damn it! Her eyes cleared. She nodded to say she was listening. Luke said, Raise your arms, okay? Keep them above your head like a diver. That should make it easier. Pull yourself, even with that busted hand. It'll hurt like hell, but I'll set those bones again if you need it. And remember the bend, right? Al kept nodding. Okay, yeah, okay. Go, now. Al ducked inside, her head and shoulders swallowed by the chute. When the soles of her boots wriggled out of sight, Luke cast a final look back. There was a border within the room, semi-solid, where light met darkness. Eight appendages stretched over that border. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight fingers, just the tips. Eight fingernails, black, sharp. 
Each finger was spread an unnatural distance from its neighbor, six inches apart at least, an enormous hand spidering nimbly forward. One of those fingers wiggled at him. Hello, Lukey Lou, after all this time, together again. Luke hurled himself into the chute. He willed himself to breathe steadily. If he hyperventilated and passed out, he was certain he'd awaken to find that ghastly hand curled possessively around his ankle. The chute closed over his head. The sea pressed down on him. Breathe, Luke, for God's sake, just breathe. He settled into a system, anchoring his feet against the slick metal and pushing off with his toes, inchworming through the chute. It was like doing a thousand consecutive calf raises. His muscles screamed. A thump! It was at the mouth of the tube now, five feet away, maybe less. It was easier to breathe with his hands over his head, opening up his lungs. He hit the bend, but knowing it was coming, was able to contort his body. His toes skittled on the metal, which was maddeningly clingy and oily at once. What was your original face before you were born? He willed himself to calm down. His calves were quivering. For all he knew, he'd ripped the tendons clean off the bone. Screech! Nails on metal. The hand was inside the chute, scratching toward him, tapping and feeling its way forward like a blind and hungry tarantula. Luke stretched out, his fingers creeping, his toes muscling his aching body forward inch after painful inch. He pictured the chute elongating the same way the crawl space had years ago, an endless suffocating tunnel, the perfect kill zone. No, it had an end, and he was reaching it. He could hear Al stumbling out someplace ahead. The air tasted a bit less polluted. It couldn't be far now. Screech! On his boot now a fingernail scratching down the sole, gouging the rubber. Luke bit back a shriek. Don't fall through the trap door and into the snake pit now, sonny boy. You fall now and it's game over. No more tokens. And surged forward on a tide of adrenaline. Another push. Another calf muscles twitching, sweat soaking his overalls. Another push. Mouth wide and gasping, fingers reaching. The shoot ended. Alice's strong hand clutched his wrist and yanked him out. They stood in the tunnel, panting. The hatch was ten feet away, a mellow coin of light shone through its porthole. LB would be out there, waiting. They ran for it like kids fleeing the boogeyman, which, in a way, they absolutely were. Luke hazarded one last look back. He couldn't help himself. He almost wanted to thumb his nose. Nya, nya, missed me, missed me, now you've got to kiss me. The hand was visible at the end of the chute. Huge, even bigger than he remembered. It's five fingers. No, 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 it has eight fingers. Eight, like a spider. Its fingers rested on the swell of the tube, each a good five inches apart. Luke's mind performed a few lunatic calculations. What was the distance between the access chute's mouth and the crate? A hundred feet, at least. That hand had crawled across the purification room and through the chute. How much farther could it reach? Perhaps the hand was attached to an arm that unspooled endlessly. No, it had to eventually attach to something, didn't it? A body? A host? When Luke tried to envision that body, an image flared briefly in his skull. His mind sprinted swiftly away from its nightmarish outline. The hand raised up ever so slightly, rocking side to side, waving goodbye. Ta-ta, Lukey Lou. We'll be seeing each other again real soon. We'll be close by. We've always been close. Bye for now. TTFN. 16. LB yipped excitedly as they staggered out of the hatch. They looked to have aged a half a decade since they'd stepped through it. They were slick with the kind of adrenal perspiration that squeezes from the pores like the sweat off foreign cheese. Their overalls were stained with that unnameable oil coating the chute, the fabric ripped from their... escape? What had they been running from? Al's overalls were torn across her belly, a slash like a sagging mouth that revealed her abdominal muscles. They hunched, hands on knees, gathering their breath, unable to look each other in the eye. The fear Luke had felt... The nattering, mindless fear of a child already seemed foolish, mostly. 
Were he to stare through the porthole into the cramped, dimly lit tunnel, he knew he'd see nothing. Yet he couldn't bring himself to look. He couldn't convince himself that what he'd seen hadn't been real either. If not enough to hurt him physically, then at least to damage or even destroy his mind. You're being played, Luke. It felt that way. Stupidly, he almost believed it, too. Every angle cut off, every attempt to escape thwarted. He felt much like a rat down a hole with terriers chewing after him and the rat catcher somewhere above stomping his feet to make the ground thunder, as if some calculating force was funneling him toward a dire certainty, the contours of which Luke could only dimly grasp. Let's be serious here, brother. It's probably a classic case of the sea sillies. Clayton's voice. You mustn't discount that possibility, oh brother of mine. Luke hadn't discounted it. Or that could be the gets taking hold. It could happen just this way. A person began to imagine things. That they are pursued by faceless hunters. Their childhood nightmares come back to snatch them. The world warped and their brains warped right along with it. And if two sad souls catch it at the same time, Clayton chimed in, well, it can certainly accelerate their mutual deterioration. They both start grasping at the same straws. They're plagued by the same phantoms, wouldn't you agree? Luke glanced at Al. He didn't see any sores on her face or hands. If she was spotting already, he couldn't see it. As for Luke, he could feel a stress pimple beginning to hatch under his lip, but that was about it. L.B. rucked under his elbow, prodding him with her snout. She licked his palm, her head cocked at a quizzical angle. I know this dog, Luke thought, scrupulously itemizing his surroundings. Her name is L.B. She is a chocolate lab, a bit small for her breed. We are eight miles below the surface of the Pacific. The woman beside me is Lieutenant Alice Sykes, U.S. Navy. I am Luke Nelson, a veterinarian. I live at 34 Cherry Hill Lane in Iowa City. My wife's name is Abby. My son has a chevron-shaped birthmark on his right arm. He shook his head angry at himself. My ex-wife's name is Abby. My son had a chevron-shaped birthmark. What do you think, Doc? Al asked. Are we going bug fuck nuts down here or what? What I saw in there, pointing toward the purification room, can't exist. I know that. But I saw it. I saw that hanky kid crawl out of that fucking crate, scuttling like a crab with his wet flesh falling off his bones. And he never took his gaze off me, Doc. His eyes were clear and cold and so fucking angry. It can't be, but it is. Down here, it is. Luke lifted his foot to get a look at the sole of his boot. A ragged trench was gouged through the rubber. He was only mildly shocked to see it. We've got to find that generator, Al. Al nodded, content to have a plan. We can do that. They returned to the main lab, returned to the buzz behind the door marked LW, dulcet now, even harmonic. Al's gaze flitted toward Westlake's lab. Luke sensed it took a great effort for her to pry her eyes away from it. Clayton was inside his lab. Luke saw him through the porthole and hammered his fist on the glass. Clay, open up. We've got to talk. Clayton's hand was bandaged to the wrist now. Viscid fluid leaked through the gauze, thick and translucent, the consistency of five-minute epoxy. It had gummed to the sleeve of his overalls, forming a white crust like the stuff that forms at the edges of a horse's mouth when it's been run too hard. Clayton approached the hatch, a strange smile pasted on his face. He draped that curtain over the porthole to shield his lab from view. God damn it, Clay! Luke hit the glass hard enough to rake the skin off his knuckles. We need your help. You need ours. Screw it. Leave him in there, Al said. It's where he can do the least harm. Think of how long we've been down here, Luke. Look at how it's affecting us already. Look at what it did to Westlake, too. Your brother and Dr. Toy. We can't trust anyone who's been down here that long. They headed down the tunnel that led to Westlake's quarters. Al said she was pretty sure the generator was stored in that area of the station. How's your hand? Luke asked once they'd made it to Westlake's room. It's fucked, she said simply. You did what you could. It feels a lot better, but it's still busted up. I'd love to pop a few heavy-duty pain pills, but they make me sleepy and I prefer to stay awake. That's a good idea, Luke said grimly. Or if we do, we should sleep together. 
Al cocked a Spockian eyebrow at him. Belatedly, Luke realized what he'd said. A flush crept up his neck. Pretty small beds down here, she said with a nod at Westlake's cot. Trapped in the tension of that moment, Luke wanted to kiss her. She wasn't one of the stereotypical corn-fed Iowa beauties he'd grown up around, but then neither was Abby, with her raven hair and Nordic cheekbones. Yet there was something deeply alluring about Alice, an aliveness, a wildness, even. It would be like making love to a Valkyrie or something. And why not? What could it harm? He was single, lonely, and hadn't felt a woman's touch since Abby left. Alice hadn't mentioned anyone either. They could have a friendly little romp, make love in the foxhole, release some tension, then get back to business. But they wouldn't make love. They would fuck. Rut. Luke was certain of it. Fall upon each other like wolves, tearing and ripping and biting. There wouldn't be an ounce of tenderness or concern for each other's body or needs. It would be a brutal release, a letting go of the pressure they'd existed under for too long. No different than two swollen clouds splitting open with rain. The triest would warp the act, making it loveless and mocking. Afterward, they would be sweaty and bloody in places, ashamed for reasons they couldn't pinpoint, weaker, mistrustful, and less unified than before. I'd do the honorable thing and sleep on the floor, Luke finally said. I'm real gallant that way. The spark that had been kindling in Al's eyes was snuffed. She gave him a strained smile and offered an awkward curtsy. Thank you, my lord, for keeping me safe from predation. Luke smiled. Think nothing of it, my lady. Your virtue must remain untrammeled until you are given away at the Grand Cotillion Ball six months hence. The awkwardness passed. Luke's gaze fell on the stack of Westlake's journals under the cot. Hadn't Westlake commented during that final audio file that he'd continued to update his research in those very journals? I'd like to leaf through Westlake's papers, Luke said. I may find something. Al nodded. The Jenny should be just down this tunnel, through another hatch. I'll check it out while you're in here. Al's footsteps echoed down the tunnel. She still sounded close by, but sound had a funny way of traveling in the station. Luke did hear a hatch hiss open, and next Al was banging around inside. You find it? he called. Yeah, came her reply. It'll need some work. Give me a holler every so often, okay? It'll keep us both alert. Ten four, said Luke. He sat on the cot. His eyes itched with exhaustion. He screwed his palms into his sockets and blinked to clear the fuzziness. LB hopped up beside him. He rummaged through Westlake's gear and located a bag of beef jerky. Saliva squirted into his mouth. He was ravenous. He split it with the dog. LB bolted down the tough rags of beef and licked the salt off Luke's fingers. She tried to stuff her nose inside the bag, but Luke snatched it away. Where are your manners, girl? LB hung her head and watched him indirectly, like a clumsy spy. Luke reached for Westlake's journals. Al was still banging away at a comforting cadence. Luke flipped through the first few journals. Scientific jargon, formulas, stuff Luke couldn't comprehend. He set them aside. He unzipped his duffel bag and pulled out the journal he'd found in the storage tunnel. Psych report. The cover was smeared with that weird ooze. He flipped it open. The first page and many pages thereafter were filled with Westlake's neat and careful handwriting. 17. Wednesday, June 18th. Let me say first off, the idea of keeping a journal strikes me as foolish, but I've been asked to keep a record of my feelings. As my old mentor memorably said, scientists don't have feelings, they have agendas. But a little about myself, since you've insisted. Cooper Westlake, 45 years old, computational biologist, a wife, my third, a daughter, Hannah, seven years old. On a more serious note, I'm grateful to have been selected for this mission. Like most everyone on Earth, I've lost loved ones to the disease, which I refuse to call by its more popular sobriquet. The disease is curable, I'm sure of it. My surety is shared by Drs. Nelson and Toy. That will be all for now. Toodaloo. Friday, June 20th. I've been on board the Hesperus three weeks now. The seasickness is gone, but bad dreams are commonplace. 
Yet a mood of optimism prevails. Having seen Dr. Eva Park's footage of the lanternfish and the results of Clayton's preliminary research, excitement is running high. I have been suffering from nightmares. No, a specific recurring nightmare. There is some background to it. I had my daughter, Hannah, with my second wife. She was born in Belmont, Massachusetts. I was on a grant from MIT. Our neighborhood had wide streets, big lawns, rows of well-kept colonial houses. When Hannah learned to walk, we reorganized our living quarters. We were fastidious in creating a safe environment. But the basement door kept opening. The basement held the detritus of past renters stored in dusty boxes. The steps were shallow, except one step was bigger than the rest. You'd hit that big bastardly step and just about go ass over tea kettle every damn time. The basement ceiling was so low that I'd have to stoop like a crone. There was a sick, fruity odor that thankfully didn't waft up to the next floor. It smelled a little like death. As if a cat or dog had died of starvation down there, or maybe a fright. There were spiders, too, big amber-bellied bastards. Spiders and the odd skittering movement that may have been a rat. I laid down traps but never caught anything. Still, every time I went down, I'd hear something pattering through that warren of old boxes. So, yes, the basement door kept opening, and it attracted my daughter. The first time it happened, my wife alertly swept Hannah into her arms and shut the door. She gave me a recriminatory look, as if I'd left it open. The next time it happened, I was alone, keeping my eye on Hannah without keeping a direct eye on her. As a parent, you develop a sixth sense. When my eyes ticked up, the door was open. Hannah was perched a few feet from the basement stairs. I shot up and gathered her in my arms. She shrieked. Most worryingly, her arms reached toward the basement, as if she'd wanted to fall, as if she believed something down there would catch her. Afterward, I found a wedge of scrap wood and pounded it under the door until the clockwork of veins at my temples thudded with blood. The last time it happened, a blizzard was raging, snow slicing so heavily that we could barely see our neighbor's porch lights. I was distracted. My grant was in jeopardy. The car needed a new muffler off of my own little world. I wondered afterward if it had sensed that and taken advantage. It? How had the wedge popped loose? I'd pounded it in hard, driven by rage and fear. The wood had cracked, pressure holding it in place. Hannah stood at the lip of the stairs. The darkness was such as I've never known. My daughter said one word. Nana. Nana was her grandmother on my ex's side, a narrow-shouldered bird-like thing. But Hannah loved her, and fairly so. The woman doted on her. Nana. One word, spoken clear as a bell. Hannah's arms stretched toward the darkness. I saw it then. Some ineffably old thing dressed in the skin of Hannah's grandmother, the bones showing through in spots, staring up at my daughter and smiling through a mouth of rotted teeth. Come then, honeybug. Come hug your darling Nana. I caught Hannah at the last instant. My index finger slipped inside her diaper between the cleft of her buttocks. I felt the terrible weight of her body straining against the diaper clips. She would have fallen headlong. That or something may have caught her. My eyes fled down the steps, even though every muscle and nerve ending in my body fought it. I saw nothing, just the steps trailing into that twitching darkness. But I felt Something howling up the staircase as loud and clear as if a banshee had shrieked at me. Not a sound, but a sense of need, of hunger. Something was starving in that basement. Something that had been born starving, maybe. It was never full, would never be satisfied. I grabbed Hannah tightly. There came a harsh snick, like the jaws of a bear trap snapping shut. That, and perhaps a ringing note of laughter. We moved out within a week. Shortly thereafter, my wife and I divorced. The usual boring reasons, an accumulation of petty resentments and personal weaknesses. But a sentiment existed beneath those usual ones, unique to us. For two years, we'd lived atop an unknown but festering horror that could have erased us. Whatever had invaded the basement of that colonial home in leafy Belmont had been there a long time. Eventually, it would have beaten me, outsmarted or outquicked me, and as its prize would have claimed what I loved most. It was old, ageless, maybe, and far more cunning than I. How can a rational man run away from a basement? 
How could he admit that he was illogically frightened of nothing? But that sense of threat never abated. It was akin to that taste you get at the back of your throat before a big storm sweeps through. It's imminent. It's coming. All you can do is find safety. Which brings me back to my recurring dream, which is this. I am perched at the edge of those basement steps, about to fall. There is no preamble at all. I drift into sleep, and that's where the dream begins. In this nightmare, I am an adult, and I'm naked, all except for a diaper, the same as Hannah once wore. It should be funny, but in the nightmare, it only adds to the terror. Every trivial detail is precision calibrated for maximum horror. I'm standing at the lip of the stairs with my arms windmilling for balance. I am about to fall. The nightmare seems endless, and yet I am always just about to fall. It is dark at the bottom of the stairs, incalculably so. Something down there is shuffling forward, about to broach that thinning light. I'm staring down, wobbling, and see something. My waking self can't even envision what it is. Some things are confined to dreams, thank Christ. But it is coming. I feel it. It's need. It's limitless, timeless hunger. And then I wake up. (laughs) Ha! I can't believe I wrote all that. I'd be laughed out of every academy in the country if this were ever found. And look, I've dulled three pencils making a potential laughing stock of myself. Who cares? I can't sleep anyway. Why? Well, great galloping goose shit I've just told you, haven't I? No matter. This has been very cathartic. It will all be burned tomorrow. Unreadable ashes. Monday, June 23. Well, here we are again. I didn't end up burning anything. Never found the time, or, I suppose, the inclination. I write to you from inside the treest, belly of the beast. The journey down was surreal. We are creatures of daylight. That a world might exist below our own, a world of permanent night, is unthinkable. It is akin to asking a man to live on the moon without a spacesuit. Thank God for Al. The woman is armor-plated. She brought us down one by one, Clayton, then myself, then Hugo. The animals and insects came last. The treeist is horrible. My first thought upon glimpsing it in the Challenger spotlights was a spider, some hideous arachnid, like the ones lurking in the basement of my Belmont home, impervious to pressure, insensitive to light, its limbs spread across the ocean floor, and we would be inside of it, in its twitching, repulsive guts. The ceilings are low and ribbed. They truly did give the feeling of an intestinal tract. Odd noises race overhead, the pattering of footsteps. The pressure is palpable. More than once I've run my hand over my head to assure myself the crown of my skull hasn't been driven flat. Each of us has our own private lab. We were shown to our cots in the bathroom quarters. Our waste goes into durable plastic bags which were vacuum sealed. Our deposits would be ferried to the surface for disposal. Alice made a crack about spending fifteen years in the Navy only to end up a shit carrier. We laughed, but laughter holds a strange resonance down here. The acoustics rob the joy from it, making it sound spiteful and desperate. When Alice ascended, a pall settled over the three of us. Now that I'm down here, I can see that humans should not exist in such a place. The first night I dreamed of a squirrel. We used to have them around the yard of my childhood home in Lydiard, Connecticut. Big, fat ones. They loved the peanuts my father would leave out for the jays and cardinals. He would shoot the squirrels with a pellet gun. A narrow-minded bastard was my father. One afternoon, I found one of them beneath the chestnut tree. It lay face up and appeared to be breathing. But then I saw the tiniest scarlet star where one of its eyes should have sat. The spot where the pellet went through and smashed its brain. The squirrel's chest burst open and maggots spilled out, wriggling and tumbling over its coarse dark fur. I'd never seen maggots. The closest I'd ever gotten is when I'd smashed a fly on a window pane and spied a hundred white specks, fly eggs, streaking the glass. The maggots boiled out of the squirrel's chest cavity, squiggling in the grass. I raced down the street, wanting to put as much distance as possible between me and that horrible sight. So yes, I dreamed of that squirrel, and of the maggots, too. But within their squirming lay another sound, sly and febrile, the buzz of honeybees. Everything is normal. Such dreams are to be expected. Luke paused. L.B. had been resting on his lap, 
She stirred, looking up at him questioningly. He couldn't hear anything down the tunnel. Hey, Al, he called. Everything okay? For a moment, nothing. Then her voice filtered back to him. It's okay. I'm trying to figure out this Jenny. Need a hand? Funny, Doc. Real funny. I could use two good hands, but I'm managing with this one. Luke petted LB, giving her those long strokes down her back that every dog enjoys. She whimpered gratefully and settled her head against his stomach. Luke yawned so wide that his jaw cracked. He picked the journal up and started to read again. Thursday, June 26. As a child, I banged my thumb with a hammer. The thumbnail went black as a layer of blood formed between the nail plates. The entire nail peeled off. Underneath was a gummy residue of old blackened blood. That's how my mind feels down here. A layer of blackness exists between my brain, the functioning gray matter, and my skull. It makes thinking difficult. The three of us have kept to ourselves the past day or so. It's hard telling the days apart with no sunlight to mark the passage of time. The first few days, we'd shared meals together. Conversation was sparse but cordial. But the fondness established between us on the Hesperus dried up. We'd been having difficulty locating the ambrosia. The sensors picked up nothing at all. Clayton had been working with the smallest shred culled from Dr. Parks's specimen and parceled out between him and Dr. Fells. It was nearly gone, either vaporized or collapsing from some organic malaise. The seafloor was empty. Had the station been built in the wrong spot? Was there any more ambrosia to be found? Hugo, in particular, is far from a happy camper. He complains bitterly about the temperatures, admittedly frosty, the food and other petty inconveniences that should be expected when one is living at the bottom of the Pacific. Hugo is agitated, too. His eyes scan the tunnels as if he's tracking something, a runaway lizard or guinea pig, perhaps. I've seen him blink, flinchingly, as though tiny balls of heat lightning were popping in front of his face. Yesterday I encountered him in the animal lockup, a glazed expression on his face, drool bubbling from his lips. The sea sillies, I believe Al called them. As yet the bees register no adverse effects. The dogs seem jumpy and sensitive, however. Clayton claims it's natural, but I'm not sure Clayton understands emotions at all, canine or otherwise. As for my own mental well-being, I feel as one ought to when eight miles underwater in a conglomeration of spidery metal hoses that could collapse on my next breath, combing the ocean floor for scraps of effluvia. I had another nightmare last night. I suppose I should speak of it. A man named Huey Charles killed five children in my hometown when I was a boy. He was, of all things, an ice cream man. He drove a white truck with a rainbow on the side. The van played a jingle as it drove down our sedate streets, a tinkling song sort of queer, like when you open the lid on a music box to see a little ballerina pirouetting inside. tink a tink tee ta tink a tink tee Huey. He asked that you call him Uncle Huey. Was a rotund, bespectacled man. The last man you'd pick for a child killer, despite the fact that he was an overalls-wearing Pied Piper who drove the equivalent of a glue trap for kids. I remember his glasses, greasy and dirty, the edges gritted with the crust that accumulates at the edge of your eyes when you're sleeping. I never ordered soft serve from him. I was revolted by the thought that some of that eye crust might sift down from Huey's glasses onto my vanilla swirl. He killed three boys and two girls. Although he didn't just kill them, do creatures like Uncle Huey ever just kill? What he did was beyond anything you could imagine. He was patient. Years passed between the disappearances. He had a sixth sense, I guess, about when to strike. Those like Huey usually do. He'd wait until the daylight was guttering, until that last kid scampered up to his truck. He'd ask if they wanted one of his special Sundays. Just step into the back, then, where it's dark. If that child's parents should happen along, okay, well, Huey was only making the kid a special treat. That, Huey, what a guy. He was well-liked around town, though nobody would have called him a friend or could recall spending time alone with him. He was a member of the Elks, the KFC, the Rotary Club. He'd stuff his bloated butt into a tiny car, slap a red fez on his head, and putt-putt down Main Street during the Ledyard Shriners Parade. Yes, good old Uncle Huey. Now, if that child's parents didn't happen along, well, I imagine a certain look must have come into Uncle Huey's eyes. And the time that child realized the danger in that look was the same moment it ceased to matter. He took them to the woods, 
Lots of woods in that part of the country. Deep, dark, silent. A kid's scream could easily be mistaken for the shivering cry of a loon or the screech of a mountain lion. What he did to them never made the papers, only the insinuations. One article said the police found a large tool chest in Huey's house with the word toy box on the lid. Plus, there was the fact that the funerals were all closed casket affairs. One of the girls lived a few blocks away from me, Tiffany Childers. In my memory, she exists as a cliché. Blonde hair spilling over her shoulders in ringlets, a star spray of freckles across her cheeks. They never found Tiffany's head. That little tidbit did leak out to the public. Loose lips at the coroner's office. Anyway, the dream. I'm in the woods. An orange band of light limbs the horizon, casting its light between the firs. Huey's truck rests on the periphery of my sight. I can see the rainbow on the side. I walk toward it, not wanting to, but helpless. The truck's making that tinkling jingle. Ta-ta-tee, tinka-tinka-ta-tee. It's awful, not even a song. It's just a discordant collection of notes, an ugly sonic slap. The truck's back doors are thrown open. The sun gashing through the trees highlights the slashes of blood on the white paint. Things are hanging inside, dangling down beside the soft serve machine and next to the sleeve of sugar cones. Parts of bodies, they hang on snarled lengths of copper wire. They brush against one another in a breeze that skates across the forest floor. They make a faintly musical note, like wind chimes. They shouldn't, but they do. I look down and see that I'm wearing a white uniform, Uncle Huey's ice cream man uniform. I am fat, my belly swelling to the point I can't see my belt buckle. Suddenly I realize I cannot see very well either. It's as though I'm staring through a crusty, grease-smeared window. I become aware of the sound of my own insectile thoughts. Imagine lowering a boom microphone into a tub of night crawlers, that squishy, squirming sound. That is the noise inside my skull. And the worst part is, I'm at home with that sound. I awoke back in the triest, in the tunnels. I'd gotten up and walked out of my quarters. I've never sleepwalked before, ever. I was caressing a pipe running down the tunnel, caressing it as I might the leg of my own daughter to soothe her to sleep. I had an erection, a raging hard-on, one better suited to a hormonal teen. Even my second wife, the most inventive hellcat I've ever shared a bed with, couldn't bring me to such nail-pounding hardness. Morning wood. That's all it was. Morning wood. Monday, June 31st. Success. We've discovered trace elements of ambrosia. The sensors picked it up two days. Time has surrendered most of its meaning down here. Ago. With good news, though, comes bad. Hugo has isolated himself. Surely you know this already, having watched it on the monitors. He has locked himself in the animal quarantine quarters, abandoning his lab. He's got the sea sillies, all right. A crippling case. Clayton and myself debated capturing him to make sure he didn't punch a hole in the wall with the first sharp object he could lay his hands on. But he doesn't strike us as dangerous, only terrified and mistrustful. Not long before he locked himself up, I encountered Hugo in the main lab. He'd switched on the spotlights and was staring over the ocean floor. It is, admittedly, a soul-sapping vista. Your heart trembles just to see it. If you look long enough, Hugo said, you can see it move. Hugo's hair was unkempt, his overall stained, and his odor quite foul. See what move, I asked. The floor out there, said Hugo. It moves in waves. It stares at us with a trillion eyes. I dropped my own eyes, speechless. It was awful to see a man go crazy right in front of your face. But I didn't blame Hugo one bit. Mine's crack down here. Pressure bursts pipes, as the saying goes. We'll be able to leave soon, I told him. Try to think of that. It helps me, Hugo. A simple lung full of fresh air. Think of that. Hugo stared at me. His face was a horrid, shuddering mask. We're not going anywhere, Cooper. We're caught now. It's got us. They've got us. We built our own trap, 
and now we're snared. It, they, Hugo, for Christ's sake, I said, rising to quick anger. Get a grip. Think of your family. Hugo hissed at me, truly hissed like a vampire staked through the heart. You fucking fool, he said. Why think of things you'll never see again? Unnerved, I retreated into my own lab. The honeybees droned comfortingly. They buzzed sluggishly around, ferrying sugar water from the feeders to their hives. Bees are the most mathematical creatures on Earth. Their hives are marvels of geometric functionality. The drones map out their nectar-collecting routes better than a computer, calculating the shortest distance between pollinating buds. The bees were the first, and so far the only species in that phylum, to develop the condition we now recognize as the disease. The G word, CCD, or Colony Collapse Disorder, was noted many years ago. Entire hives were obliterated, death in the billions. Imagine it, a population the equivalent of New York or Cairo decimated in days. How had it happened? Several possibilities were bandied about. Parasitic infections, fungus, mold, the use of antibiotics by beekeepers. Then Dr. Curtis Smales at the University of Birmingham tendered the theory that the bees were simply forgetting to do the things bees always did, the tasks grafted into their genome. Life in a hive is perfect in the way things in nature often are. The drones collect nectar, build the combs, make honey, and defend the hive— the queens produce offspring and royal jelly. Dr. Smales noticed that the hives suffering from CCD were populated by bees that were no longer fulfilling their roles. The queens stopped giving birth or did so randomly. Drones flew miles from the hive, collecting no nectar, coming back empty-handed. They would fly into ponds and drown, sting other creatures for no reason and die. They'd become fatalistic. Bees are ritualistic, and they were abandoning their rituals. No, we realized in time, not abandoning, but forgetting. Thus bees became the first bellwether of the disease. The honey bee in the coal mine, you could say. My specimens were healthy when we arrived, but they are now displaying the initial symptoms of CCD. Honeycombs going untended, decreasing numbers of larvae. The bees fly without purpose, bumping into the lab walls. The floor is littered with expired specimens, if this continues, they'll all be dead in a matter of days. The footsteps overhead, racing along the ceiling, it sounds so much like the running of children, of Hannah's own footsteps in our Belmont home. It's disorienting, like so much of life down here. I don't like it. June 32nd? Maybe, baby. There is a hole in the station. Teeny tiny no bigger than a pinprick. It appeared on the wall nearest the hives. The hole is dark, nearly the color of the metal itself. I wouldn't have noticed were it not for the strange pull it emits. It's not an unpleasant sensation. I can only liken it to a scalp massage, except the fingers are inside one's skull, manipulating the gray matter. I covered the phenomenon with a long strip of duct tape. I didn't want to touch the hole. It seems unwise. Having done so, the pull lessened. I confess, I missed the pull. July something something. Day, date, immaterial. We were able to harvest a sample of ambrosia. Clayton did it. I wasn't there. A tricky procedure, but Clayton, of course it had to be Clayton, nerves of steel Clayton, corralled it through the vacuum trap. Good on him. We got less than a thimbleful. It was split between Clayton and myself. We did not speak while he portioned it out. We haven't really spoken to one another for days, a week, I couldn't tell you. Silence is our element now. Silence and darkness. I have stopped attending my psychological counseling sessions, too. I suspect Clayton has done the same. And Hugo, of course. I have not told Clayton about the hole. I like to look at it, I must say. The ambrosia, I mean. It's strangely entrancing. The hole is entrancing in much the same fashion. The hole has grown. It consumed the tape placed over it, a slow suctioning, the tape stripping from the metal and tugged through the engorged opening. A sight were you to watch it from start to finish. I did not, being asleep for some of it. 
that would be reminiscent of an infant's toothless mouth devouring a velvet ribbon. I've performed tests captured on audio files, knocking and howling sounds, laughter, perhaps. There appears to be some rudimentary intellect at work. Not the whole itself, I can't imagine that, but whatever lays in the dark space beyond. My tests are ongoing. I perform them in secrecy. Clayton would only meddle. We did visit Hugo recently, Clayton and I. We hadn't heard from him in some time, other than a random banging that could have been Hugo bashing his fists on the tunnels. Clayton felt that he may have been roaming around while we slept. He claims to have seen shadows stretching across the walls where the tunnels bend out of sight. Hugo would not let us in. He is a fright, a gibbering ghoul. His mind has come unglued. He screamed at us through the porthole, refusing to unlock the hatch. He held up a piece of notebook paper that said, You are not who you say you are. Clayton has alerted topside operations. It may be best to have someone, perhaps Al, who Hugo trusts, come and take him away. He's of no use to the mission now. Has Hugo encountered a hole, too? No, I don't think so. The hole is meant for me and me alone. I took my ambrosia to the lab. The bees were very close to extinction. I'd swept up hundreds of carcasses. I introduced the lion's share of the ambrosia into the sugar water receptacle. My hope was that the unaffected specimens would ferry it back to the hive. I trapped a few other bees, the sick, baffled ones that buzzed aimlessly into the walls, dabbed their abdomens with red ink to identify them, and fed them ambrosia-fortified sugar water with a dropper. The footsteps. There they go again, pattering overhead as I write this. I see the shadows on the walls, too. Clayton is not alone in that. Luke's eyeballs itched. His shoulders were tight. Westlake's journal had developed a sinister momentum. The handwriting, which had started out neat and clinical, was starting to erode. Some of the pages were crumpled, as though Westlake had clenched his hand into a fist while writing. Most worryingly, it... It seemed to be speaking directly to Luke. A voice behind the printed words whispered softly into his ear. Fingers crawled up the back of his neck, Westlake's scarified fingers racing ticklingly over his scalp. What an idiotic notion. Nothing is idiotic now, he told himself. The worst mistake you can make is to think it's idiotic. He could still hear Al down the tunnel banging away. It held a rhythmic note like the pump of a piston in a slow-running engine. Bang, bang, bang. His eyes snapped open. He'd let them slip shut, lulled by that banging which matched the beat of his own heart. A shadow twisted across the wall where the tunnel bent. He watched the hatchway, thinking something. Fingers, four small fingers, a boy's small fingers, might wrap around the gray metal. When that didn't happen, his eyes fell back to the journal. The pages hooked his gaze, tugging insistently. Westlake's voice, cold and raspy with death, said, You need to know, Lucas, because down here anything can happen. Anything at all. 18. Science Day. This place repulses. There is nothing to nourish the soul. Nothing but man-made angles and inert materials. Nothing is cut from nature, holding the supple appeal of objects that God has touched. God's finger doesn't reach down this far. Today I wept while brushing my teeth. I wonder why I even do it now. I bought the toothbrush months ago on a shopping trip with Hannah. She'd pirouetted down the aisles, flipping silly items into the cart. A piping bag, adult diapers. She thought it was hilarious when I'd take them out, sigh dramatically, and set them back on the shelves. The toothbrush is old now, its bristles bent. But I bought it in a well-lit supermarket eight miles up and however thousand miles distant, on a day when the sun shone brightly and I'd played foolish games with my daughter. And now I'm here, crouched in the loveless belly of this spider station. Hannah is part of another world, one I have no grip on. And so I'd stared at my toothbrush with its sad dab of minty paste, and I'd cried. The tears came effortlessly, 
Some days I cry without quite realizing it. The hole is growing. Days ago, it ate my microphone. Hungry, hungry hole. I hear voices. They are not made by anyone aboard the station. A bee stung me on the arm. Who cares, right? You're a scientist who works with bees, Westlake. Surely you've been stung before. And surely I have. But the pain was much sharper this time. The bee had a red ink marking on its abdomen. I watched it fly away in the narcotized manner that all bees possess after they've stung. Their guts are unraveling out of their bodies, which makes them fly wonky. I pursued it in a frenzy, knocked it down and stomped on it. Its body exploded under my boot with a satisfying gooey pop. There, fucking thing. There you go. I couldn't find the stinger in my flesh. A terrifying thought came to me. It had burrowed into me. There was an inflamed red bump that itched awfully. I dressed it with ointment and a band-aid from the medical kit. I did not tell Clayton. We rarely speak. There is open hostility when we do. I believe he is spying on me and told him as much. Clayton labeled my accusation absurd. Of course he would. Maybe it's Hugo, he said, or maybe you're losing it, Westlake. I nearly slugged him. I feel perpetually spied upon, eyes tiptoeing over my skin at all hours. As such, Clayton and I pass each other like submarines in the night. Ha! Before our argument, I did run into Clayton in the main lab. I found him at the window. I, too, find myself staring, bewitched over that carpet of marine snow. I envision it stretching out, lunar-like and lifeless beyond the spotlight. The ambrosia drifts in far greater concentrations now. We've collected a good deal. Clayton's aspect has changed. Gaunt, wan. Lack of sunlight, of course, but Clayton always seemed bizarrely luminous. I picture a huge insect under his overalls, a giant tick battened onto his back. Unbeknownst to him, this tick is sucking out his bodily juices. It's growing, gaining strength, while Clayton bows like a hunchback under its blood-bulged weight. I haven't been able to contact the surface for... A day, he said somewhat falteringly. Neither of us are aware of time anymore. The minutes and hours and days blend, which inspires a certain gaiety of mind for men like us who feel as though we've spent our adult lives in the shadow of a constantly ticking clock. What's happened? A storm of some sort, he said. Under the water, it's interrupting the signal. I took this in stride. Part of me was heartened. I was worried they might send a team down to round up Hugo. If so, they might snoop around my lab. I don't want that. The ambrosia's effect on the colony has been remarkable. Both hives are thriving. The drone can be heard outside the lab now. Bees festoon the bench, the walls, and roof. The question is, has the ambrosia cured the disease, at least insofar as it manifests in honeybees? Cured it, or has it actually altered their basic cellular structure? Are they even bees anymore, as we commonly conceive them? The bastard bee that stung me. The itch is worsening. A painful, maddening sensation. I have not scratched it yet. I'm terrified to. The skin has swollen so badly that the band-aid has torn loose. A puffy, awful ant hill throbs on my arm. The hole in the center is a deep and pestilent yellow. I will not scratch. I will not. Update. I scratched. Ha. July? Want to hear a story my mother told me? My mother was a Bible basher. Bashy bash bash that Bible, ma. Ignorant dilettante scaremonger. This story wasn't in any Bible. Don't know where she got it, her crazy-ass stepfather. Yes, so. Once there was a great exorcist. He saw demons in the waking world. They were everywhere, perched on some poor fucker's shoulder, wrapped around a sinner's waist, its filthy hands down the man's pants, inciting him to vice. Most of them were pests. 
parasitic hellspawn who created havoc in the minds of weak men, leading them to cheat on their spouses, beat their kids, steal from their employers. But there were some very bad demons. They weren't physically big, necessarily. One of the worst was no bigger than a fruit fly. It had perched inside the ear of a victim, dripping poison into that person's brain. The body of another was gauzy and fungoid. It wrapped around a man's head like a cocoon. It looked like a tent caterpillar nest in an oak tree. Nobody could see them but the exorcist. He banished them. The same demons more than once in some cases. And there was a place, my mom said. A nexus where they congregated. A deep, dark place. When the exorcist banished a demon from its host, it fled back to this spot. Sometimes the demon would remain down there a long time. It was difficult to get out, you see. The demons would swirl around, nipping and snarling, waiting for the opportunity to ascend to the human realm again. These demons killed the exorcist. Eventually, inevitably. He didn't fling himself out a window like old Father Karras. Each encounter left scars on the exorcist, not physical, but psychic. These powerful demons hacked at the exorcist's brain, taking swipes like with a tiny razor, each fight wrecking him a little more warping his reasoning until he couldn't fight them any longer. His body was found in an alley behind a cathedral where he'd fled seeking sanctuary, his face torn off by feral dogs. I think of my mother's story now, that deep, dark place. If you had to hide something, if you were God, say, and could command it, if you wanted to hide the worst, most threatening things you could imagine, well... We're better. Answer me that. We're better. Sunday fun day. The hole is bigger. I could fit my fist through if I tried. I confess that I want to try. Very badly, in fact. The bees cluster around it, buzzing, investigating. I keep waving them away. The hole is dark, much darker than the surrounding metal. The hole shimmers like water, is black as the water, but is not water. We'd all be dead, wouldn't we? Are we dead yet? Mana mana day. It is inside me. I dreamed of a boa constrictor eating a naked infant. The baby made no sound as it was consumed, although its eyes were round and wide with horror. I haven't left the lab in... Time scallops down here. Have I said that already? Days, weeks, months, minutes, seconds. Everything is liquid and ever-shifting. It's safe in the lab. Nobody can see me. What's happened to me? The bee sting has multiplied. Despite my never getting stung again, instead of one inflamed anthill, dozens now festoon my flesh, like giant pulsating zits. I've squeezed them, too, hoping for a gout of yellow pus, and with it some relief. But the skin beneath each hill is hard, calcified, and it hurts immensely just to touch them. My arms, legs, chest, stomach, buttocks, all covered with these inflamed hills. Fresh hills have appeared on my armpits and recently my big toes. So far they have not appeared on the soles of my feet or my hands. If so, I fear I'll be immobile. The merest brush with any obstruction brings forth blinding pain. My palms are unmarked as yet, too, meaning I can still write. I haven't seen anyone for some time. Every so often a staccato knocking sound will pierce the drone of the bees, but I don't know if it's Clayton or Hugo or something or someone else. One knock for yes, two for no. I have no use of Clayton or Hugo anyway. To hell with them. I have my study. I left the lab only once. I cleared the massing bees from the porthole window and saw the main lab was empty. I dashed out. Not a single bee fled my lab. Once out, I realized there was nothing I wanted. I wasn't hungry. I haven't wanted to eat for a long time. I needed no equipment. My gaze fell upon the window. Darkness pressed against the glass, an insistent swirling. Shreds of ambrosia sucked over its surface like remoras. The urge struck. 
find something heavy. A crowbar was the object that sprung to mind and smashed the window until it splintered and the sea rushed in. I retreated to my lab, to my colony. It is monstrous. It has tripled, quadrupled in size. The bees carpet the walls and bench and ceiling, a humming, droning, fuzzy, black and yellow carpet. They do nothing but collect and build. I have provided the material, three sacks of refinery sugar slit open with a scalpel. The bees have abandoned their hives. They are building new structures. A beehive is a marvel of mathematics, a home of hexagonal cells, the sides of each cell meeting at precisely 120 degrees. The hexagon is the perfect shape for storing the most honey while using the least beeswax. Every honeybee is born with the knowledge of how to build a honeycomb. They instinctively know that hexagons are the building blocks of their homes. But these bees are building something else entirely. Two hanging cathedrals. They descend inverted from the ceiling on opposite ends of the lab. Each is baffling to behold. The human eye can't stare at them for too long, in the same way one cannot stare into the sun. Strange and frightening edifices. One almost resembles a stalactite with bizarre corkscrews spiraling off at unnatural angles. The other dwindles in a cochlear swirl with sharp jutting appendages that hold the articulations of robotic limbs. The bees build their hives night and day. Honey is produced but not harvested. The honey, dark and thick as motor oil, drips ceaselessly from each hive, forming sticky pools on the floor. The queens lay somewhere within. I hear them sometimes, an angry, commanding buzz that rises above the general hum. Night. The anthills covering me have worsened, broadened, heightened, connected together on my flesh. They have a uniform look, vaguely hexagonal, like honeycombs. We are just skin. My second wife said this in one of her fouler moods when I had the bad timing to comment on her lovely figure. Me and you and everyone were all just skin and fat wrapped around bones. Yes, I told her, but I happen to fancy the way you're wrapped. My own wrapper is beginning to peel. Ha! <laughs> the pain is exquisite. I am half delirious with it. The instinct arose to show Clayton my condition and seek aid. But I like it too much in my lab with my bees at my wonderful hall. The hives stretch ceiling to floor now. The bees have begun to build into the floor grating. Satellite combs are appearing at the edges of the lab bench in the manner of toadstool ringing an elm tree. The bees are changing, too. Larger is the most obvious difference. Some are the size of hissing cockroaches. They are aggressive toward one another. Bees are communal by nature, so this is strange. They seem obsessive, but in a different way. Instead of building a hive for the purposes of nurturing young and manufacturing honey, the hive itself is their sole ambition, building it, growing it. They are not aggressive. I have not been stung again. They dance lightly up my arms and legs. It tickles. Sometimes I fall asleep and awake with them covering my face tiptoeing over my closed eyes. The air smells of caramelized sugar, a nice smell. Night. A massacre. The bees of one hive attacked the other. I can't imagine what provoked it. The air filled with mad buzz, the sound of a rusted band saw. They fought in the air and on the ground. It was the most vicious thing I'd ever seen. One hive, the cochlear one, has been fading of late. Its honeycomb took on a grayish hue. Its honey was a clotted, sludgy gray. Its drones, while large, were spiritless in their fight against the drones from the other hive. I tried to stop them. How in God's name do you stop a bee fight? I waved my arms, my swollen, itchy, bloody arms, frantically yelling, Stop! Yes, I yelled at bees. It is to laugh. They didn't attack me, but they didn't stop going after one another. They danced gently on my arms as they battled, their stingers jabbing crazily. It was over quickly. The floor was covered with the dead. 
the victorious bees descended upon the cochlear hive, ripping at the rotting honeycomb. They attacked the nesting queen. I never got a good look at her. Her body was covered in drones, layer upon layer. But she was clearly huge. She toppled from her throne and hit the lab bench with a meaty smack. The drone stung and ripped at her. Some have developed rudimentary mandibles. When they cleared off, buzzing sluggishly back to their labors, the bench was empty save a blot of very thick, red royal jelly, the color of blood. Their industry continues unabated. They have grafted their hive to the bones of the cochlear one. It is incredibly large. I have to crawl on my belly to reach the other side of the lab where my hold is. My head mere inches from the dripping comb and that unearthly buzz. The new hive is profoundly disturbing to behold. It beggars mathematics. The eye revolts. I'm sitting beside my fantastic hole now. It is larger. I could probably squeeze a volleyball through it into... The bees are entranced by the hole. They hover nearby, crawling around its circumference in a narcotic daze. They make such lovely noises, the hole. Those resonant knocks and odd, muttersome sounds, musically sweet like voices from another room. If I listen closely enough, perhaps I can hear what they're saying. Am I insane? Does a sane man ask himself that question? <laughs> hey! They came out of me. They were born inside of me, fostered in me, and then they exited me. I am the incubator. I am the queen. The first one birthed from my left elbow. My skin had been stirring restlessly for some time. The flesh hills, fully connected by then, perfect hexagons spanning my body, twitched with hectic life. The bees seemed to pause in their labor, watching me. They overrun the lab now. They bristle on the floor, huge bees, some of them the size of malnourished mice. When I walk, their bodies crunch underfoot. They do not protest or sting me. The remaining bees harvest the ones I've killed, picking the bodies apart with their mandibles and burying them back inside the mother hive, which pumps out a thin drip of tarry, noxious-smelling nectar. I tasted some of it, a child accepting a schoolyard dare. Revolting, a diseased offering from a diseased host. It killed the skin on my tongue, turned it gray and dead. It... It exited my elbow with torturous languor. Its legs, tiny and black and covered in oh-so-delicate fur, slit the top of the flesh hill. It pushed itself out slowly, its body coated in dark pus, a tumor releasing itself from the flesh. It was not as big as its brothers and sisters, and it looked very different indeed. Its head was that of a bee, though its eyes were a bright and fiery red. Its abdomen was flesh-toned. It looked like a severed fingertip, banded with angry red slashes. Its stinger was a cruel spike, dripping venom that sizzled on my skin. They came quickly after that, from my arms and legs and neck and cheeks, from my toes and thighs and buttocks, and a very few small specimens from the thin, vein-strung flesh of my scrotum. I exhaled, mesmerized, as one pushed itself from my forehead. I am Zeus, giving birth to Athena, and trundled over my quivering brow to perch upon the convex of my eyeball. When it was finished, my flesh sagged like the waddle of an old biddy's neck. I was emptied and sundered, but it was perfectly okay. I had given birth to wondrous marvels. They colonized my body, zipping around my head in a protective corona. I was their mother and father. I was their queen. The new queen. The other bees avoid me now. Their buzzing has reached a quailing, fear-struck harmonic. Good. That is good. Not long ago, I advanced on the mother hive. Drones teemed over its surface. My hands plunged through their soft buzzing bodies, sinking into the comb. 
It did not feel firm, as I'd expected. Rather, it stripped away in my hands like the flesh off a long-dead corpse. The bees did nothing to protect their hive. The new bees, my children, battened upon them, sunk in their stingers, and tore their heads off. The old bees did nothing to defend themselves, submitting like weary soldiers at the end of a prolonged skirmish. The comb turned dry and brittle as I ripped toward its center. My arms were coated in that revolting nectar. Here and there, within the combs, I'd discover some abnormal and awful sight. My hand sunk into a baseball-sized pocket of wriggling yellow larvae, the ball coming apart like cheese curds. Next I tore into a vault of festering bee parts, their pulped anatomies tumbling into my upturned face and stuck to the loathsome nectar coating my arms and chest. I knew I was nearing the queen by the sound echoing through the moldering combs, an anxious squeal. The comb was caving in around me, the entire structure collapsing in sticky, suffocating rags. I encountered a small army of defending drones, queen protectors. They were incredibly large, rat-sized in some cases, but they were bloated and blind and seemed as resigned to their fates as the others. I knocked them to the floor and stomped them amid the stinking comb, the ones I didn't kill were dispatched by my progeny, who took great sport in pulling their limbs off and bursting their milky, sightless eyes. I tore through a final vault of coppery comb. It ripped apart like stinking cheese and beheld the queen. A horror. She was immense, the size of a rump roast or a large puppy. She lay in a pool of black, viscid jelly swimming with her birth gelatinous gray grubs that squirmed in that sticky tar, issuing crazed mules like children hungering for their mother's teat. She saw me and knew. I could tell somewhere in her insect brain that she realized her time had come. My progeny darted, harassing her until she let out a bleeding buzz, her jelly-smeared wings shuddering against her bloated frame. Consumed with disgust, I wrapped my hands around her. The queen's body was ribbed, its texture strangely giving. My fingertips sank in without resistance. I squeezed. The queen bleated again, more shrilly. Grubs sputtered out of her backside. I squeezed until her convex eyes swam with blood. Yes, she was full of blood. And finally, with a shuddering sigh, her body ripped apart in my hands. The separate parts thrashed for a few moments before going still. Things went very dark and quiet. When I regained my senses, my tongue felt furry, as if I'd eaten something alive. When, where, why, what, how, hey, yo! The lab is quiet. Only my progeny are left. They crawl and frolic around the hole, which is enlarging ever more flicking their delicate wings. I don't have nightmares anymore, doctors. Thought you'd like to know that. I'm cured. Ha! I've no need of nightmares now. They've invaded the waking world. This is not about the disease. The Getz never was. The Getz was simply the vehicle, the substance whose purpose was to ferry the valuable commodity, us, to the sight of infection. The Getz was the tail we foolishly chased down the rabbit hole. There is no cure down here. There is only madness and malignant evil and death. I should say, if we're lucky, death. We've been tricked, played. Our love and hope and desire to do good for mankind, our need to understand, to conquer, brought us here against our every instinct. I am known I mean to say, whatever lurks down here, and yes, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, something is down here, knows me, knows my history and loves and fears. It has been studying me for a long time, my whole life even. It has met me before and vice versa. It has arranged through some slyboots method to bring me down here. I am in the basement with the beast. It is the same one, I fear, that lurked in our home back in leafy Belmont. That same beast, or somehow connected to it. 
the creature that tried to take Hannah. Hannah! The same beast whose ageless need and hunger howled up those dusty stone steps, the one I fled from like a coward. But you can't run. It will find you, hunt you down and find you. It will lay a trap in the basement of the world and bait it with the sweetest fruit, and it will wait. It's been waiting a long time. It has waited long enough. I put my fingers through, just the tips. Couldn't help myself. Swear to God, swear to God, I couldn't, just could not help it. Funny. Felt funny. Not bad funny. Not good funny. Not joy buzzer funny, just funny. Two fingers, pointer and middle. Same two fingers I'd stick into the bathtub to test whether the water was too hot before bathing my infant daughter. Same two fingers I'd use to finger bang Sue Reynolds behind the utility shed in the ninth grade. Stinky Sue, rosy rotten crotch, slutty Sue, the only one who'd sleep with crater face Cooper Westlake. It began to change. My fingertips shift and swirl. They are the most unique feature of our bodies. Our DNA is expressed in the whirls. And I was seeing them change, and with it a profound change occurring inside of me. I cut them off, just the tips of each finger. Scalpel, chop-chop. It didn't hurt at all. The sound of the blade hacking through the bone was only minorly unsettling. I've heard much worse by now. The severed fingertips kept moving, kept squirming like fat little grubs. The bees tried to spirit them away for their strange gains. I shooed them off, picked the tips up with tweezers, and deposited them through the hole. Have me, if you want, a small piece, a tribute. Won't that be enough? The voices seemed appreciative of my gift but they are growing louder again, hungrier, hungry, hungry hole. I dreamed I was drowning, wanting to die very badly, tried to take a breath, flood my lungs, couldn't. I washed up on the shores of an immense black ocean. The water was thick as molasses, sucking at my bare feet. Hannah was there singing the song I'd once sung to put her to sleep as a baby. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Papa's gonna buy you a mockingbird. And if that mockingbird won't sing, Papa's gonna buy you a diamond ring. Hannah's eyes were huge ovals, dead black, stretching from her eyebrows to the base of her nose. A bee's eyes. The flesh above her nose broke open and a pair of antennae pushed through like bean sprouts from a pot of dirt. I woke screaming, or laughing, so hard to tell. My bee children are cruel. They grow impatient, which leads to mischief. There are a few of the old bees left. My children make terrible sport of one of the old queen defenders. They've torn its legs and wings off. They pinch and slash it. I think they may have tried to copulate with it. Bee rape? Is it possible? If they conceive, what will that baby look like? The hole is much bigger now. The voice is louder. It's as if lips are pressed to the other side of that dark, glittering sheen. If I put my ear to it, I'm sure I'd hear what those lips are saying. I want to put my head through the hole, want to kiss those lips. Whose lips? What's lips? Is that a bad thing to want? I won't put my head through. I am trying very hard not to. Put it through. I cut myself with a razor. Slashed my wrists vertically, not horizontally, the way you do when you're dead serious and not just squalling for attention. Mommy, Daddy, pay attention to me or I'll swallow a handful of kitty aspirin. No. I slid right down the ulnar artery, deep, deep slashes, serious as a fucking heart attack, you bet your ass, the best way to let out a whole nelly gusher of blood. I healed. Almost immediately, I healed. I wept. 
cut again. Wept. Wept. Jesus fucking wept. My children buzzed about my ears, stinging me. Bad mother. Bad mother. Don't hurt yourself, mother. Stay with us. Love us. Be with us forever. Fucking things. Fucking, fucking, fuck, 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 Amazing. Simply amazing. It is beauty. The purest beauty imaginable. The fig men are drawing near. The fig men are here. Lucas, Lucas, come here. Lucas, come home. Come home, Lucas. Come home, son. Daddy, come home. Nineteen. Luke hurled the journal. Pages riffling, it struck the wall. He shook violently, goose flesh pebbling up his scalp. LB's head popped out from underneath the cot where she'd been resting, her eyes darting restlessly. Daddy, come home. Jesus, Jesus Christ. He shouldn't have read it. He knew that belatedly, the same way he'd known he shouldn't watch a scary movie as a young boy, but Luke always had to watch, peeking through his fingers. The final ten pages were partially glued with a rank-smelling substance, the honey produced by those bastardized bees, Luke could only guess, and the last few pages were dark with blood. The journal's final words seemed less written than etched. Each letter had torn through several sheets of paper, their impressions carving deep into the sheets below. The letters were huge slashes, horizontal or vertical, no curves. The O's looked like crazed cubes. Westlake must have wielded his pen like a knife, slashing each stroke several times, ripping and gouging them onto the page. Daddy, come home. It made no sense. Dr. Westlake had no idea who the hell Luke was, that he was a father or Luke's tortured history with his son. Christ, they'd never met. Had Clayton mentioned him? Even if so, what would compel Westlake to write that? The fig men are here. This cut even closer to the bone. How would Westlake know about the fig men, the monsters in Zachary's closet? It made no sense. Luke thought about the words written in blood inside the challenger. The ag may are here. That's how he'd read it. But Al thought the second word was men, hadn't she? Could the A Luke had seen actually have been the capital letter F and a lowercase i combined? Could the blood from a letter F have dripped down, joining the top of that I to become what looked to be a sloppy, too big A? Jesus, had Westlake actually written, The fig men are here? The fig men didn't exist. There was no such thing. There was something his son's fevered imagination had cooked up something Luke himself had fixed, trapping the fig men in obsidian cocoons. He remembered how the act had made him feel like a minor superhero, a human shield. Could the journal be a deeper manifestation of Dr. Westlake's psychosis, rantings and ravings divorced from the truth? Luke wanted to believe so. The honey could be something he'd mixed up in his lab, boiled sugar and some manner of toxic chemical. Physically speaking, the gunk on its pages was the only thing that separated Westlake's journal from your standard loony bin manifesto. It was full of the same delusional thinking, paper shredding pen strokes, and yes, even blood. Home. Come home. Luke had been home. Safe, if despondent, in Iowa City. The treeist, though, wasn't anybody's home. Not the home of anything human, anyway. L.B. clambered onto the mattress and rested her head on Luke's lap. As he massaged her ears, Luke felt the energy coursing through her bunched muscles. Did he really believe it? The bees, the hives, the madness lurking behind the hatch to Westlake's lab? The hole? Westlake had gone insane. 
succumbed to the same pressures that had consumed Dr. Toy, the mental erosion Luke himself had felt from the moment he'd set foot inside the station. Could he possibly believe the journal? Would he do that up on the surface? Presented with those pages, wouldn't he dismiss them as the ramblings of a madman? You would, of course, he told himself. But you aren't on the surface. You know what is on the surface? Westlake's corpse. Do you remember what it looked like? Put that image in your mind, Luke, and ask yourself, what's behind that hatch now? Luke could answer that question easily. It doesn't matter as long as I don't fucking open it. But what if someone else opened it? I believe Westlake, Luke realized with piercing clarity. Not all of what's written, but I believe the ambrosia drove him insane. I believe him enough to realize we're in very serious danger here. Let's assess things, he said to L.B., who pricked up her ears. We've got a broken communication link. We can't contact the surface, and they can't contact to us. We've got an escape vehicle with no power and a current ring that could rip it to shreds if we try to ascend. A crazy person who's locked himself up. Another person, now deceased, who must have gone batshit too. My brother, who'll stay here out of pure stubbornness. We've got Al and you and me, the sane ones. L.B. chuffed, seemingly in agreement. She was a wonderful companion. Luke wondered if, without her, he might have already slipped around the bend. He was getting the dog off the damn station. Lord knows she'd been through enough already. Would you like that, girl? Early retirement? L.B. blinked and licked his cheek. Okay, Luke thought. What's the list? One, get the hell off this station. Mission be damned. Two, take Clayton, drug him if necessary. Three, get back home, bring L.B. Three objectives. It calmed Luke to break the situation down into small goals leading to one ultimate goal. Sunlight, fresh air, home. Granted, there were obstacles. Eight miles of water and pressure. His brother's legendary stubborn streak. A sub without power. And the thing or things inside the station with them. Inside or partially inside or struggling to gain entrance. The thing his brother had willingly invited in. The ambrosia. The thing whose lips Westlake could hear whispering on the other side of his beloved hole. That thing, things, had wrecked Westlake. Oh, maybe it hadn't touched him directly, but it had ruined him regardless. It must have done the same to Hugo. Even Clayton. His brother's mind was stony, but even stone eroded under constant assault. Luke's own resolve was definitely weakening. A phantom hammer tapped along the block of his brain, searching for the seam that, when struck, would crack it in half. Come on, L.B., let's find out. Twenty. Luke had taken a few steps down the tunnel when it struck him that he hadn't heard any noise for quite some time. When he'd last consciously checked, he'd heard Al hammering away. It had possessed that steady, confident rhythm, the sound of a carpenter pounding a nail. Now the silence was eerie. Luke wondered if Al was working on the generator's finer mechanisms. That could be quiet work. Maybe she'd even drifted off to sleep, a little power nap. A nap. That sounded nice. Luke's eyes stung with exhaustion, except hadn't they promised each other not to fall asleep? The storage room was shadowy. The generator sat in a fall of light slanting through the open hatch, a large cylinder made up of several disc-like batteries wired end to end, which made sense. You couldn't use a gasoline jenny in a closed space. Everyone would die of carbon monoxide poisoning. Al? The room was dead empty. Where the hell could she have gone? Why hadn't she come back for Luke? A bolt of panic jackhammered up his spine. What if Al had slipped into one of those same dream pools that he had fallen prey to already? He stepped out of the room. L.B.'s snout was aimed farther down the tunnel where Al must have gone, her tail pointed straight up, quivering. What is it, girl? L.B.'s haunches tensed. She growled, then took off. No! Luke couldn't imagine losing the dog. 
If she disappeared into the warren of tunnels, he'd come apart. He tore after her. Her tail vanished around a bend. Luke pursued heedlessly, not knowing what was around that corner, and in that moment not caring. He flashed around the bend, encountering nothing but stale air, then ran through an open hatchway, had Al left it open, and hurtled headlong after the dog. The tunnel described a wide ambit that descended so gradually that Luke wasn't sure it was happening at all, then tightened into a choking spiral. Luke was hit by a wave of nausea brought on by the disorientation until the tunnel abruptly ended in a crawl-through chute. Elby's rump was wriggling through the far end. She tumbled out, her nails skittering, and raced on. Luke dove into the crawl-through. It was laughably wide in comparison to the access chute he'd been forced to navigate. He shifted onto his back, gripped the rungs, and swiftly hauled himself through. Dropping out of the chute and rounding the near corner, he came to another dead stop. L.B. was hunched before a hatch. The hackles stood up on her shoulders. Easy, girl. Luke ran his hand down her back, feeling the muscles jump. It's okay. It's nothing. Where was Al? This was the only way she could have come. Luke inspected the hatch. It was locked from the other side. Al couldn't open it. So where... A face rose up in the porthole, malevolent and familiar. Dr. Hugo Toy was pallid and shrew-like, his features pinched together on the pasty canvas of his face. But he doesn't look crazy, Luke thought. Last time, yes. This time, no. Dr. Toy looked like a man living under an incredible pressure that had warped his bones. Luke now understood how that pressure could make a man look crazy. He held up his hands, a peaceful gesture. Dr. Toy calculatingly eyed him. A scrap of paper slapped against the glass. Who are you? The paper withdrew. Luke Nelson, Clayton's brother. Dr. Toy nodded, scribbled quickly. Do you feel it? Luke nodded. Yes, everywhere. Dr. Toy shivered. Excitement? Anticipation? Cut yourself he wrote. Luke's brows knit together. What? 
Dr. Toy slapped the paper against the glass. Cut yourself, cut yourself, cut yourself. Luke said, why? I want to see you bleed. Show me your blood. Luke figured he might as well comply. What were a few drops of blood? He crouched over the grate. Its lattices were serrated. He raked the tip of his index finger over one. His skin opened on the third stroke, blood welling down the cut. He showed it to Dr. Toy. Wipe your fingers on the window. Luke did so. Dr. Toy leaned in, nose flattening against the glass. The blood appeared to mollify him. He wrote, I'll let you in, but I'm tying your wrists. I have one of the dogs, Luke said. She can stay outside. Luke shook his head. No way. Dr. Toy bared his teeth. Okay, he wrote back in thick, angry letters. But I tie her up, too. Dr. Toy set his shoulder to the wheel. The hatch opened inward, less than a foot. Turn around, he said. P -p -p Put your wrists through the door. Listen, I'm not. Shut up. Do it. Luke turned and thrust his wrists through the gap. Dr. Toy used duct tape. It made that telltale honk noise as he stripped it off the roll. Tight? Yeah. Good. He dragged Luke inside and shut the hatch. The dog. S -s -s Screw the dog. You said I say a lot of stuff I don't mean. Dr. Toy led Luke to a folding chair and shoved him down. Luke could see LB's snout bobbing frantically at the bottom of the porthole. You lying bastard. Dr. Toy smiled, unruffled. Glimpsed in full, he was a reedy man whose long articulate limbs seemed to be constructed from knotted wires. He was slightly wall-eyed, his left eyeball drifting lazily toward his nose. The room was about twelve feet square, with a low ceiling. Symbols covered the walls. Toy had fashioned them out of duct tape. They didn't look scientific, more pagan. The rest of the room was scattered with papers, most of them balled up in evident frustration. The smell was atrocious. Luke spied a heap of soiled overalls in one corner. On the surface, that heap would have attracted flies. Down here, it just reeked. No access to the <laughs> facilities, I'm afraid, Toy said, displaying a slight congenital stutter. Does the smell bother you? Doesn't it bother you? Toy shrugged. I was raised by a nurse. She spent her days emptying bedpans and changing adult diapers. She didn't want to encounter bodily f -f fluids at home. She posted a slogan over our toilet. If you sprinkle when you tinkle, be a sweetie, wipe the seedy. But if she ever did encounter tinkle, even a drop, <laughs> she once th th threatened to make me clean it up with my toothbrush, and I'd have to use that same toothbrush until the bristles dulled and it was time to buy a n new one. Your mom and my mom would have gotten on like bandits, Luke thought. Fecal matter, Toy said. Her term for it, not doo-doo or poo-poo or even that old standby shit. F -f 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 Fecal matter. Please understand, I wasn't raised to be a man who'd shit in a corner. But good manners have a way of b -b 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 eating away down here. Toy shook his head as if to dispel a troublesome thought. What, what, what are you? I mean, what do you do? You do your job. I'm a veterinarian. So Clayton Nelson's brother is an animal sawbones. Fascinating. Did you get your s start fixing up his sp sp specimens? You'd have been at work all day. When Luke didn't reply, Toy said, Chaos. He swallowed as if to center himself. That's why I locked myself up, in case you were wondering. That's right, Luke remembered. That's one of Hugo the Horrible's specialties, isn't it? Chaos theory. Oh, uh, it started normally enough, Toy said. We set up shop. Three men, three labs. Instability systems was my role. Basically, uh, was it f f f feasible? The ambrosia, did it cure anything or did it simply create havoc under an illusion of cure? He picked up a crinkled sheet of paper and smoothed it over his knee. I was working with theories, yes, known f f theories that apply and have value on the 
pointing upward. Up there, yes. But uh, down here, nothing b b behaves as it should. Theories and mathematics just dissolve. Even the most chaotic events, if you b b b break them down, have a pattern and order. And if they don't, then at least the level of chaos can be calculated, compartmentalized, and uh, uh, understood. Dr. Toy grinned widely. He seemed manic, weirdly chipper. His demeanor struck Luke as that of a convict who'd been kept in solitary confinement for years and now, finally given a chance to speak to another human being, he couldn't help prattling on. He showed Luke what he'd written, a hen-scratched theorem incredibly complex. Picture a rock rolling down a mountainside, or a bead of mercury running down the backside of a spoon, or skeins of f -f -f frost bristling across a window pane. The movement would seem random, yes, but it's not. If we could catalog all the variables in the universe, we could know with utter certainty what happens next. The, uh, the, the next skip of that rock, the, the, the way the mercury will slip, the direction each skein will b branch. But we don't, so, so, chaos. He stopped pacing and stared at Luke, his eyes wide as if seeing him, really seeing him for the first time. What's on the uh, uh, other side of the hole is chaos, but not like any I've ever known. Unorderable, unnameable, untheorizable, and that's what pure evil looks like. A chaos whose v v variables are endless, so huge even the universe can't contain them. Chaos incarnate. Luke had stopped listening by then. One word stuck in his head like a shard of polished glass. Hole. The hole. Westlake's voice, ragged and covetous, as Lucas remembered from those sound files. I put it through. Luke shifted in his chair. Sweat trickled down his back, soaking the duct tape. What hole, Hugo? Toy's eyes narrowed. You've seen one. Don't tell me you haven't. I read Westlake's journal. How is Cooper? Toy asked, genuinely interested. Luke blinked. The man clearly didn't know. I'm afraid he's dead, Hugo. He took one of the challengers. He was dead by the time he surfaced. Toy's face twitched. Weird voltages raced under his skin. Luke said, In his journals, Westlake mentioned a hole. Like magic, a blade appeared in Toy's hand, a box cutter. He thumbed the mechanism. Two inches of blade slid out. Toy lunged forward, grabbed the matted hair atop Luke's head, and pressed the blade to his neck. You're l lying. You've seen a hole. Luke's breath came in shallow heaves. I haven't, he swallowed. The blade scraped his Adam's apple. But since I've been down here, I've felt like, like something has been trying to crawl inside my head. The blade pressed harder. Have you let it? Luke's pulse shivered behind his eyes and at the root of his tongue. No. The blade withdrew. This chaos, Toy went on as if he hadn't threatened to slit Luke's throat mere moments ago. It's orderly. There's the surface chaos, you could say, like a, a, a tangle of leaves and twigs laid over a tra tra trap. A camouflage of chaos with something very logical and cunning beneath a guiding principle or a modus operandi, the real m m master. Toy stood abruptly, kicking through drifts of paper to the nearest wall. Luke clenched his hands while Toy's attention was elsewhere, trying to pull his wrists apart enough to slip a hand free. Protective runes! He pointed at the duct tape symbols, laughing stiffly. I studied them as an undergraduate. Druids and, and, uh, that b b b b bullshit It's all from memory. I don't know if they have any effect at, uh, at, uh, at all. I don't see any holes. Toy smiled without humor. I wonder if that's because they don't want me. They. Luke said, Westlake's journal. I read it. Oh, yes? Then, almost as an afterthought, but with genuine sympathy. Westlake. My God, poor Cooper, that poor, poor man. Dr. Westlake said a hole appeared in his lab wall. He claimed he heard sounds coming out of it, voices. 
the voice in the sea, as your brother would claim, Toy said acidly. Some pressure-treated harpy wailing for Cooper to stick his head out and kiss her. Westlake's voice again. I want to put my head through the hole. I want to kiss those lips. A hole ate into the wall of my lap, too, Toy said. Small at first, growing steadily b -b bigger. I spoke to Clayton about it. Predictably, he called me a f f fool. I told him to come into the goddamn lab. I'd show him. He refused. Of course, he probably had one blooming in his own lab, and Westlake, too, as you say. He shook his head. Yet none of us acted. None of us told anyone. Fells, Alice, somebody on the su surface. Why? Because it was so horribly exciting. A hole in Dr. Toy's lab? Luke had gotten a glimpse inside Toy's lab when they arrived on the Trius. Its porthole wasn't coated in black ichor, like Westlake's, or draped like his brother's. Luke hadn't seen a hole. Of course, it could be in a blind spot. It wasn't worth challenging Toy on it. Luke worked his wrists, testing his bonds. The sweat oiled his skin. The tape was surrendering its hold in increments. Professionally, I'm never more alive than when I'm on the cusp. Toy went on. With surgeons, it's when they're in the cut, you know, wrist deep inside a chest cavity. For me, or for your b -b -b brother and Westlake, poor man, it's w -w when we're on the verge of a breakthrough, of, yes, yes, unlocking some previously un un unknown system that our world operates under. And that's how you felt down here. Yes, if only we can just, just learn more. See how the stuff, the ambrosia, how it operates. But that's the p problem. It has no stable base. It's always shifting. Worst of all, it knows. It understands our needs and desires, knows how to d d d d d dangle that carrot at the end of the stick. By the time we felt the noose around our necks, it was too d d damn late. We were in a Skinner box. Dr. Toy said with a sick smile, the kind of expression a slipshod mortician might tease onto a corpse's face. Operant conditioning chambers, to use the scientific name, designed by B.F. Skinner, that old sadist. You put a rat in a box with an electrified grate, two buttons on one side of the box, red and gr green. Push the red one, get a treat. Push the green one, get a sh 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 shock or vice versa. Vary the pattern however you want. Push either button and you get a t t t treat, say, or either button earns the subject a shock. And don't you see? The treeist is the box. We are the rats, and whatever's on the other s side of those holes are the scientists. They're watching us, seeing how we react. We're the grand exp exp experiment. Luke continued to work at his bindings. He clenched his hands to stretch the tape. He could slide his wrists back and forth a little bit now. Why did you need to see my blood? Toy's focus was drifting. What? You made me cut myself. Toy waved his hand impatiently. It gets inside you, you understand. And what, what once it's there, you're not yourself anymore. It has ways and means to gain entry. You've heard it, yes? It has a powerful pull. Very, uh... Uh, seductive. I've heard it, said Luke, though he hadn't heard anything, just those sly fingertips warming against his skull. C Cooper came by not long ago, Dr. Toy said. He looked awful, his neck covered in sores. I couldn't let him in, he said with a touch of guilt. I opened the hatch only enough so we could talk. He sounded as bad as he l looked. We talked about our children. We both have daughters, Jennifer, my own precious child. She's uh, sick. She's got the disease, as Cooper called it. She started spotting a month ago. I'm so sorry, said Luke. We were performing trial runs on the Hesperus when my wife called to inform me. At the time, I was worried that I wouldn't be uh, able to operate in incl incl enclosed spaces. Cluster of hope. Of, of. He gave Luke a look that said, you know what I'm trying to say. 
I was just about to ask them to send someone uh, else instead. But then Jennifer. So I go, came. I had to for her. Alice has found a generator, Luke told him. We're going to power up the Challenger and get out of here. Will you come? Toy favored him with a look of utter pity. Oh, you poor devil. Do you really think they're going to l let us go? Luke had stretched the tape to where he might be able to pop a wrist free, but he'd have to stand up to get the momentum needed to... Shut! Hell invaded the Trieste. 